Section 1 of Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. The Regeneration of Lord Ernie. Chapter 1. John Hendricks was bear leading at the time. He had originally studied for holy orders, but had abandoned the church later for private reasons connected with his faith and had taken to teaching and tutoring instead. He was an honest, upstanding fellow of five and thirty, incorruptible, intelligent in a simple, straightforward way. He played games with his head, more than most Englishmen do, but he went through life without much calculation. He had qualities that made boys like and respect him. He won their confidence. Poor, proud, ambitious. He realized that fate offered him a chance when the Secretary of State for Scotland asked him if he would give up his other pupils for a year and take his son, Lord Ernie, round the world upon an educational trip that might make a man of him. For Lord Ernie was the only son, and the Marquess's influence was naturally great. To have deposited a regenerated Lord Ernie at the castle gates might have guaranteed Hendrick's future. After leaving Eton prematurely, the lad had come under Hendrick's charge for a time, and with such excellent results. I'd simply swear by that chap, you know, the boy used to say that his father, considerably impressed and rather as a last resort, had made this proposition, and Hendricks, without much calculation, had accepted it. He liked Bindi for himself. It was in his heart to make a man of him, if possible. They had now been round the world together and had come up from Brindisi to the Italian lakes, and so into Switzerland. It was middle October, with a week or two to spare, they were making leisurely for the ancestral halls in Aberdeenshire. The nine months' travel, Hendricks realized with keen disappointment, had accomplished, however, very little. The job had been exhausting, and he had conscientiously done his best. Lord Ernie liked him thoroughly, admiring his vigor with a smile of tolerant good nature through his ceaseless cigarette smoke. They were almost like two boys together. "'You are a chap and a half, Mr. Hendricks. You really ought to be in the cabinet with my father.' Hendricks would deliver up his useless parcel at the castle gates, pocket the thanks and the hard-earned fee— and go back to his arduous life of teaching and writing in dingy lodgings. It was a pity, even on the lowest grounds. The tutor, truth to tell, felt undeniably depressed. Hopeful by nature, optimistic too, as men of action usually are. He cast about him, even at the last hour, for something that might stir the boy to life. Wake him up. Put zest and energy into him. But there was only Paris now between them in the end. And Paris certainly could not be relied upon for help. Bindi's desire for Paris even was not strong enough to count. No desire in him was ever strong. There lay the crux of the problem, in a word. Lord Ernie was without desire which is life. Tall, well-built, handsome, he was yet such a feeble creature, without the energy to be either wild or vicious. Languid, yet certainly not decadent, life ran slowly, flabbily in him. He took to nothing. The first impression he made was fine, then nothing. His only tastes, if tastes they could be called, were out-of-door tastes. He was vaguely interested in flying, yet not enough to master the mechanism of it. He liked motoring at high speed, being driven, not driving himself. And he loved to wander about in woods, making fires like a red Indian, provided they lit easily, yet even this, not for the poetry of the thing, nor for any love of adventure, but just because. I like fire, you know. I like to watch it burn. Heat seemed to give him curious satisfaction, perhaps because the heat of life, he realized, was deficient in his six-foot body. It was significant, this love of fire in him, though no one could discover why. As a child, he had a dangerous delight in fireworks, anything to do with fire. He would watch a candle flame as though he were a fire worshipper, but had never been known to make a single remark of interest about it. In a wood, as mentioned, the first thing he did was to gather sticks, though the resulting fire was never part of any purpose. He had no purpose. There was no wind or fire of life in the lad at all. The fine body was inert. Hendricks did wrong, of course, in going where he did, to this little desolate village in the Jura Mountains, though it was the first time all these trying months he had allowed himself a personal desire. But from Domo de Sola, the Simplon Express would pass Lausanne, and from Lausanne to the Jura was but a step, all on the way home, moreover and what prompted him was merely a sentimental desire to revisit the place where, ten years before, he had fallen violently in love with the pretty daughter of the pastor, Monsieur Lesin, in whose house he lodged. 
He had gone there to learn French. The very slight detour seemed pardonable. His spiritless charge was easily persuaded. We might go home by Pontalier instead of Baal and get a glimpse of the Jura, he suggested. The line slides along its frontiers a bit and then goes bang across it. We might even stop off a night on the way, if you care about it. I know a curious old village, Villaray, where I went at your age to pick up French. Top hole, replied Lord Ernie listlessly. All on the way to Paris, ain't it? Of course. You see, there's a fortnight before we need to get home. So there is, yes. Let's go. He felt it was almost his own idea, and that he decided it. If you'd really like it. Oh, yes, why not? I'm sick of cities. He flicked some dust off his coat sleeve with an immaculate silk handkerchief, then lit a cigarette. Just as you like, he added with a drawl and a smile. I'm ready for anything. There was no keenness, no personal desire, no choice in reality at all. Flabby good nature, merely. A suggestion was invariably enough, as though the boy had no will of his own. His opposition rarely more than negative sulking that soon flattened out because it was forgotten. Indeed, no sign of positive life lay in him anywhere. No vitality, aggression, coherence of desire and will. Vacuous rather than imbecile, unable to go forward upon any definite line of his own as though all wheels had slipped their cogs. A pasty soul that took good enough impressions, yet never mastered them for permanent use. Nothing stuck. He would never make a politician, much less a statesman. The family title would be borne by a nincompoop. Yet all the machinery was there, one felt. If only it could be driven, made to go. It was sad. Lord Ernie was heir to great estates with a name and position that might influence thousands. And Hendricks had been a good selection, with his virility and gentle understanding firmness. He understood the problem. You'll do what no one else could, the anxious father told him. For he worships you, and you can sting without hurting him. You'll put life and interest into him, if anybody in this world can. I have great hopes of this tour. I shall always be in your debt, Mr. Hendricks. And Hendricks had accepted the onerous duty in his big, high-minded way. He was conscientious to the backbone. This little side trip was his sole deflection, if such it can be called, even. Life, light, and cheerful influences, had been his instructions. Nothing dull or melancholy. An occasional fling, if he wants it. I'd welcome a fling as a good sign, and as much intercourse with decent people and stimulating sightseeing as you can manage or can stand, the Marquess added with a smile. Only, you won't overtax the lad, will you? Above all, let him think he chooses and decides when possible. Villaray, however, hardly complied with these conditions. There was melancholy in it. Hendrick's mind, whose reflexes the spongy nature of the empty lad absorbed too easily, would be in a minor key. Yet a night could work no harm. Whence came, he wondered, the fleeting notion that it might do good. Was it perhaps that Lesin, the vigorous old Pasteur, might contribute something? Lesin had been a considerable force in his own development, he remembered. They had corresponded a little since. Lesin was out of the common, certainly, restless energy in him, as of the sea. Hendricks found difficulty in sorting out his thoughts and motives, but Lesin was in them somewhere. This idea that his energetic personality might help. His vitalizing effect, at least, would counteract the melancholy. For Villaray lay huddled upon unstimulating slopes. The robe of gloomy pine woods, sweeping down towards its poverty from bleak heights and desolate gorges. The peasants were morose, ill-living folk. It was a dark, untaught corner in a range of otherwise fairy mountains, a backwater the sun had neglected to clean out. Superstitions, Hendricks remembered, of incredible kind still lingered there. A touch of the sinister hovered about the composite mind of its inhabitants. The pasteur fought strenuously this blackness in their lives and thoughts, in the village itself with more or less success, though even there the drinking and habits of living were utterly unsweetened. But on the heights, among the somewhat arid pastures, the mountain men remained untamed, turbulent, even menacing. Hendricks knew this of old, though he had never understood too well. But he remembered how the English boys at La Cure were forbidden to climb in certain conditions, because the life in these scattered chalets was somehow loose and violent. There was danger there, the danger, however, never definitely stated. Those lonely ridges lay cursed beneath dark skies. He remembered, too, the savage dogs, the difficulty of approach, the aggressive attitude toward the plucky pasteur's visits to these remote upland pâturages. They did not lie in his parish. 
Lezin made his occasional visits as man and missionary, for extraordinary rumors, Hendricks recalled, were rife, of some queer worship of their own these lawless peasants kept alive in their distant, windy territory, planted there first, the story had it, by some renegade priest whose name was now forgotten. Hendricks himself had no personal experiences. He had been too deeply in love to trouble about outside things, however strange. But Marston's case had never quite left his memory. Marston, who climbed up by unlawful ways, stayed away two whole days and nights, and came back suddenly with his air of being broken, shattered, appallingly used up, his face so lined and strained it seemed aged by twenty years, and yet with a singular new life in him, so vehement, loud, and reckless it was like a kind of sober intoxication. He was packed off to England before he could relate anything, but he had suffered shocks. His white, passionate face, his boisterous new vigor, the way Monsieur Lezin screened his view of the heights as he put him personally into the Paris train. Almost as though he feared the boy would see the hills and make another dash for them. Made up an unforgettable picture in the mind. Moreover, between the sodden village and that string of evil chalets that lay in their dark line upon the heights, there had been links. Exactly of what nature he never knew, for love made all else uninteresting. Only he remembered swarthy, dark-faced messengers descending into the sleepy hamlet from time to time. Big, mountain-limbed fellows with wind in their hair and fire in their eyes. That their visits produced commotion and excitement of difficult kinds. That wild orgies invariably followed in their wake. And that when the messengers went back, they did not go alone. There was life up there, whereas the village was moribund. And none who went ever cared to return. Coudrefin, the young giant vigneron, taken in this way from the very side of his sweetheart, too, came back two years later as a messenger himself. He did not even ask for the girl, who had meanwhile married another. "'There's life up there with us,' he told the drunken loafers in the Guillaume Tell. "'Wind and fire to make you spin to the devil or to heaven.' He was enthusiasm personified. In the village he had been merely drinking himself stupidly to death, vaguely, too. Hendricks remembered visits of police from the neighboring town, some of them on horseback, all armed, and that once even soldiers accompanied them, and on another occasion a bishop, or whatever the church dignitary was called, had arrived suddenly and promised radical assistance of a spiritual kind that had never materialized. Oh, and many other details that now trooped back with suggestions time had certainly not made smaller. For the love had passed along its way and gone, and he was free now to the invasion of other memories dwarfed at the time by that dominating sweet passion. Yet all the tutor wanted now, this chance week in late October, was to see again the corner of the mossy forest where he had known that marvelous thing, first love. Renew his link with Lezin, who had taught him much, and see if, perchance, this man's stalwart, virile energy might possibly overflow with benefit into his listless charge. The expenses he meant to pay out of his own pocket those wild pagans on the heights, even if they still existed, there was no need to mention. Lord Ernie knew little French and certainly no word of patois. For one night, or even two, the risk was negligible. Was there indeed risk at all of any sort? Was not this vague uneasiness he felt merely conscience faintly pricking? He could not feel that he was doing wrong. At worst, the youth might feel depression for a few hours, speedily curable by taking the train. Something, nevertheless, did gnaw at him in subconscious fashion, producing a sense of apprehension, and he came to the conclusion that this memory of the mountain tribe was the cause of it, a revival of forgotten boyhood's awe. He glanced across at the figure of Bindi lounging upon the hotel lawn in an easy chair, full in the sunshine, a newspaper at his feet. Reclining there, he looked so big and strong and handsome, yet in reality was but a painted lathe without resistance much less attack in all his many inches. And suddenly the tutor recalled another thing, the link, however, undiscoverable, and it was this, that the boy's mother, a Canadian, had suffered once severely from a winter in Quebec, where the Marquess had first made her acquaintance. Frost had robbed her, if he remembered rightly, of a foot, with the result at any rate that she had a wholesome terror of the cold. She sought heat and sun instinctively, fire. Also that asthma had been her sore affliction, Sheer inability to take a full deep breath. This deficiency of heat and air, therefore, were in her mind, and he knew that Bindi's birth had been an anxious time. The anxiety justified, moreover, since she had yielded up her life for him. And so the singular thought flashed through him suddenly as he watched the reclining, languid boy. 
Kuldor Fan's descriptive phrase oddly singing in his head. Heat and fire, fire and wind, why, it's the very thing he lacks, and he's always after them, I wonder. Chapter 2 The lumbering yellow diligence brought them up from the lake shore, a long two hours, deposited them at the opening of the village street, and went its grinding, toiling way toward the frontier. They arrived in a blur of rain. It was evening. Lowering clouds drew night before her time upon the world, obscuring the distant summits of the Oberland, but lights twinkled here and there in the nearer landscape, mapping the gloom with signals. The village was very still. Above and below it, however, two big winds were at work, with curious results. For a lower wind from the east in gusty draughts drove the body of the lake into quick white horses, which shone like wings against the deep Bas Alp, while a westerly current swept the heights immediately above the village. There was this odd division of two weathers, presaging a change. A narrow line of clear, bright sky showed up the Jura outline finely toward the north, stars peeping sharply through the pale, moist spaces. Hurrying vapors driven by the upper westerly wind concealed them thinly. They flashed and vanished. The entire ridge, five thousand feet in the air, had an appearance of moving through the sky. Between these opposing winds at different levels the village itself lay motionless, while the world slid past, as it were, in two directions. "'The earth seems turning round,' remarked Lord Ernie. He had been reading a novel all day in train and steamer, and smoking endless cigarettes in the diligence, his companion and himself its only occupants. He seemed suddenly to have waked up. "'What is it?' he asked with interest. Hendricks explained the queer effect of the two contrary winds. Columns of peat smoke rose in thin straight lines from the blur of houses, untouched by the careering currents above and below. The winds whirled round them. Lord Ernie listened attentively to the explanation. "'I feel as if I were spinning with it, like a top,' he observed, putting his hand to his head a moment. "'And what are those lights up there?' He pointed to the distant ridge where fires were blazing as though stars had fallen and set fire to the trees. Several were visible at regular intervals. The sharp summits of the limestone mountains cut hard into the clear spaces of northern sky, thousands of feet above. "'Oh, the peasants burning wood and stuff, I suppose,' the tutor told him. The youth turned an instant, standing still to examine them with a shading hand. "'People live up there?' he asked. There was surprise in his voice, and his body stiffened oddly as he spoke. "'In mountain chalets, yes,' replied the other, a trifle impatiently, noticing his attitude. "'Come along now,' he added. "'Let's go to our rooms in the carpenter's house before the rain comes down. "'You can see the windows twinkling over there.' And he pointed to a building near the church. "'The storm will catch us.' They moved quickly down the deserted street together in the deepening gloom, passing little gardens, doors of open barns, straggling manure heaps, and courtyards of cobbled stones where the occasional figure of a man was seen." But Lord Ernie lingered behind, half loitering. Once or twice, to the other's increasing annoyance, he paused, standing still to watch the heights through openings between the tumble-down old houses. Half a dozen big drops of rain splashed heavily on the road. "'Hurry up!' cried Hendricks, looking back. "'Or we shall be caught. It's the mountain wind, the coup de joie. You can hear it coming!' For the lad was peering across a low wall in an attitude of fixed attention. He made a gesture with one hand, as though he signaled towards the ridges, where the fires blazed. Hendricks called pretty sharply to him then. It was possible, of course, that he misinterpreted the movement. It may merely have been that he passed his fingers through his hair, across his eyes, or used the palm to focus sight, for his hat was off and the light was quite uncertain. Only, Hendricks did not like the lingering or the gesture. He put authority into his tone at once. "'Come along, will you? Come along, Bindi!' he called. The answer filled him with amazement. "'All right, all right. I'll follow along in a moment. I, I like this.' The tutor went back a few steps towards him. The tone startled him. "'Like what?' he asked. And Lord Ernie turned towards him with another face. There was a fighting in it. There was resolution. "'This, of course,' the boy answered steadily, but with excitement shut down behind as he waved one arm towards the mountains. "'I've dreamed this sort of thing. I've known it somewhere. We've seen nothing like it. All our stupid trip—' The flash in his brown eyes passed then, as he added more quietly but with firmness, "'Don't wait for me. I'll follow.' Hendrick stood still in his tracks. There was a decision in the voice and manner that arrested him. 
The confidence, the positive statement, the eager desire, the hint of energy. All this was new. He had never encouraged the boy's habit of vivid dreaming, deeming the narration unwise. It flashed across him suddenly now that the deficiency might be only on the surface. Energy and life hid, perhaps, subconsciously in him. Did the dreams betray an activity he knew not how to carry through and correlate with his everyday external world? And were these dreams evidence of deep hidden desire, a clue possibly to the energy he sought and needed, the exact kind of energy that might set the inert machinery in motion and drive it? He hesitated an instant, waiting in the road. He was on the verge of understanding something that yet just evaded him. Bindi's childish, instinctive love of fire, his passion for air, for rushing wind, for oceans of limitless. There came at that moment a deep roaring in the mountains. Far away, but rapidly approaching, the ominous booming of it filled the air. The westerly wind descended by the deep gorges, shaking the forests, shouting as it came. Clouds of white dust spiraled into the sky off the upper roads, spread into sheets like snow, and swept downwards with incredible velocity. The air turned suddenly cooler. More big drops of rain splashed and thudded on the roofs and road. There was a feeling of something violent and instantaneous about to happen, a sense almost of attack. The Joran tore headlong down into the valley. "'Come on, man!' he cried at the top of his voice. "'That's the Joran! I know it of old! It's terrific! Run!' And he caught the lad still lingering by the arm. But Lord Ernie shook himself free with an excitement almost violent. "'I've been up there with those great fires!' he shouted. "'I know the whole blessed thing, but where was it? Where?' His face was white, eyes shining, manner strangely agitated. "'Big, naked fellows who dance like wind, and rushing women of fire, and—' Two things happened then, interrupting the boy's wild language. The Jurons reached the village and struck it. The houses shook. The trees bent double, and the cloud of limestone dust, painting the darkness white, swept on between Hendrix and the boy with extraordinary force, even separating them. There was a clatter of falling tiles, of banging doors and windows— and then a burst of icy rain that fell like iron shot on everything, raising actual spray. The air was in an instant thick. Everything drove past, roared, trembled, and secondly, just in that brief instant when man and boy were separated, there shot between them with shadowy swiftness the figure of a man, hatless, with flying hair, who vanished with running strides into the darkness of the village street beyond, also rapidly that sight could focus the manner neither of his coming nor of his going. Hendrix caught a glimpse of a swarthy elemental type of face, the swing of great shoulders, the leap of big loose limbs, something rushing and elastic in the whole appearance, but nothing he could claim for a definite detail. The figure swept through the dust and wind like an animal and was gone. It was indeed only the contrast of Lord Ernie's whitened skin, of his graceful half-elegant outline, that enabled him to recall the details that he did. The weather-beaten visage seemed to storm away, Bindi's delicate, aristocratic face shone so pale and eager. But that a real man had passed was indubitable, for the boy had made a flurried movement as though to follow. Hendrix caught his arm with a determined grip and pulled him back. "'Who was that? Who was it?' Lord Ernie cried breathlessly, resisting with all his strength but vainly. "'Some mountain fellow, of course. Nothing to do with us.' And he dragged the boy after him down the road. For a second both seemed to have lost their heads." Hendricks certainly felt a gust of something strike him into momentary consternation that was half alarm. "'From up there, where the fires are?' asked the boy, shouting above the wind and rain. "'Yes, yes, I suppose so. Come along. We shall be soused. Are you mad?' For Bindi still held back with all his weight trying to turn round and see. Hendricks used more force. There was almost a scuffle in the road. "'All right, I'm coming. I only wanted to look a second. You needn't drag my arm out.' He ceased resistance, and they lurched forward together. But what a chap he was! He went like the wind! Did you see the light streaming out of him? Like fire! Like what? shouted Hendrix as they dashed now through the driving tempest. Fire! bawled the boy. It lit me up as he passed! Fire that lights, but does not burn! And wind that blows the world along! Button your coat and run! interrupted the other, hurrying his pace and pulling the lad forcibly after him. "'Don't twist, you're hurting. I can run as well as you,' came back, 
with an energy Bendy had never shown before in his life. He was breathless, panting, charged with excitement still. It touched me as he passed. Fire that lights but doesn't burn, and wind that blows the heart to flame. Let me go, will you? Let go my hand. He dashed free and away. The torrential rain came down in sheets now from a windless sky, for the Joron was already miles beyond them, tearing across the angry lake. They reached the carpenter's house where their lodging was, soaked to the skin. They dried themselves and ate the light supper of soup and omelette prepared for them, ate it in their dressing gowns. Lord Ernie went to bed with a hot water bottle of rough stone. He declared with decision that he felt no chill. His excitement had somewhat passed. "'But I say, Mr. Hendricks,' he remarked as he settled down with his novel and a cigarette, calmed and normal again. "'This is a place and a half, isn't it? It stirs me all up. I suppose it's the storm. What do you think?' "'Electrical state of the air, yes,' replied the tutor briefly. Soon afterwards he closed the shutters on the weather side, said good night, and went into his own room to unpack. The singular phrase Bindi had used kept singing through his head. "'Fire that lights but doesn't burn, and wind that blows the heart to flame.' The first time he had said, "'Blows the world along.' Where on earth had the boy got hold of such queer words?' He still saw the figure of that wild mountain fellow who had passed between them, with the dust and wind and rain. There was confusion in the picture, or rather in his memory of it, perhaps. But it seemed to him, looking back now, that the man in passing had paused a second, the briefest second merely, and had spoken, or at any rate had stared closely a moment into Bendy's face, and that some communication had been between them in that moment of elemental violence. Chapter 3. Pasteur les uns, Hendricks remembered very well. Even now in his old age he was a vigorous personality. But in his youth he had been almost revolutionary, wild enough too, it was rumored, until he had turned to God of his own accord, as offering a larger field for his strenuous vitality. The little man was possessed of tireless life, a born leader of forlorn hopes, attack his métier, and heavy odds the conditions that he loved. Before settling down in this isolated spot, Parcieu de l'Église Independente, in a Protestant canton, he had been a missionary in remote pagan lands. His horizon was a big one. He had seen strange things. An uncouth being, with a large head upon a thin and wiry body supported by steely bowed legs, he had that courage which makes itself known in advance of any proof. Hendricks slipped over to La Cure about nine o'clock and found him in his study. Lord Ernie was asleep. At least his light was out, no sound or movement audible from his room. The Joran had swept the heavens of clouds. Stars shone brilliantly. The fire still blazed faintly upon the heights. The visit was not unexpected, for Hendricks had already sent a message to announce himself, and the moment he sat down, met the pasteur's eye, heard his voice, and observed his slight imperious gestures, he passed under the influence of a personality stronger than his own. Something in Les Ans' atmosphere stretched him, lifting his horizon. He had come chiefly, he now realized it, to borrow help and explanation with regard to Lord Ernie. The events of two hours before had impressed him more than he quite cared to own, and he wished to talk about it. But somehow he found it difficult to state his case. No opening presented itself, or rather, the Pasteur's mind, intent upon something of his own, was too preoccupied. In reply to a question presently, the tutor gave a brief outline of his present duties, but omitted the scene of excitement in the village street, for as he watched the furrowed face in the light of the study lamp, he realized both anxiety and spiritual high pressure at work below the surface there. He hesitated to intrude his own affairs at first. They discussed nevertheless the psychology of the boy, and the unfavorable chances of regeneration, while the old man's face lit up and flashed from time to time, until at length the truth came out and Hendricks understood his friend's preoccupation. "'What you're attempting with an individual,' Lezan exclaimed with ardor, "'is precisely what I am attempting with a crowd, and is difficult, for poor sinners make poor saints, and the lukewarm I will spew out of my mouth.' He made an abrupt, resentful gesture to signify his disgust and weariness, perhaps his contempt as well. "'Cut it down. Why, Cumberg, it... To the ground. A hard and charitable doctrine, began the tutor. 
realizing that he must discuss the parish before he could introduce Bindi's case effectively. You mean, of course, that there's no material to work on. No energy to direct, was the emphatic reply. My sheep here are real sheep, mere negative, drink-sodden loafers without desire. Hospital cases, I could work with tigers and wild beasts, but who ever trained a slug? Your proper place is on the heights, suggested Hendricks, interrupting at a venture. There's scope enough up there, or used to be. Have they died out, those wild men of the mountains? And hit by chance the target in the bull's eye. The old man's face turned younger as he answered quickly. Men like that, he exclaimed, do not die off. They breed and multiply. He leaned forward across the table, his manner eager, fervent, almost impetuous with suppressed desire for action. There's evil thinking up there, he said suggestively, but by heaven it's alive, it's positive, ambitious, constructive, with violent feeling and strong desire to work on. There's hope of some result. Upon vehement impulses like that, pagan or anything else, a man can work with the will. Those are the tigers. Down here I have the slugs. He shrugged his shoulders and leaned back into his chair. Hendricks watched him, thinking of the stories told about his missionary days among savage and barbarian tribes. Born of the vital landscape, I suppose, he asked. Wind and frost and blazing sun? The wild energy, I mean, is due to... A gesture from the old man stopped him. You know who started them upon their wild performances? He said gravely in a lower voice. You know how that ambitious renegade priest from the valley chose them for his nucleus, then died before he could lead them out, trained and competent upon his strange campaign. You heard the story when you were with me as a boy. I remember Marston, put in the other uncommonly interested. Marston, the boy who... He stopped because he hardly knew how to continue. There was a minute's silence, but it was not an empty silence, though no word broke it. Lezanne's face was a study. Ah, Marston, yes, he said slowly, without looking up. You remember him. But this is at my door, too, I suppose. His father was ignorant and obstinate. I might have saved him otherwise. He seemed talking to himself rather than to his listener. Pain showed in the lines about the rugged mouth. There was no one, you see, who knew how to direct the great life that woke in the lad. He took it back with him, and turned it loose into all manner of useless enterprises, and the doctors mistook his abrupt and fierce ambitions for, for the hysteria which they call the vestibule of lunacy. Yet small characters may have big ideas. They didn't understand, of course. It was sad, sad, sad. He hid his face in his hands a moment. Marston went wrong, then, in the end. For the other's manner suggested disaster of some kind. Hendricks asked it in a whisper. Lezin uncovered his face, looped his neck with one finger, and pointed to the ceiling. Hanged himself, murmured Hendricks, shocked. The pasteur nodded, but there was impatience, half anger in his tone. They chucked it, kept it in. Of course it tore him. The two men looked into each other's eyes for a moment, and something in the younger of them shrank. This was all beyond his kin a little. An odd hint of bleak and cruel reality was in the air, making him shiver along nerves that were normally inactive. The uneasiness he felt about Lord Ernie became alarm. His conscience pricked him. More than he could assimilate, continued Lezin. It broke him, yet had the outlets been provided, had he been taught how to use it, this elemental energy drawn direct from nature. He broke off abruptly, struck perhaps by the expression in his listener's eyes. It seems incredible, doesn't it, in the twentieth century? I know. Evil, asked Hendricks, stammering rather. Why evil, was the impatient reply. How can any force be evil? That's merely a question of direction. And the priest who discovered these forces and taught their use, then, was genuinely spiritual and followed the truth in his own way. He was not necessarily evil. The little pasteur spoke with vehemence. You talk like the religion primers in the kindergarten. He went on. Listen, 
This man, sick and weary of his lukewarm flock, sought vital stalwart systems who might be clean enough to use the elemental powers he had discovered how to attract. Only the bias of users could make it evil by the wrong use. His idea was big and even holy, to train a core that might regenerate the world, and he chose unreasoning, unintellectual types with a purpose. Primitive, giant men who could assimilate the force without risk of being shattered. Under his direction, he intended they should prove as effective as the twelve disciples of old, who were fisher folk. And had he gone on? He too failed then, asked the other, whose tangled thoughts struggled with incredulity and belief as he heard this strange new thing. He died, you mean? Maison de Sante, was the laconic reply. Striped waistcoats, padded cells, and the rest, but still alive, I'm told. It was more than he could manage. It was a startling story, even in this brief outline, deep suggestion in it. The tutor's sense of being out of his depth increased. After nine months with a lifeless, devitalized human being, this was... Well, he seemed to have fallen in his sleep from a comfortable bed into a raging mountain torrent. Strong currents rushed through and over him. The lonely, peaceful village outside, sleeping beneath the stars, heightened the contrast. Suppressed all misdirected energy again, I suppose, he said in a low tone, respecting his companion's emotion. And these mountain men, he said abruptly, do they still keep up their practices? The ceremonies, yes, corrected the other, master of himself again. Turbulent moments of nature, storms and the like, stirs them to clumsy rehearsals of one's vital rituals, not entirely ineffective, even in their incompleteness, but dangerous for that very reason. This Joran, for instance, invariably communicates something of its atmospherical energy to themselves. They light their fires as of old. They blunder through what they were member of his ceremonies. With the glasses you may see them in the dozens, men and women, leaping and dancing. It is an amazing sight, great beauty in it, impossible to witness even from a distance, without feeling the desire to take part in it. Even my people feel it. It's the only time they ever get alive. He jerked his head contemptuously toward the street. Or feel desire to act. And someone from the heights, a messenger perhaps, will be down later, this very evening probably, on the hunt. On the hunt? Hendricks asked it half below his breath. He felt a touch of awe as he heard this experienced, genuinely religious man speak with conviction of such curious things. On the hunt, he repeated more eagerly. Messengers do come down, was the reply. A living belief always seeks to increase, to grow, to add to itself. Where there's conviction, there's always propaganda. Oh, converts, Lezon shrugged his big black shoulders. Desire to add to their number, desire to save, he said. The energy they absorb overflows, that is all. The Englishman debated several questions vaguely in his mind. Only his mind, being disturbed, could not hold the balance exactly true. Lezanne's influence as of old was upon him. A possibility, remote, seductive, dangerous, began to beckon to him, but from somewhere just outside his reasoning mind. And they always know when one of their kind is near. The voice slipped in between his tumbling thoughts, as though they get it instinctively from these universal elements they worship. They select their recruits with marvelous judgment and precision. No messenger ever goes back alone, nor has a recruit ever been known to return to the lazy squalor of the conditions whence he escaped. The younger man sat upright in his chair, suddenly alert and the gesture that he made unconsciously might have been read by a keen psychiatrist as evidence of mental self-defense. He felt the forbidden impulse in him gathering force, and tried to call a halt. At any rate, he called upon the other man to be explicit. He inquired point-blank what this religion of the heights might be. What were these elements these people worshipped? And what did their wild ceremonies consist? And Lezin, breaking bounds, let his speech burst forth in a stream of explanation, learned of actual knowledge, as he claimed and uttered with a vehement conviction that produced an undeniable effect upon his astonished listener. Told by no dreamer, but by a righteous man who lived, 
not merely preached his certain faith. Hendricks, before the half was heard, forgot what age and land he dwelt in. Whole blocks of conventional belief crumbled and fell away. Brick walls erected by routine to mark narrow paths of proper conduct, safe, moral, advisable conduct, thawed and vanished. Through the ruins, scrambling at him from huge horizons never recognized before, came all manner of marvelous possibilities. The little confinement of modern thought appalled him suddenly. Lesin spoke slowly, said little, was not even speculative. It was no mere magic of words that made the dim-lit study swim these deep waters beyond the ripple of pert creeds, but rather the overwhelming sense of sure conviction driving behind the statements. The little man had witnessed curious things, yes, in his missionary days, and that he had found truth in them in place of ignorant nonsense was remarkable enough. That silly superstitions prevalent among older nations could be signs really of their former greatness, linked mightily close to natural forces, was a startling notion. But it paved the way in Hendrix's receptive mind just then for the belief that certain so-called elements might be worshipped, known intimately, that is, to the uplifting advantage of the worshippers. And what elements more suitable for adoring imitation than wind and fire? For in a human body the first signs of what men term life are heated, which is combustion, and breath, which is a measure of wind. Life means fire, drawn first from the sun, and breathing borrowed from the omnipresent air. There might credibly be ways of assaulting these elements and taking heaven by storm, of seizing from their inexhaustible stores an abnormal measure, of straining this huge raw supply into effective energy for human use, vitality living with fire and wind in their most active moments, closely imitating their movements, following in their footsteps, understanding their laws of being, going identically with them. There lay a hint of the method. It was once when men were primitively close to nature, instinctual knowledge. The ceremony was the teaching. The powers of fire, the principalities of air existed, and humanity could know their qualities by the ritual of imitation could actually absorb the fierce enthusiasm of flame and the tireless energy of wind. Such transference was conceivable. Les Ains, at any rate, somehow made it so. His description of what he had personally witnessed, both in wilder lands and here in this little mountain range of Middle Europe, had a reality in it that was upsetting to the last degree. "'There is nothing more difficult to believe,' he said, "'yet more certainly true, than the effect of these.' Singular elemental rites. He laughed a short, dry laugh. <laughs> the medieval superstition that a witch could raise a storm is but a remnant of a once completely efficacious system, he concluded. Though, had that strange being, the valet's priest, rediscovered the process and introduced it here, I have never been able to ascertain. That he did so, results have proved. At any rate, it lets in life. Life, moreover, in astonishing abundance. So, whether for destruction or regeneration depends obviously upon the use the recipient puts it to. That's where the direction comes in. The beckoning impulse in the tutor's bewildered thoughts drew closer. The moment for communicating it had come at last. Without more ado, he took the opening. He told his companion the incident in the village street, the boy's abrupt excitement, his newfound energy, the curious words he used, the independence and vitality of his attitude. He told also of his parentage, of his mother's disabilities, his craving for rushing air and abundance, his love of fire for its own sake, of his magnificent physical machinery, yet of his uselessness. And Les Ains, as he listened, seemed built on wires. Searching questions shot forth like blows into the other's mind. The pasteur's sudden increase of enthusiasm was infectious. He leaped intuitively to the thing in Hendrick's thought. He understood the beckoning. The tutor answered the questions as best he could, aware of the end in view with the trepidation and a kind of mental breathlessness. Yes, unquestionably, Bendy had exchanged communication of some sort with the man, though this excitement had been evident even sooner. And you saw this man yourself? Lesin pressed him. Indubitably. A tall and hurrying figure in the dusk. He brought energy with him. The boy felt it and responded. Hendricks nodded. Became quite unmanageable for some minutes. 
he replied. He assimilated it, sir. There was no distress exactly, Lizanne asked sharply. None that I could see. Pleasurable excitement, something aggressive, a rather wild enthusiasm. His will began to act. He used that curious phrase about wind and fire. He turned alive. He wanted to follow the man. And the face, how would you describe it? Did it bring terror, I mean, or confidence? Dark and splendid, answered the other as truthfully as he could. In a certain sense, rushing, tempestuous, yet stern, rather. A face like the heights, suggested Lazin impatiently. A windy, fiery aspect in it, eh? The man swept past like the spirit of a storm in imaginative poetry, began the tutor, hunting through his thoughts for adequate description, then stopped as he saw that his companion had risen from his chair and began to pace the floor. The pasteur paused a moment beside him, hands thrust deep into his pockets, head bent down and shoulders forward. For twenty seconds he stared into his visitor's face intently, as though he would force into him the thought in his own mind. His features seemed working visibly, yet behind a mask of strong control. "'Don't you see what it is? Don't you see?' he said in a lower, deeper tone. "'They knew. Even from a distance they were aware of his coming. He is one of themselves.' And he straightened up again. He belongs to them. One of them. One of the wind and fire lot, the tutor stammered. The restless little man returned to his chair opposite, full of suppressed and vigorous movement as though he were strung on springs. He's of them, he continued, but in a peculiar and particular sense, more than merely a possible recruit. His empty organism would provide the very link they need. The perfect conduit. He watched his companion's face with careful keenness. In the country where I first experienced this marvelous thing, he added significantly, he would have been set apart as the offering, the sacrifice, as they call it there. The tribe would have chosen him with honor. He would have been the special bait to attract. Death? whispered the other. But Lezin shook his head. In the end, perhaps, he replied darkly, for the vessel might be torn and shattered, but the first charge to the brim and crammed with energy. With transformed vitality they could draw into themselves through him, a monster, if you will, but to them a deity, and superhuman in our little sense most suddenly. Then Hendricks faltered inwardly and turned away. No words came to him at the moment. In silence, the minds of the two men, one a religious, the other a secular teacher, and each with a burden of responsibility to the race, kept pace together without speech. The religious, however, outstripped the pedagogue. What he next said seemed a little disconnected with what had preceded it, although Hendricks caught the drift easily enough and shuddered. "'An organism needing heat,' observed Lezan calmly can absorb without danger what would destroy a normal person. Alcohol, again, neither injures nor intoxicates up to a given point, the system that really requires it. The tutor, perplexed and sorely tempted, felt that he drifted with a tide he found it difficult to stem. Up to a point, he repeated. That's true, of course. Up to a given point, echoed the other with significance that made his voice sound solemn. Then, rescue in the nick of time. He waited two full minutes and more for an answer. Then, as none was audible, he said another thing. His eyes were so intent upon the tutors that the latter raised his own unwillingly, and understood thus all that lay behind the pregnant little sentence. With a number it would not be possible, but with an individual it could be done. Brim the empty vessel first, then rescue in the nick of time. Regeneration. End of section one. Section two of Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. The Regeneration of Lord Ernie. Chapter 4 In the Englishman's mind there came a crash, as though something fell. 
There was dust, confusion, noise. Moral platitudes shouted at conventional admonitions. Warnings laughed and copybook maxims shriveled up. Above the lot, rising with a touch of grandeur, stood the pulpit figure of the little pastor. His big face shining clear through all the turmoil, strength and vision in the flaming eyes. A commanding outline with spiritual audacity in his heart. And Hendrick saw then that the man himself was standing erect in the center of the room, one finger raised to command attention, listening. Some considerable interval must have passed while he struggled with his inner confusion. Laison stood intently listening, his big head throwing a grotesque shadow on the wall and ceiling. Hark! he exclaimed, half whispering. So you hear that? Listen! A deep sound, confused and roaring, passed across the night, far away and slightly booming. It entered the little room so that the air seemed to tremble a moment. To Hendrix it held something ominous. The wind, he whispered as the noise died off into the distance. Yet a moment ago, the night was still enough. The stars were shining. There was tense excitement in the room just then. It showed in Laison's face, which had gone white as a cloth. Hendrix himself felt extraordinarily stirred. Not wind, but human voices, the older man said quickly. It's shouting. Listen. And his eyes ran round the room, coming to rest finally in a corner, where his hat and cloak hung from a nail. A gesture accompanied the look. He wanted to be out. The tutor half rose to take his leave. You have duties tonight elsewhere, he stammered. I'm forgetting. His own instinct was to get away himself with Bindi by the first early diligence. He was afraid of yielding. Hush, whispered Laison peremptorily. Laison. He opened the window at the top, and through the crack where the stars peeped brightly there came, louder than before, the uproar of human voices floating through the night from far away. The air of the great pine forest came in with it. Hendricks listened intently a moment. He positively jumped to feel a hand upon his arm. Laison's big head was thrust close up into his face. That's the commotion in the village, he whispered. A messenger has come and gone. Someone has gone back with him. Tonight I shall be needed. Down here, but tomorrow night, when the great ritual takes place, up there. Hendrix tried to push him away so as not to hear the words, but the little man seemed immovable as a rock. The impulse remained probable in the mind without making the muscles work, for the tutor, sorely tempted, longed to dare, yet faltered in his will. If you felt like taking the risk, the words continued seductively, we might place the empty vessel near enough to let it fill, then rescue it, charged with energy, in the nick of time. And the pasteur's eyes were aglow with enthusiasm his voice even trembling at the thought of high adventure to save another soul. Watch, merely, Hendricks heard his own voice whisper, hardly aware that he was saying it, without taking part. He said it thickly, stupidly, a man wavering and unsure of himself. It would be an experience, he stammered. I've never... Merely, watch, yes, look on, let him see, interrupted the other with eagerness. We must be very careful. It's worth trying. A last resort. They still stood close together. Hendricks felt the little man's breath on his face as he peered up at him. I admit the chance, he began weakly. There is no chance, was the vigorous reply. There is only providence. You have been guided. But as to risk and failure, what of them? What's involved? He asked, recklessness increasing in him. New wine and old bottles, was the answer. But here, you tell me, the vessel is not damaged, but merely empty. The machinery is all right, if he merely watches, as from a distance. Yes, yes, the machinery is there, I agree. The boy has breeding, health, and all the physical qualities. Good blood and nerves and muscles. It's only that life refuses to stay and drive them. His heart beat with violence, even as he said it. He felt the energy and zeal from the older man pour into him. He was realizing in himself on a smaller scale what might take place with the boy in large, but still shrank. Laison, for the moment, said no more. His spiritual discernment was equal to his boldness. Having planted the seed, he left it to grow or die. The decision was not for him. 
In the light of the single lamp, the two men sat facing each other, listening, waiting, while Les Ans talked occasionally, but in the main kept silence. Some time passed, though how long the tutor could not say. In his mind was wild confusion. How could he justify such a mad proposal? Yet, how could he refuse the opening, preposterous though it seemed? The enticement was very great. Temptation rushed upon him. Striving to recall his normal world, he found it difficult. The face of the old Marquess seemed a mere lifeless picture on a wall. It watched, but could not interfere. Here was an opportunity to take or leave. He fought the battle in terms of naked souls while the ordinary, four-cornered morality hid its face a while. He heard himself explaining, delaying, hedging, half-toying with the problem. But the redemption of a soul was at stake, and he tried to forget the environment and conditions of modern thought and belief. Sentences flashed at him out of the battle. I must take him back worse than when I started, or... What? A violent being like Marston, or a redeemed, converted system with new energy. It's a chance, and my last. Moreover, odd, half-comic detail, there was the support of the church, of a Protestant clergyman, whose fundamental beliefs were similar to the evangelical persuasions of the boy's family. Conversion, as demoniacal possession, were both traditions of the blood. After all, the old Marquess might understand and approve. You took the opening God set in your way in his wisdom. You showed faith and courage. Far be it from me to condemn you. The picture on the wall looked down at him and spoke the words. The wild hypothesis of the intrepid little missionary Pasteur swept him with an effect like hypnotism. Then suddenly something in him seemed to decide finally for itself. He flung himself, morality and all, upon this vigorous other personality. He leaned across the table, his face close to the lamp. His voice shook as he spoke. Would you he asked. Then knew the question foolish, and that such a man would shrink from nothing where the redemption of a soul was at stake. Knew also that the question was proof that his own decision was already made. There was something grotesque almost in the torrent of colloquial French Les Ans proceeded to pour forth, while the other sat listening in amazement, half ashamed and half exhilarated. He looked at the stalwart figure, the wiry bowed legs as he paced the floor, the shortness of the coat sleeves and the absence of shirt cuffs round the powerful lean wrists. It was a great fighting man he watched, a man afraid of nothing in heaven or earth, prepared to lead a forlorn hope into a hostile unknown land. And the sight, combined with what he heard, set the seal upon his half-hearted decision. He would take the risk and go. Pifoui! exclaimed the little pasteur as though it might have been an oath, his loud whisper breaking through into a guttural sound. Pifoui! Bah! Would that my people had machinery like that so that I could use it. I've no material to work on, no force to direct, nothing but heavy sodden clay. Jelly, he cried. Negative, useless, lukewarm stuff at best. He lowered his voice suddenly, so as to listen at the same time. I might as well be a beggar needing dough, he continued. They drink and yield and drink again. They never attack and drive. They're not worth laboring to save. He struck the wooden table with his fist, making the lamp rattle, while his listener started and drew back. What good can weak souls, though spotless, be to God? The best have long ago gone up to them. And he jerked his leonine old head toward the mountains. Where there's life, there's hope. He stamped his foot as he said it. But the lukewarm, parfois, I will spew them out of my mouth. He paused by the window a moment, listened attentively, then resumed his pacing to and fro. Clearly, he longed for action. Indifference, half-heartedness, had no place in his composition, and Hendrix felt his own slower blood take fire as he listened. Ah, cried Laison, louder, what a battle I could fight up there for God, could I but live among them, stem the flow of their dark, strong vitality, then twist it round and up, up, up and he jerked his finger skywards. It's the great sinners we want, not the meek-faced saints. There's enough among those devils to bring a whole canton to the great footstool, could I but direct it. He paused a moment, standing over his astonished visitor. Bring the boy up with you, and let him drink his fill, and pray. Pray, I say, that he become a violent sinner first, 
in order that later there shall be something worth offering to God over one sinner that repenteth. A rapid, nervous knocking interrupted the flow of words, and the figure of a woman stood upon the threshold. With the opening of the door came also again the roaring from the night outside. Hendrick saw the tall, somewhat disheveled outline of the wife. He remembered her vaguely, though she could hardly see him now in his darker corner, and recalled the fact that she had been sent out to Les Ans in his missionary days, a worthy, illiterate, but adoring woman. She wore a shawl, her hair was untidy, her eyes fixed and staring. Her husband's sturdy little figure, as he rose, stood level with her chin. "'You hear it, Jules?' she whispered thickly. "'The Giron has brought them down. You'll be needed in the village.' She said it anxiously, though Hendricks understood the patois with difficulty. They talked excitedly together a moment in the doorway, their outlines blocked against the corridor where a single oil lamp flickered. She warned, urging something. He expostulated. Fragments reached Hendricks in his corner. Clearly the woman worshipped her husband like a king, yet feared for his safety. He, for his part, comforted her, scolded a little, argued, told her to believe in God and go back to bed. They'll take you too, and you'll never learn. It's not your parish, anyhow. A touch of anguish in her tone. But Lesin was impatient to be off. He led her down the passage. My parish is wherever I can help. I belong to God. Nothing can harm me but to live undone the work he gives me. The steps went farther away as he guided her to the stairs. Outside, the roar of voices rose and fell. Wind brought the drifting sound. Wind carried it away. It was like the thunder of the sea. And the Englishman, using the little scene as a flashlight upon his own attitude, saw it for an instant as God might have seen it. Lesan's point of view was high, scanning a very wide horizon. His eye being single, the whole body was full of light. The risk, it suddenly seemed, was... Nothing. To shirk it, indeed, the merest cowardice. He went up and seized the pasteur's hand. Tomorrow, he said, a trifle shakily, perhaps, yet looking straight into his eyes. If we stay over, I'll bring the lad with me, provided he comes willingly. You will stay over, interrupted the other with decision. Come to supper at seven. Come in mountain boots. Use persuasion, but not force. He shall see it from a distance. "'Without taking part?' "'From a distance, yes,' the tutor repeated. "'But without taking part.' "'I know the signs,' the pasture broke in significantly. "'We can rescue him in the nick of time, "'charged with energy and life. "'Yet before the danger gets—' "'A sudden clangor of bells drowned the whispering voice, "'cutting the sentence in the middle. "'It was like an alarm of fire. "'Les Ans sprang sharply round.' "'The signal!' he cried. "'The signal from this church! Someone's been taken! I must go at once! I shall be needed!' He had his hat and cloak on in a moment, was through the passage and into the street, Hendricks following at his heels. The whole place seemed alive, yet the roadway was deserted and no lights showed at the windows of the houses. Only from the farther end of the village where stood the cabaret came a roar of voices, shouting, crying, singing. The impression was that the population was centered there. Far in the starry sky, a line of fires blazed upon the heights, throwing a lurid reflection above the deep black valley. Excitement filled the night. "'But how extraordinary!' exclaimed Hendricks, hurrying to overtake his alert companion. "'What life there is about! Everything's on the rush!' They went faster, almost running. "'I feel the waves of it beating even here!' He followed breathlessly. "'A messenger has come and gone,' replied Laison in a sharp, decided voice. What you feel here is but the overflow. This is the aftermath. I must walk down here with my people. I'll work with you, began the other, but Laison stopped him. Keep yourself for tomorrow night, up there, he said with grave authority, pointing to the fiery line upon the heights, and at the same time quickening his pace along the street. At the moment, he cried, looking back, your place is yonder. He jerked his head toward the carpenter's house among the vineyards. The next minute, he was gone. Chapter 5 And Hendricks, accredited tutor to a sprig of nobility in the twentieth century, asked himself suddenly how such things could possibly be. The adventure took on abruptly a touch of nightmare. Only the light in the sky above the cabaret windows and the roar of voices where men drank and sang brought home the reality of it all. 
With a shudder of apprehension, he glanced at the lurid glare upon the mountains. He was committed now, not because he had merely promised, but because he had definitely made up his mind. Lighting a match, he saw by his watch that the visit had lasted over two hours. It was after eleven. He hurried, letting himself in with the big house key, and going on tiptoe up the granite stairs. In his mind rose a picture of the boy as he had known him all these weary, sightseeing months. The mild brown eyes, the facile indolence, the pliant, watery emotions of the listless creature. But behind him now, like storm clouds, the hopes, desires, fears, the pasture's talk had conjured up. The yearning to save stirred strongly in his heart, and more and more of the little man's reckless spiritual audacity came with it. His own affection for the lad was genuine, but impatience and adventure pushed eagerly through the tenderness. If only... Oh, if only he could put life into that great six-foot, big-boned frame. Some energy as of fire and wind into that inert machinery of mind and body. The idea was utterly incredible, but surely no harm could come of trying the experiment. There were the huge and elemental forces, of course, in nature, and if... A sound in the bedroom as he crept softly past the door caught his attention, and he paused a moment to listen. Lord Ernie was not asleep then, after all. He wondered why the sound got somehow at his heart. There was shuffling behind the door. There was a voice, too. Or was it voices? He knocked. Who is it? came at once in a tone he hardly recognized. And as he answered, It's I, Mr. Hendricks. Let me in. There followed a renewal of the shuffling, but without the sound of voices and the door flew open. It was not even locked. Lord Ernie stood before him, dressed to go out. In the faint starlight, the tall, ungainly figure filled the doorway, erect and huge, the shoulders squared, the trunk no longer drooping. The listlessness was gone. He stood upright, limbs straight and alert. The sagging limp had vanished from the knees. He looked, in the semi-darkness, like another person, almost monstrous, and the tutor drew back instinctively, catching an instant at his breath. "'But, my dear boy, why don't you sleep?' he stammered. He glanced half-nervously about him. "'I heard you talking, surely.' He fumbled for a match, but before he found it, the other had turned on the electric switch. The light flared out. There was no one else in the room. "'Is anything the wrong with you? What's the matter?' But the boy answered quietly, though in a deeper voice than Hendrix had ever known in him before. Oh, "'I'm all right. Only I couldn't sleep. I've been watching those fires on the mountains.' I, I wanted to go out and see. He still held the field glasses in his hand, swinging them vigorously by the strap. The room was littered with clothes, just unpacked, the heavy shooting boots in the middle of the floor, and Hendrix, noticing these signs, felt a wave of excitement sweep through him, caught somehow from the presence of the boy. There was a sense of vitality in the room, as though a rush of active movement had just passed through it. Both windows stood wide open, and the roar of voices was clearly audible. Lord Ernie turned his head to listen. "'That's only the village people drinking and shouting,' said Hendricks, closely watching each movement that he made. "'It's perfectly natural, Bindi, that you feel too excited to sleep. We're in the mountains. The air stimulates tremendously. It makes the heart beat faster.' He decided not to press the lad with questions. "'But I never felt like this in the Rockies or the Himalayas,' came the swift rejoinder, as he moved to the window and looked out. "'There was nothing in India or Japan like that.' He swept his hand towards the wooded heights that towered above the village so close. He talked volubly. "'All those things we saw out there were sham, done on purpose for tourists. Up there it's real. I've been watching through the glasses till I felt I simply must go out and join it.' You can see men dancing round the fires, and big rushing women. Oh, Mr. Hendricks, isn't it all glorious? All too glorious and ripping for words. And his brown eyes shone like lamps. You mean that it's spontaneous, natural? The other guided him, welcoming the new enthusiasm, yet still bewildered by the startling change. It was not mere nerves he saw. There was nothing morbid in it. They're doing it, I mean, because they have to came the decided answer, and because they feel it. They're not just copying the world. He put his hand upon the other's arm. There was dry heat in it, 
that Hendricks felt even through his clothes. And that's what I want, the boy went on, raising his voice. What I've always wanted without knowing it. Real things that can make me alive. I've often had it in my dreams, you know, but now I've found it. But I, I didn't know you never told me of those dreams. The boy's cheeks flushed, so that the color and the fire in his eyes made him positively splendid. He answered slowly as out of some part he had hitherto kept deliberately concealed. Because I never could get hold of it in words. It sounded so silly, even to myself, and I thought Father would train it all away and laugh at it. It's awfully far down in me, but it's so real, I knew it must come out one day, and that I should find it. Oh, I say, Mr. Hendricks, and he lowered his voice, leaning out across the window sill suddenly. That fills me up and feeds me. He pointed to the heights, and gives me life. The life I've seen till now was only a kind of show. It starved me. I want to go up there and feel it pouring through my blood. He filled his lungs with the strong mountain air, and paused while he exhaled it slowly, as though tasting it with delight and understanding. Then he burst out again. I vote we go. Will you come with me? What do you say, eh? They stared at each other hard a moment. Something as primitive and irresistible as love passed through the air between them. With a great effort, the older man kept the balance true. Not tonight. Not now, he said firmly. It's too late. Tomorrow, if you like, with pleasure. But tomorrow night, cried the boy with a rush. When the fires are blazing and the wind is loose, not in the stupid daylight. All right, tomorrow night. And my old friend, Monsieur Lesin, shall be our guide. He knows the way, and he knows the people, too. Lord Ernie seized his hands with enthusiasm. His vigor was so disconcerting that it seemed to affect his physical appearance. The body grew almost visibly. His very clothes hung on him differently. He was no longer a non-entity yawning beneath an ancient pedigree and title. He was an aggressive personality. The boy in him rushed into manhood, as it were, while still retaining boyish speech and gesture. It was uncanny. Well, go more than once, I vote. Go again and again. This is a place and a half. It's my place with a vengeance. Not exactly the kind of place your father would wish you to linger in, his tutor interrupted. But we might stay a day or two, especially as you like it so. It's far better than the towns and the rotten embassies. Better than fifty Simlas and Bombays and filthy Cairos, cried the other eagerly. It's just the thing I need, and when I get home I'll show him something. I'll prove it. Why, they simply won't know me. He laughed, and his face shone with a kind of vivid radiance in the glare of the electric light. The transformation was more than curious. Waiting a moment to see if more would follow, Hendricks moved slowly then towards the door, with the remark that it was advisable now to go to bed since they would be up late the following night. When he noticed for the first time that the pillow and sheets were crumpled and that the bed had already been lain in, the first suspicion flashed back upon him with new certainty. Lord Ernie was already taking off his heavy coat, preparatory to undressing. He looked up quickly at the altered tone of voice. Bendy, the tutor said with a touch of gravity. You were alone just now, weren't you? Of course. The other sat up from stooping over his boots. With his hands resting on the bed behind him, he looked straight into his companion's eyes. Lying was not among his faults. He answered slowly, after a decided interval. I... I was asleep, he whispered, evidently trying to be accurate, yet hesitating how to describe the thing he had to say, and had a dream, one of my real vivid dreams, when something happens, only this time it was more real than ever before. It was, he paused searching for words, then added, sweet and awful, and Hendricks repeated the surprising sentence. Sweet and awful, Bendy. What in the world do you mean, boy? Lord Ernie seemed puzzled himself by the choice of words he used. I don't know exactly, he went on honestly. Only I mean that it was awfully real and splendid. A bit of my own life somewhere. Somewhere else. Where it lies hidden away behind a lot of days and months that choke it up. 
I could never get at it except in woods and places, quite alone, hearing the wind and making fires, or in sleep. He hid his face in his hands a moment, then looked up with a hint of censure in his eyes. Why didn't you tell me that such things were done? You never told me, he repeated. I didn't know it myself until this evening. Les Saints. I thought you knew everything, Lord Ernie broke in in that same half-chiding tone. Monsieur Les Saints told me tonight for the first time, said Hendricks firmly, that such people and practices existed. Till now I had never dreamed that such superstitions survived anywhere in the world at all. He resented the reproach, but he was also aware that the boy resented his authority. For the first time his ascendancy seemed in question. His voice, his eye, his manner did not quell as formerly. So you mean when you say sweet and awful that it was very real to you? He asked. He insisted now with purpose. Is that it, Bendy? The other replied eagerly enough. Yes, that's it, I think, partly. This time it was more than dreaming. It was real. I got there. I remembered. That's what I meant. And after I woke up, the thing still went on. The man seemed still in the room beside the bed, calling me to get up and go with him. Man? What man? The tutor leaned upon the back of a chair to steady himself. The wind just then went past the open windows with a singing rush. The dark man who passed us in the village, and who pointed to the fires on the heights. He came with the wind, you remember. He pulled my coat. The boy stood up as he said it. He came across the naked boarding, his step light and dancing. Fire that heats but does not burn, and wind that blows the heart alight or something. I forget now exactly. You heard it too. He whispered the words with excitement, raising his arms and knees as in the opening movements of a dance. Hendricks kept his own excitement down, but with a distinctly conscious effort. I heard nothing of the kind, he said calmly. I was only thinking of getting home dry. You say, he asked with decision, that you heard those words. Lord Ernie stood back a little. It was not that he wished to conceal, but that he felt uncertain how to express himself. In the street, he said, I heard nothing. The words rose up in my own head, as it were. But in the dream, and afterwards, too, when I was wide awake, I heard them out loud, clearly. Fire that heats but does not burn, and wind that blows the heart to flame. That's how it was. In French, Bendy. You heard it in French. Oh, it was no language at all. The eye said it, both times. He spoke as naturally as though it were Durba, he described again. Only this new aggressive certainty was in his voice and manner. Mr. Hendricks, he went on eagerly, you understand what I mean, don't you? When certain people look at one, words start up in the mind as though one heard them spoken. I heard the words in my head, I suppose, only they seem so familiar, as though I'd known them before. Always. Of course, Bendy, I understand, but this man. Tell me, did he stay on after you woke up? And how did he go? He looked round at the barely furnished room for hiding places. It was really the dream you carried on after waking, wasn't it? Then Bendy laughed, but inwardly as to himself. There was the faintest possible hint of derision in his voice. No doubt, he said. Only it was one of my big real dreams. And how he went, I can't explain at all, for I didn't see. You knocked at the door. I turned and found myself standing in the room, dressed to go out. There was a rush of wind outside the window, and when I looked he was no longer there. The same minute you came in. It was all as quick as that, I suppose I dressed in my sleep. They stood for several minutes, staring at each other without speaking. The tutor hesitated between several courses of action, unable for the life of him to decide upon any particular one. His instinct on the whole was to stop nothing but to encourage all possible expression, while keeping rigorous watch and guard. Repression, it seemed to him just then, was the least desirable line to take, Somewhere there was truth in the affair. He felt out of his depth, his authority impaired, and under these temporary disadvantages he might so easily make a grave mistake, injuring instead of helping. While Lord Ernie finished his undressing, he leaned out of the window, taking great draughts of keen night air, watching the blazing fires and listening to the roar of voices now dying down in the distance. 
and the voice of his thinking whispered to him. Let it all come out. Repress nothing. Let him have the entire adventure. If it's nonsense, it can't endure. And if it's true, it's inevitable. He drew his head in and moved towards the door. Then it's settled, he said quietly, as though nothing unusual had happened. We'll go up there tomorrow night with Monsieur Lesin to show us the way. And you'll go to sleep now, won't you? For tomorrow we may be up very late. Promise me, Bendy. I'm dead tired, came the answer from the sheets. I certainly shan't dream any more, if that's what you mean. I promise. Hendricks turned the light out and went softly from the room. He could always trust the boy. Good night, Bendy, he said. Good night, came the drowsy reply. Upstairs he lingered a long time over his own undressing, listening, waiting, watching for the least sound below. But nothing happened. Once, for his own peace of mind, he stole stealthily downstairs to the boy's door. Then, reassured by the heavy breathing that was distinctly audible, he went up finally and got into bed himself. The night was very still now. It was cool, and the stars were brilliant over lake and forest and mountain. No voices broke the silence. He only heard the tinkle of the little streams beyond the vineyards, and by midnight he was sound asleep. Chapter 6 and next day broke as soft and brilliant as though October had stolen it from June. The Alps gleamed through an almost summery haze across the lake. The air held no hint of coming winter, and the Jura Mountains wore the true blue of memory in Hendrix's mind. Patches of red and yellow splashed the great pine woods here and there where beech and ash put autumn in the vast dark carpet. The tutor woke clear-headed and refreshed. All that had happened the night before seemed out of proportion and unreasonable. There had been exaggerated emotion in it, in himself because he returned to a place still charged with potent memories of youth, and in Lord Ernie because the lad was overwrought by the electrical disturbance of the atmosphere. The nearness of the ancestral halls, which they both disliked, had emphasized it. The ominous wild weather had favored it, and the coincidence of these pagan rites of superstitious peasants had focused it all into a melodramatic form, with an added touch of the supernatural that was highly picturesque and dangerously suggestive. Hendricks recovered his common sense. Judgment asserted itself again. Yet for all that, certain things remained authentic. The effect upon the boy was not illusion, nor his words about fire and wind mere meaningless invention. There hid some undivined and significant correspondence between the gaps in his deficient nature in these two turbulent elements. The talk with Lesan, as the conduct of his wife, remained authentic. Those facts were too steady to be dismissed. The pasteur, too genuinely in earnest to be catalogued in dream. Neither daylight nor common sense could dissipate their actuality. Truth lay somewhere in it all. Thus the day for the tutor was a battle that shifted with varying fortune between doubt and certainty. In the morning his mind was decided. The wild experiment was unjustifiable. In the afternoon, as the sunshine grew faint and melancholy, it became interesting, for what harm could come of it? But towards the evening, when shadows lengthened across the purple forests, and the trees stood motionless in the calm and windless air, the adventure seemed, as it had seemed the night before, not only justifiable, but right and necessary. It only became inevitable, however, when after tea together on the balcony, Lord Ernie, mentioning the subject for the first time that day, asked pointedly what time the pasteur expected them to supper. Then, noticing the flash of hesitancy in his companion's eyes, added in his strange deep voice, You promised we should go. Withdrawal after that was out of the question. To retract would have meant, for one thing, final loss of the boy's confidence, a possibility not to be contemplated for a moment. Until this moment, no word of the preceding night had passed the lips of either. Lord Ernie had been quiet and preoccupied, silent rather, but never listless. He was peaceful, perhaps subdued a little, yet with a suppressed energy in his bearing that Hendricks watched with secret satisfaction. The tutor, closely observant, detected nothing out of gear. Life stirred strongly in him. There was purpose, interest, will, there was desire, but there was nothing to cause alarm. 
Availing himself then of the lad's absorption in his own affairs, he wandered forth alone upon his sentimental tour of inspection. No ghost of emotion rose to stalk beside him. That early tragedy, he now saw clearly, had been no more than youthful explosion of mere physical passion, wholesome and natural, but due chiefly to propinquity. His thoughts ran idly on. He was even congratulating himself upon escape and freedom when abruptly he remembered a phrase Bendy had used the night before, and stumbled suddenly upon a clue when least expecting it. He came to a sudden halt. The significance of it crashed through his mind and startled him. There are big, rushing women. It was the first reference to the other sex, as evidence of their attraction for him, Hendricks had ever known to pass his lips. Hitherto, though twenty years of age, the lad had never spoken of women as though he was aware of their terrible magic. He had not discovered them as females, necessary to every healthy male. It was not purity, of course, but ignorance. He had felt nothing. Something had now awakened sex in him so that he knew himself a man, and naked. And it had revolutionized the world for him. This new life came from the roots, transforming listless indifference into positive desire. The will woke out of sleep, and all the currents of his system took aggressive form. For all energy, intellectual, emotional, or spiritual, is fundamentally one. It is primarily sexual. Hendricks paused in his sentimental walk, marveling that he had not realized sooner this simple truth. It brought a certain logical meaning, even into the pagan rites upon the mountains, these ancient rites which symbolized the marriage of the two tremendous elements of wind and fire, heat and air, and the lad's quiet, busy mood that morning confirmed his simple discovery. It involved restraint and purpose. Lord Ernie was alive. Hendricks would take home with him to those ancestral halls a vessel bursting with energy creative energy. It was admirable that he should witness, from a safe distance, this primitive ceremony of crude pagan origin. It was the very thing, and the tutor hurried back to the house among the vineyards, aware that his responsibility had increased, but persuaded more than ever that his course was justified. The sky held calm and cloudless through the day, the forests brooding beneath the hazy autumn sunshine. Indications that the second hurricane lay brewing among the heights were not wanting, however, to experienced eyes. Almost a preternatural silence reigned. There was a warm heaviness in the placid atmosphere. The surface of the lake was patched and streaky. The extreme clarity of the air, an ominous omen. Distant objects were too close. Toward sunset, moreover, the streaks and patches vanished as though sucked below, while thin strips of tenuous cloud appeared from nowhere above the northern cliffs. They moved with great rapidity at an enormous height, touched with a lurid brilliance as the sun sank out of sight. And when Hendricks strolled over with Lord Ernie to La Cure for supper, there came a sudden rush of heated wind that set the branches sharply rattling, then died away as abruptly as it rose. They seemed reflected, too, these disturbances, in the human atmospheres about the supper table. There was suppression of various emotions, emotions presaging violence. Lord Ernie was exhilarated, Hendricks uneasy and preoccupied, the pasture grave and thoughtful. In Hendricks was another feeling as well, that he had lightly summoned a storm which might carry him off his feet. The boy's excitement increased it, as wind puffs fan a starting fire. His own judgment had somewhere played him false, betraying him into this incredible adventure, and yet he could not stop it. The pasture's influence was over him, perhaps. He was ashamed to turn back. He was committed. The unusual circumstances found the weakness in his character. For somewhere in the preposterous superstition there lay a big forgotten truth. He could not believe it, and yet he did believe it. The world had forgotten how to live truly close to nature. A desultory conversation was carried on, chiefly between the two men, while the boy ate hungrily, and Madame Lezan watched her husband with anxiety as she served the simple meal. "'So you are coming with us, and you like to come,' the pasture observed quietly, Hendricks translating. Lord Ernie replied with a gesture of unmistakable enthusiasm. "'A wild lot of men and women,' Lezan went on, keeping his eye hard upon him, "'was an interesting worship of their own copied, from very ancient times. They live on the heights, and mix little with us valley folk.' You shall see the ceremonies tonight. 
They get the wind and fire into themselves, don't they? Asked the boy keenly, and somewhat to the distress of the translator who rendered it. They get into wind and fire. They wash up wind and fire, Laison replied, and they do it by means of a wonderful dance that somehow imitates the leap of flame and the headlong rush of wind. If you copy the movements and gestures of a person, you discover the emotion that causes them. You share it. Their idea is apparently that by imitating the movements they invite or attract the force. Draw these elemental powers into their systems, so that in the end... He stopped suddenly, catching the tutor's eye. Lord Ernie seemed to understand without translation. He had laid down his knife and fork and was leaning forward across the table, listening with deep absorption. His expression was alert with a new intelligence that was almost cunning. An acute sensibility seemed to have awakened in him. As with laughing, I suppose, he said in an undertone to Hendricks quickly. If you imitate a laughter, you laugh yourself in the end, and feel all the jolly excitement of laughter. Is that what he means? The tutor nodded with assumed indifference. Imitation is always infectious, he said lightly. But of course you will not imitate these people yourself, Bendy. We will just look on from a distance. From a distance? repeated the boy, obviously disappointed. What's the good of that? A look of obstinacy passed across his altered face. Hendricks met his eyes squarely. At a circus, he said firmly, you just watch. You don't imitate the clown, do you? If you look on long enough, you do, was the rather dogged reply. Well, take the Russian dances we saw in Moscow, the other insisted patiently. You felt the power and beauty without jumping up and whirling in your stall. Bindi half glared at him. There was almost contempt in his quiet answer. But your mind whirled with them, and later your body would too. Otherwise, it's given you nothing. He paused a second. I can only get the fun of riding by being on a horse's back and doing his movements exactly with him, not by watching him. Hendricks smiled and shrugged his shoulders. He did not wish to discourage the enthusiasm lying behind this analysis. The uneasiness in him grew apace. He said something rapidly in French, using an undertone and laughter to confuse the actual words. Of course, we must not interfere with their ceremonies, put in the pasture with decision. It's sacred to them. We can hide among the trees and watch. You would not leave your seat in church to imitate the priest, would you? He glanced smilingly at the eager youth before him. If he did something real, I would. It was said with a bright flash in the eyes. Anything real, I'd copy like a shot. Only, I never find it. The reply was disconcerting, rather, and Hendricks, as he hurriedly translated, made a clatter with his knife and fork for something in him rose to meet the truth behind the curious words. From that moment, as though catching a little of the boy's exhilaration, he passed under a kind of spell, perhaps. It was, in spite of the exaggeration, oddly stimulating. This dull little meal at the village curé masked an accumulating vehemence, eager to break loose. He heard the old father's voice. Well done, Hendricks. You have accomplished wonders. He would take back the boy, alive. Yet all the time there were streaks and patches on his soul as upon the surface of the lake that afternoon. There were signs of terror. He felt himself letting go, an increasing recklessness, a yielding up more and more of his own authority to that of this triumphant boy. Bindi understood the meaning of it all and felt secure. Hendricks faltered, hesitated stood on the defensive, yet ever less and less. Already he accepted the other's guidance. Already Lord Ernie's leadership was in the ascendant. Conviction invariably holds dominion over doubt. They ate little. It was near the end of the meal when the wind, falling from a clear and starlit sky, struck its first violent blow, dropping with the force of an explosion that shook the wooden house and passing with a roar towards the distant lake. The oil lamp, suspended from the ceiling, trembled. The pasteur looked apprehensively at the shuttered windows, and Lord Ernie, with startling abruptness, stood up. His eyes were shining. His voice was brisk, alert, and deep. The wind! The wind! 
he cried. Think what it'll be up there. We shall feel it on our bodies. His enthusiasm was like a rush of air across the table. And the fire, he went on. The flames will lick all over and tear about the sky. I feel wild and full of them already. How splendid! And the flame of the little lamp leaped higher in the chimney as he said it. The violence of the coup de Joran is extraordinary, explained Lézin as he got up to turn down the wick. And the second outburst. The rest of his sentence was drowned by the noise of Hendrick's voice telling the boy to sit down and finish his supper. And at the same moment, the pasteur's wife came in as though a stroke of wind drove behind her down the passage. The door slammed in the draft. There was a momentary confusion in the room above, which her voice rose shrill and frightened. "'Is the fires are alight, Jules,' she whispered in her half-intelligible patois. "'The forest is burning all along the upper ridge.' Her face was pale and her speech came stumbling. She lowered her lips to her husband's ear. "'They'll be looking out for recruits tonight. Is it necessary? Is it right for you to go?' She glanced uneasily at the English visitors. You know the danger. He stopped her with a gesture. Those who look on at life accomplish nothing, he answered impatiently. One must act, always act. Chances are sent to be taken, not stared at. He rose, pushing past her into the passage, and as he did so she gave him one swift comprehensive look of tenderness and admiration, then hurried after him to find his hat and cloak. Willingly, she would have kept him at home that night. Yet gladly, in another sense, she saw him go. She fumbled in her movements, ready to laugh or cry or pray. Hendricks saw her pain and understood. It was singular how the woman's attitude intensified his own misgivings. Her behavior, the mere expression of her face alone, made the adventure so absolutely real. Three minutes later, they were in the village street. Hendricks and Lord Ernie the latter impatient in the road beyond, saw her tall figure stoop to embrace him. I shall pray all night. I shall watch from my window for your return, God who speaks from the whirlwind, and whose pathway is the fire, will go with you. Remember the younger men. It is ever the younger men that they seek to take. Her words were half hysterical. The kiss was given and taken. The open doorway framed her outline a moment. Then the buttress of the church blotted her out and they were off. End of section two. Section three of Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. The Regeneration of Lord Ernie, Chapter Seven. And at once the curious confusion of strong wind was upon them. Gusts, howled about the corners of the shuttered houses and tore noisily across the open yards. Dust whirled with the rapidity as of some spectral white machinery. A tile came clattering down about their feet, while overhead the roofs had an air of shifting, toppling, bending. The entire village seemed scooped up and shaken, then dropped upon the earth again in tottering fashion. "'This way!' gasped the little pasteur, blown sideways like a sail. "'Follow me closely!' Almost arm in arm at first, they hurried down the deserted street, past lampless windows and tight-fastened doors, and soon were beyond the cabaret in that open stretch between the village and the forest, where the wind had unobstructed way. Far above them ran the fiery mountain range. They saw the glare reflected in the sky as the tempest first swept them all three together, then separated them in the same moment. They seemed to spin or whirl. "'It's far worse than I expected,' shouted their guide. Here, give me your hand! Then found, once disentangled from his flapping cloak, that no one stood beside him. For each of them it was a single fight to reach the shelter of the woods, where the actual ascent began. An instant the pasteur seemed to hesitate. He glanced back at the lighted window of La Cure, across the fields, at the line of fire in the sky, at the figure disappearing in the blackness immediately ahead. Where's the boy? he shouted. Don't let him get too far in front! Keep close. Wait till I come. They staggered back against each other. Look how easily he slipped ahead already. This howling wind, 
Hendrick shouted as they advanced side by side, pushing their shoulders against the storm. The rest of the sentence vanished into space. Les Ans shoved him forward, pointing to where, some twenty yards in front, the figure of Lord Ernie, head down, was battling eagerly with the hurricane. Already he stood near to the shelter of the trees, waving his arms with energy towards the summits where the fires blazed. He was calling something at the top of his voice, urging them to hurry. His voice rushed down upon them with a pelt of wind. "'Don't let him get away from us!' bawled Laison, holding his hands cupwise to his mouth. "'Keep him in reach. He may see, but must not take part.' A blow full in the face that smote him like the flat of a great sword clapped the sentence short. "'That's your part. He won't obey me!' Hendricks heard it as they plunged across the windswept reach, panting, struggling, forcing their bodies sideways like two-legged crabs against the terrific force of the descending Joran. They reached the protection of the forest wall without further attempt at speech. Here there was sudden peace and silence, for the tall, dense trees received the tempest's impact like a cushion, stopping it. They paused a moment to recover breath. But although the first exhaustion speedily passed, the original confusion of strong wind remained in Hendrick's mind at least, for wind violent enough to be battled with has a scattering effect on thought and blows the very blood about. Something in him snapped its cables and blew out to sea. His breath drew in an impetuous quality from the tempest each time he filled his lungs. There was agitation in him that caused an odd exaggeration of the emotions. The boy, as they came up, leaped down from a boulder he had climbed. He opened his arms, making of his cloak a kind of sail that filled and flapped, at last, he cried, impatient, almost vexed. I thought you were never coming. The wind blew me along. We shall be late. The tutor caught his arm with vigor. You keep by us, Ernest. Do you hear now? No rushing ahead like that. Lausanne's the guide, not you. He even shook him, but as he did so, he was aware that he himself resisted something that did not really want to resist, something that urged him forcibly. A little more, and he would yield to it with pleasure, with abandon, Finally, with recklessness, a reaction of panic fear ran over him. "'It was the wind, I tell you,' cried the boy, flinging himself free with a hint of insolence in his voice. "'For it's alive. I mean to see everything. The wind's our leader, and the fire's our guide.' He made a movement to start on again. "'You'll obey me,' thundered Hendricks, "'or else you'll go home. Do you understand?' With exasperation, yet with uneasy delight, he noted the words Bindi made use of. It was in him that he might almost have uttered them himself. He stepped already into an entirely new world. Exhilaration caught him even now. Putting the brake on was mere pretense. He seized the lad by both shoulders and pushed him to the rear, then placed himself next, so that Laison moved in front and led the way. The procession started, diving into the comparative shelter of the forest. Don't let him pass you, he heard in rapid French. Guide him, that's all. The power's already in his blood. Keep yourself in hand as well, and follow me closely. The road of the storm above them carried the words clean off the world. Here in the forest, they moved, it seemed, along the floor of an ocean whose surface raged with dreadful violence. Any moment one or the other of them might be caught up to that surface and whirled off to destruction. For the procession was not one with itself. The darkness, the difficulty of hearing what each said... The feeling, too, that each climbed for himself made everything seem at sixes and sevens, and the tutor, this secret exultation growing in his heart, denied the anxiety that kept at pace, and battled with his turbulent emotions, a divided personality. His power over the boy, he realized, had gravely weakened. A little time ago they had seemed somehow equal. Now, however, a complete reversal of their relative positions had taken place. The boy was sure of himself, while... Laison led at a steady mountaineer's pace on his wiry, short-bowed legs. Hendricks, a yard or two behind him, stumbled a good deal in the darkness. Lord Ernie forever on his heels, eager to push past. But Bendy never stumbled. There was no flagging in his muscles. He moved so lightly and with so sure a tread that he almost seemed to dance. And often he stopped aside to leap a boulder or to run along a fallen trunk. Path there was none. Occasional gusts of wind rushed gustily down into these depths of forest where they moved, and now from time to time as they rose nearer to the line of fire on the ridge, an increasing glare lit up the knuckled roots 
or glimmered on the bramble thickets and heavy beds of moss. It was astonishing how the little pasteur never missed his way. Periods of thick silence alternated with movements, when the storm swept down through gullies among the trees, reverberating like thunder in the hollows. Slowly they advanced, buffeted, driven, pushed, the wildness of some Walpurgis night growing upon all three. In the tutor's mind was this strange lift of increasing recklessness, the old proportion gone, the spiritual aspect of it troubling him to the point of sheer distress. He followed Laison as blindly with his body as he followed this new bendy eagerly with his mind. For this languid boy, now dancing to the tune of flooding life at his very heels, seemed magical in the true sense, energy created as by a wizard out of nothing. From lips that ordinarily sighed in listless boredom poured now a ceaseless stream of questions and ejaculations, ringing with enthusiasm. How long would it take them to reach the fiery ridge? Why did they go so slowly? Would they arrive too late? Would their intrusion be welcomed or understood? Already one great change was effected, accepted by Hendricks too, that the role of mere spectator was impossible. The answers Hendricks gave indeed grew more and more encouraging and sympathetic. He too was impatient with their leader's crawling pace. Some elemental spell of wind and fire urged him towards the open ridge. The pull became irresistible. He despised the pasteur's caution, denied his wisdom, wholly rejected now the spirit of compromise and prudence. And once, as the hurricane brought down a flying burst of voices, he caught himself leaping upon a big gray boulder in their path. He leaped at the very moment that the boy behind him leaped, yet hardly realized that he did so. His feet danced without a conscious order from his brain. They met together on the rounded top, stumbled, clutched one another frantically, then slid with waving arms and flying cloaks down the slippery surface of damp moss, laughing wildly. "'Fool!' cried Hendricks, saving himself. "'What in the world?' "'You cold?' laughed Bindi, picking himself up and dropping back to his place in the rear again. "'It's the wind, not me. It's in our feet. Half the time you're shouting and jumping yourself.' And it was a few minutes after this that Lord Ernie suddenly forged ahead. He slipped in front as silently as a shadow before a moving candle in a room. Passing the tutor at a moment when his feet were entangled among roots and stones, he easily overtook the pasture and found himself in the lead. He never stumbled. There seemed steel springs in his legs. From Laison, too breathless to interfere, came a cry of warning. Stop him! Take his hand! His tired voice instantly smothered by the roaring skies. He turned to catch Hendricks by the cloak. You see that? he shouted in alarm. For the love of God, don't lose sight of him. He must see, but not take part. Remember. And Hendricks yelled after the vanishing figure. Bindi, go slow, go slow. Keep in touch with us. But he quickened his pace instantly, as though to overtake the boy. He passed his companion the same minute and was out of sight. I'll wait for you, came back the boy's shrill answer through the thinning trees. And a flare of light fell with it from the sky for the final climb of a steep five hundred feet had now begun, and overhead the naked ridge ran east and west with its line of blazing fires. Boulders and rocky ground replaced the pines and spruces. "'But you'll never find the way!' shouted Laison, while a deep trumpeting roar of the storm beyond muffled the remainder of the sentence. Hendricks heard the next words close beside him from a clump of shadows. He was in touching distance of the excited boy. The fires and the singing guide me. Only a fool could miss the way. But you are a... He swallowed the unuttered word. A new extraordinary respect was suddenly in him. That tall, virile figure, instinct with life, springing so cleverly through the choking darkness, guiding with decision and intelligence almost infallible. It was no fool that led them thus. He hurried after till his very sinews ached. His eyes, troubled and confused, strained through the trees to find him. But these same trees now fled past him in a torrent. Bendy! Bendy! He cried at the top of his voice, yet not with the imperious tone the situation called for. The sentence dropped into a lull of wind. Instead of command, there was entreaty, almost supplication in it. Wait for me! Oh, I'm coming! We'll see the glorious thing together! And then suddenly the forest lay behind him with a belt of open pasture land in front below the actual ridge. 
He felt the first great draft of heat as a line of furnaces burst their doors with a mighty roar and turned the sky into a blaze of golden daylight. There was a crackling as of musketry. The flare shot up and burned the air about him, and the voices of a multitude as yet invisible drove through it like projectiles on the wind. This was the first impression, wholesale and terrific, that met him as he paused an instant on the edge of the sheltering forest and looked forward. Les Ans and Lord Ernie seemed to leave his mind, forgotten in this first attack of splendor, but forgotten, as it were, the first with contempt, the latter with an overwhelming regret. For the pasteur's mistake in that instant seemed obvious. In half measures lay the fatal error, and in compromise the danger. Bendy, all along, had known the better way and followed it. The lukewarm was the worthless. "'Bendy boy, where are you? I'm coming!' And stepping on to the grassy strip of ground soft to his feet, he met a wind that fell upon his body with a shower of blows from all directions at once, and beat him to his knees. He dropped, it seemed, into the cover of a sheltering rock, for there followed then a moment of sudden and delicious stillness in which the weary muscles recovered themselves, and thought grew slightly steadier. Crouched thus close to the earth, he no longer offered a target to the hurricane's attack. He peered upwards, making a screen of his hands. The ridge, some fifty feet above him, he saw, ran in a generous platform along the mountain crest. It was wide and flat, between the enormous fires of piled-up wood that stretched for half a mile coiled a medley of dense smoke and tearing sparks. No human beings were visible, and yet he was aware of crowding life quite near. On hands and knees, crawling painfully, he then slowly retreated again into the shelter of the forest he had sought to leave. He stood up. The awful blaze was veiled by the roof of branches once more. But as he rose, seizing a sapling to steady himself by, two hands caught him with violence from behind, and a familiar voice came shouting against his ear. Les Ans, panting, disheveled, and half-broken with the speed, stood beside him. "'Ce boy, where is he? We're just in time!' He roared the words to make them carry above the den. "'Hurry! Hurry! I follow! My older legs! See for the love of God that he has not taken! I warned you!' And for a second, as he heard, Hendricks caught at the vanished sense of responsibility again. He saw the face of the old Marquess watching him among the tree trunks. He heard his voice, amazed, reproachful, furious. It was criminal of you. Criminal. Where is the boy? Your boy! Again broke in the shout of the pasteur with a slap of hurricane, as he staggered against the tutor, half collapsing and trying to point the direction. Watch him! Find him, for the love of heaven, before it is too late! Before they see him! The tutor's normal and responsible self dived out of sight again, as he heard the cry of weakness and alarm. It seemed the wind got under him, lifting him bodily from his feet. He did not pause to think. Like a man midway in a whirling prize fight, he felt dazed but confident, only conscious of one thing, that he must hold out to the end, take part in all the splendid fighting, win. The lust of the arena, the pride of youth and battle, the impetuous recklessness of the charge and primitive war caught at his heart, brimming it with headlong courage. To play the game for all it might be worth seemed shouted everywhere about him as the abandon of wind and fire rushed through him like a storm. He felt lifted above all possibility of little failure. The Marquess, with his conventional traditions, the Pasteur, with his considerations of halfway safety, both vanished utterly. Safety, indeed, both for himself and for the boy in his charge lay in unconditional surrender. This was no time for little thought-out actions. It was all or nothing. "'God bless the whirlwind and the fire!' he shouted, opening wide his arms. But his voice was inaudible amid the uproar, and the forward movement of his body remained at first only in the brain. He turned to push the old man aside, even to strike him down if necessary. Lukewarm yourself, and a coward, rose in his throat, yet found no utterance, for in that moment a tall slim figure, swift as a shadow, steady as a hawk, shot hard across the open space between the forest and the ridge. In the direction of the blazing platform it disappeared against a curtain of thick smoke, emerged for one second in a storm of light, then vanished finally behind a ruin of loose rocks. And Hendricks, his eyes wounded by heat and wind, his muscles paralyzed, 
understood that the boy deliberately invited capture. The multitude that hid behind the smoke and fire, feeding the blazing heaps with eager hands, had become aware of him, and presently would appear to claim him. They would take him to themselves. Already answering flares ran east and west along the desolate ridge. "'I'll join you. I'm coming. Wait for me!' he tried to cry. The uproar smothered it. Chapter 8 And this uproar, he now perceived, was composed entirely of wind and fire. Here on the roof of the hills beneath a starry sky, these two great elements expressed their nature with unhampered freedom. For there was neither rain to modify the one, nor solid obstacle to check the other. Their voices merged in a single sound, the hollow boom of wind and the deep resounding clap of flame. The splitting crackle of burning branches imitated the high, shrill whistle of the tearing gusts that, javelin-like, flew to and fro in darts of swifter sound. But one shout rose from the summit, no human cry distinguishable in it nor amid the thousand lines of skeleton wood that pierced the golden background was any human outline visible. Fire and wind encouraged one another to madness, manifesting in prodigious splendor by themselves. Then suddenly, before a gigantic canter of the wind, the driving smoke rolled upwards like a curtain, and the flames, ceasing their wild flapping, soared steadily in gothic windows of living gold towards the stars. In towering rows between columns of black night, they transformed the empty space between them into a colossal temple aisle. They tapered aloft symmetrically into vanishing crests, and Hendricks stood upright, rising so that his shoulders topped the edge of the boulder, and utterly contemptuous of Laison's hand that sought with violence to drag him into shelter, he gazed as one who sees a vision. For at first he could only stand and stare, aware of sensation but not of thought. An enormous, overpowering conviction blew his whole being to white heat. Here was a supply of elemental power that human beings, empty, needy, starved, deficient human beings, could use. His love for the boy leaped headlong at the skirts of this terrific salvation. A majestic possibility stormed through him. Yet it was no nightmare wonder that met his staring and half-shielded eyes, although some touch of awful dream seemed in it, set, moreover, to a scale that scantier minds might deem distortion. The heat from some thirty fires, placed at regular intervals, made midnight quiver with immense vibrations. Of varying yet calculated size, these towering heaps emitted notes of measured and alternating depth, until the roar along the entire line produced a definite scale almost of melody, the near ones shrilly singing, those more distant booming with mountainous pedal notes. The consonance was monstrous, yet conformed to some magnificent diapason. This chord of fire music paced the starlit sky, directed but never overmastered by the wind that measured it somehow into meaning. Repeated in quick succession, the notes now crashing in a mass, now singing alone in solitary beauty, the effect suggested an idea of ordered sequence, of gigantic rhythm. It seemed indeed as though some controlling agency, mastering excess, coerced both raging elements to express through this stupendous dance some definite idea. Here, as it were, was the alphabet of some natural, undifferentiated language, a language of sight and sound predating speech, symbolical in the ultimate deific sense. Some lord of fire and some lord of air were in command, harnessed and regulated these formless cohorts of energy that men call stupidly mere flame and wind, obeyed a higher power than had evoked them. Yet a power that, by understanding their laws of being, held them most admirably in control. This, at least, seemed a hint of the explanation that flashed into Hendrix as he stared in amazed bewilderment from the shelter of the nearest boulder. He read a sentence in some natural forgotten script. He watched a primitive ritual that once invoked the gods. He was aware of rhythm, and he was aware of system, though as yet he did not see the hand that wrote this marvelous sentence on the night. For still the human element remained invisible. He only realized, in dim, blundering fashion, that he witnessed a revelation of those two powers which, in large, lie at the foundations of the universe, and, in little, are the basic essentials of human existence. 
the powers behind heat and air. Fragments of that talk with Lezon stammered back across his mind like letters in some stupendous word he dared not reconstruct entire. He shuddered and grew wise. Realms of forgotten being opened their doors before his dazzled sight. Vision fluttered into far-piercing vistas of ancient wonder, haunting and half-remembered, then lost its way in blindness that was pain. For a moment it seemed he was aware of majestic presences behind the turmoil, shadowy but mighty, charged with a vague potentiality as of immense algebraical formulae, symbolical and beyond full comprehension, yet willing and able to be used for practical results. He felt the elements as nerves of a living universe yet thinking was not really in him anywhere. Feeling was all he knew. The world he moved in, as the script he read, belonged to conditions too utterly remote for reason to recover a single clue to their intelligible reconstruction. Glory, clean and strong as of primitive star worship, passed between what he saw and all that he had ever known before. The curtain of conventional belief was rent in twain. The terrific thing was true. For an unmeasured interval, the tutor, oblivious of time and actual place, stood on the brink of this majestic pageant, staring with breathless awe, while the swaying of the entire scenery increased, like the sway of an ocean lifted to the sky by many winds. Then suddenly, in one of those temporary lulls that passed between the beat of the great notes, his searching eyes discovered a new thing. The focus of his sight was altered, and he realized at last the source of the directing and the controlling power. Behind the fires and beyond the smoke he recognized the disc-like shining ovals that upon this little earth stand in the image of the one eternal likeness. He saw the human faces, symbols of spiritual dominion over all lesser orders, each one possessed of belief, intelligence, and will. Singly so feeble, together so invincible. This assemblage, unscorched by the fire and by the wind unmoved, seemed to him impressive beyond all possible words, and a further inkling of the truth flashed on him as he stared, that a group of humans, a crowd combining upon a given object with concentrated purpose, possessed of that terrific power, certain faith, may know in themselves the energy to move great mountains, and therefore the lesser energy to guide the fluid forces of the elements and a sense of cosmic exaltation leaped into his being. For a moment he knew a touch of almost frenzy. Proud joy rose in him like a splendor of omnipotence. Humanity, it seemed to him, here came into a grand but long-neglected corner of its kingdom, as originally planned by heaven. Into the hands of a weakling and deficient boy the guidance had been given. Motionless beneath the stars, lit by the glare till they shone like idols of yellow stone, and magnified by the sheets of flying intolerable light. The wind chased to and fro. These rows of faces appeared at first as a single line of undifferentiated fire against the background of the night. The eyes were all cast down in prayer, each mind focused steadily upon one clear idea, the control and assimilation of two elemental powers. The crowd was one, feeling was one, desire, command, and certain faith were one. The controlling power that resulted was irresistible. Then came a remarkable, concerted movement. With one accord the eyes all opened, blazing with reflected fire. A hundred human countenances rose in a single shining line. The men stood upright, swarthy faces, tanned by sun and wind, heads uncovered, hair and beards tossing in the air, turned all one way. Mouths opened, too. There came a roar that even the hurricane could not drown. A word of command, it seemed, that sprang into the pulses of the dancing elements and reduced their turmoil to a wave of steadier movement. And at the same moment a hundred bodies, naked above the waist, arms outstretched and hands with the palms held upwards, swayed forwards through the smoke and fire. They came towards the spot where, half concealed from view, the tutor crouched and watched, and Hendrix, thinking himself discovered, first quailed, then rose to meet them. No power to resist was in him. It was rather willing response that he experienced. He stepped out from the shelter of the boulder and entered the brilliant glare. Hatless himself, shoulders squared, cloak flying in the wind, 
He took three strides towards the advancing battalion, then, undecided, paused. For the line he saw disregarded him as though he were not there at all. It was not him the worshippers sought. The entire troop swept past to a point some fifty feet below, where the end of the ridge broke out of the thinning trees. Beautiful as a curving wave of flame, the figures streamed across the narrow open space with a drilled precision, as of some battle line. And Hendricks, with a sense of wild, secret triumph, saw them pause at the brink of the platformed ridge, form up their serried ranks yet closer, then open two hundred arms to welcome someone whom the darkness should immediately deliver. Simultaneously from the covering trees, the tall, slim shadow of Lord Ernie darted out into the light. "'Magnificent!' cried Hendricks, but his voice was smothered instantly in a mightier sound, and his movement forward seemed ineffective stumbling. The hundred voices thundered out a single note. Like a deer the boy leaped, like a tongue of flame he flew to join his own, and instantly was surrounded, borne shoulder-high upon those upturned palms, swept back in triumph toward the procession of enormous fires. Wrapped by smoke and sparks, lifted by wind, he became part of the monstrous rhythm that turned that mountain ridge alive. He stood upright upon the platform of interlacing arms. He swayed with their movements as a thing of wind and fire that flew. The shining faces vanished then, turned all towards the blazing piles so that the boy had the appearance of standing on a wall of living black. His outline was visible a moment against the sky, Firelight between his wide-stretched legs, streaming from his hair and horizontal arms, issuing almost, as it seemed, from his very body. The next second he leaped to the ground, ran forward, appallingly close, between two heaped-up fires, flung both hands heavenwards, and knelt. And Hendricks, sympathetically following the boy's performance as though his own mind and body took part in it, experienced then a singular result. It seemed the heart in him began to roar. This was no rustle of excited blood that the little cavern of his skull increased, but a deeper sound that proclaimed the kinship of his entire being with the ritual. His own nature had begun to answer. From that moment he perceived the spectacle, not with the senses of sight and hearing separately, but with his entire body, synthetically. He became a part of this assembly that was itself one single instrument, a cosmic sounding board for the rhythmical expression of impersonal nature powers. Les ans, he dimly realized, fixed in his churchy tenets, remained outside, apart, and compromising. Hendricks accepted and went with. All little customary feelings dipped utterly away, lost, false, denied, even as a unit in a crowd loses its normal characteristics in the greater mood that sways the whole. The fire no longer burned him, for he was the fire. Nor did he stagger against the furious wind, because the wind was in his heart. He moved all over, alive in every point and corner. With his skin he breathed, his bones and tissue ran with glorious heat. He cried aloud, he praised, I am the whirlwind and I am the fire. Fire that lights but does not burn, and wind that blows the heart to flame. His body sang it, or rather the elements sang it through his body. For the sound of his voice was not audible, and it was wind and fire that thundered forth his feeling in their crashing rhythm. Chapter 9 And so it was that he no longer saw this thing pictorially, nor in the little detached reports the individual senses brought, but knew it in himself complete, as a man knows love and passion. Memory afterwards translated these vast central feelings into pictures, but the pictures touched reality without containing it. Like a vision, it happened all at once, as a room or landscape happens, and what happens all at once, coming through a synthesis of the senses, is not properly describable later. To instantaneous knowledge, mere sequence is a falsehood. The sequence first comes in with the telling afterwards. That kneeling form, he understood, was the empty vessel to which conventional life had hitherto denied the heat and air it craved. The breath of life now poured at full tide into it. The fire of deity lit its heart of touchwood, wind blew into desire, and later flame would burst forth in action, consuming opposition. He must let it fill to the brim. It was not salvation, but creation. Then thought went out, 
extinguished by a puff of something greater. For beyond the smoke and sparks, beyond the space the men had occupied, a new and gentler movement, lyrical with bird-like beauty, ran suddenly along the ridge. What Hendricks had taken for branches heaped in rows for the burning stirred marvelously throughout their whole collective mass, stirred sweetly, too, and with an exquisite loveliness. The entire line rose gracefully into the air with a whirr as of sweeping birds. There was a soft and undulating motion as though a draft of flowing wind turned faintly visible, yet, with an increasing brilliance, like shining lilies of flame that now flocked forward in a troop, bending deliciously all one way. And in the same second these tall lilies of fire revealed themselves as figures, naked above the waist, hair streaming on the wind, eyes alight and bare arms waving. Above the men's deep pedal bass their voices rose with clear, shrill sweetness on the storm. The band swept forwards, swift as wind, towards the kneeling boy. The long line curved about him foldingly. The women took him as the south wind takes a bird. There may have been, indeed there was, an interval, for Hendricks caught, again and again repeated, the boy's great cry of passionate delight above the tumult. Ringing and virile it rose to heaven, clear as a fine-wrought bell, and instantaneously the knitted figures of flame disentangled themselves again. The mass unfolded like an opening flower, and as by a military word of command, dissolved itself once more into a long, thin line of running fire. The women advanced, and the waiting men flowed forward in a stream to meet them. This interweaving of the figures was as easily accomplished as the mingling of light and heavy threads upon some living room. Hands joining hands, all singing, these naked worshippers of fire and wind passed in and out among the blazing piles with a headlong precision that was torrential and yet orderly. The speed increased, the faces flashed and vanished, then flashed and passed again. Each woman between two men, each man between two women, and Lord Ernie, radiantly alive, between two girls of rich, overflowing beauty. Their movements were undulating, like the undulations of fire, yet with sudden unexpected upward leaps as when fire is partnered abruptly by a cantering wind. For the women were fire, and the men were wind. The imitative dance was in full swing. The marvelous wind and fire ritual unrolled its old world magic. It was awe-inspiring, certainly. But for Hendricks, as he watched, the terror of big conflagrations was wholly absent. Rather, he felt the sense of deep security that rhythmic movement causes. Bathed in a sea of elemental power, he burned to share the pagan splendor and the rush of primitive delight. It seemed he had a cosmic body in which new centers stirred to life, linking him on to this source of natural forces. Through these centers he drew the chaotic energy into nerves and blood and muscle into the very substance of his thought, indeed transmuting them into the magic of the will. Abundant and inexhaustible vigor filled the air, pouring freely into whatever empty receptacle lay at hand. Sheets of flame, wholly separate fragments of it, tore at the edges, raced loudly, hungrily, flapping on vehement gusts of wind, curved as they flew, leaped, twisted, flashed, and vanished. And the figures closely copied them, the women tossed their bodies aloft, then dipped suddenly to the earth, invisible, till the rushing men urged them into view again with the wild, impetuous swing, so that the entire line stretched and contracted like an immense, elastic band of life, now knotted, now dissolved. Yet while of raging and terrific beauty, there was never that mad abandon which is disorder, but rather a kind of sacred natural revel that prohibited mere license. There was even a singular austerity in it that betrayed a definite ritual, and not mere reckless pageantry. No walls could possibly have contained it. In cathedral, temple, or measured space, however grand, it could only have seemed exaggerated and apostate. Here beneath the open sky it was beautiful and true. For overhead the stars burned clear and steady, the constellations watching it from their immovable towers a representation of their own leisured and hierarchic dance in swifter miniature. And indeed this relationship it bore to a universal rhythm was the key, it seemed, to its deep significance. For the close imitation of natural movements 
seduced the colossal powers of fire and wind to swell human emotions till they became mold and vessel for this elemental manifestation in men and women. Golden yellow in the blaze, the limbs of the women flashed and passed, their hair flew dark a moment across gleaming breasts, and their waving arms tossed in ever-shifting patterns through the driving smoke. The fires boiled and roared, scattering torrents of showering sparks like stars, and amid it all, the slim white shoulders of the boy, his clothes torn from him, his eyes ablaze, and his lips opened to the singing as though he had known it always, drove to and fro on the crest of the ritual like some flying figure of wind and fire incarnate. All of which instantaneously, yet in sequence, Hendrix witnessed, painted upon the wild night sky. A volcanic energy poured through him, too. He knew a golden enthusiasm of immeasurable strength, of unconquerable hope, of irresistible delight. Wind set his feet to dancing, and fire swept across his face without a trace of burning. Nature was part of him. He had stepped inside. No obstacle existed that could withstand for a single second the torrential energy that fired his heart and blood. There was lightning in his veins. He could sweep aside life's difficult barriers with the ease of a tornado, and shake the rubbish of doubt and care from the years with earthquake shocks. Empires he could mold and play with nations, drive men and women before him like a flock of sheep, shatter convention, and dislocate the machinery time had foisted upon natural energies. He knew in himself the omnipotence of the lesser elemental deities. Yet, as sympathetic observer, he can but have felt a tithe of what Lord Ernie felt. "'We are the whirlwind and we are the fire!' he cried aloud with the rushing worshippers. "'We are unconquerable and immense. We destroy the lukewarm and absorb the weak, for we can make evil into good by bending it all one way!' The roar swept thunderingly past him, catching at his voice and body. He felt himself snatched forward by the wind. The fire licked sweetly at him. It was the final abandonment. He plunged recklessly towards the surge of dancers. Chapter 10 What stopped him he did not know. Some hard and steely thing pricked sharply into him. An opposing power, fierce as a sword, stabbed at his heart. And he heard a little sound quite close beside him, a sound that pierced the babble, reaching his consciousness as from far away. Keep still. Cling tight to this old rock. Hold yourself in or else they'll have you too. It was as if some insect scratched within his ear. His arm, that same instant, was violently seized. He came down with a crash. He had been half in the air. He had been dancing. Turn your eyes away, away. Take hold of this big tree. The voice cried furiously, but with a petty human passion in it that marred the world. There was an intolerable revulsion in him as he heard it. He felt himself dragged forcibly backwards. He lost his balance, stumbling among loose stones. Loose me! Let me go! He shouted, struggling like a wild animal, yet vainly against the inflexible grip that held him. I am one with the fire that lights but does not burn. I am the wind that blows the worlds along. Damnation take you, let me free! Confusion caught him, smothering speech and blinding sight. He fell backwards away from the heat and wind. He was furious, but furious with he knew not whom or what. The interference had destroyed the rhythm, broken it into fragments. Violent impulses clashed through him without the will to choose or guide them, for power had deserted him and flowed elsewhere. He stood no longer in the stream of energy. He was emptied. And at first he could not tell whether his instinct was to return himself, to rescue his precious boy, or to crush the interfering object out of existence with what was left to him of raging anger. He turned, stood up, and flung the pasture aside with violence. He raised his feet to stamp and kill, when a phrase with meaning darted suddenly across his wild confusion and recalled him to some fragment of truer responsibility in life. "'There'll be only violence in him! Reckless violence instead of strength! Destructive! Save him before it is too late!' "'It is too late!' He roared in answer. What devil hinders me? But his roar was feeble, and his ironed boots refused the stamping. Power slipped wholly out of him. 
the rhythm poured past instead of through him. Interference had destroyed the circuit. More glimmerings of responsibility came back. He stooped like a drunken man and helped the other to his feet. The rapidity of the change was curious, proving that the spell had been put upon him from without. It was not, as with the boy, mere development of pre-existing tendencies. Help me, he implored suddenly instead. Help me. There has been madness in me. For God's sake, help me to get him out. It seemed the face of the old Marquess, stern and terrible, broke an instant through the smoky air, black with reproach and anger. And with a violent effort of the will, Hendricks turned round to face the elemental orgy, bent on rescue. But this time the heat was intolerable and drove him back. The hair, hitherto untouched, now singed upon his head. Fire licked his very breath away. He bent double, covering his face with arms and cloak. Pray, shouted Lezan, dropping to his knees. It is the only way. My God is higher than this. Pray, pray. And automatically Hendricks fell upon his knees beside him. Though to pray he knew not how. For no real faith was in him as in the other, and his eye was far from single. The fast-fading grandeur of what he had experienced still left its pagan tumult in his blood. The pretense of prayer could only have been blasphemy. He watched instead, letting the other invoke his mighty deity alone, that deity he had served unflinchingly all his life with faith and fasting, and with belief beyond assault. It was an impressive picture, fraught with passionate drama. On his knees behind a sheltering boulder, a blackened pine tree tossing scorched branches above his head, this righteous man prayed to his god, sure of his triumphant answer, Hendricks watched with an admiration that made him realize his own insignificance. The eyes were closed, the leonine big head set firm upon the diminutive body, the face now lit by flame, now veiled by smoke. The strong hands clasped together and upraised. He envied him. He recognized, too, that the elements themselves, with all their chaos of might and terror, were after all but servants of the vastness which dips the butterflies in color and puts down upon the breasts of little robins. And because the pasteur's life had been always prayer and action, his little human will invoked the will of greatness, merged with it, used it, and directed it steadily against the commotion of these unleashed elements. Certain of himself and of his god, the pasteur never doubted. His prayer set instantly in action those forces which balance suns and keep the stars afloat. Thus trembling with terror that made him wholly ineffective, Hendricks watched, and, as he watched, became aware of the amazing change. For it seemed as if a stream of power, steady and in opposition to the tumult, now poured audaciously against the elemental rhythm, altering its direction, modifying gradually its stupendous impetus. There were pauses in the huge vibrations. They wavered, broke, and fled, they knew confusion, as when the prow of a steel-nosed vessel drives against the tide. The tide is vaster, but the steel is... different. The whole sky shivered as this new entering force, so small, so soft, yet of such incalculable energy, began at once its overmastering effect. Signs of violence or rout or of anything disordered had no part in it. Excess before it slipped into willing harness. There was light that sponged away all glare as when morning sunshine cleans a forest of its shadows. Some little whispering power sang marvelously as of old across the desolate big mountains. Peace, be still. Turning the monstrous turbulence into obedient sweetness. And upon his face and hands, Hendricks felt faint, delicate touches of some refreshing softness that he could not understand. Yet not instantly was this harmony restored, at first there was the stress of vehement opposition. The night of wind and fire drove roaring through the sky. There were bursts of triumphant tumult, but convulsion in them and no true steadiness as before. The human figures hitherto had danced with that fluid appearance which belongs to fire. And with that instantaneous rush which is of wind, the men increasing the women, and the women answering with joy, limbs and faces had melted into each other till the circular ritual looked like a glowing wheel of flame rotating audibly. But slowly now the speed of the wheel decreased. The single utterance was marred by the crying of many voices, all at different pitch, discordant, inharmonious, 
dismayed. The fires somehow dwindled. There came pauses in the wind, and Hendrix became aware of a curious hissing noise as more and more of these odd soft touches found his face and hands. Here and there, he saw, a figure stumbled, fell, then gathered itself clumsily together again with a frightened shout, breaking violently out of the circle. More and more of these figures blundered and dropped out, and although they returned again so that the dance apparently increased, these were but moments in the final violence of the dispersing hurricane. The rejected ones dashed back wildly into the wrong places. Men and women no longer stood alternate, but in groups together, falsely related. The entire movement was dislocated. The ceremony grew rapidly incoherent, meaning forsook it. The composite instrument that had transmuted the elemental forces into human emotional storage was imperfect, broken, out of tune. The disarray turned rout. And then it was, while Lezin continued without ceasing his burning and successful prayer, that his companion, conscious of returning harmony, rose to his feet, aware suddenly that he could also help. A portion of the powers he had absorbed still worked in him, but in a new direction. He felt confident and unafraid. He did not stumble. With unerring tread he advanced towards the lessening fires, feeling as he did so the cold soft touches multiply with a rush upon his skin. From all sides they came by hundreds like messengers of help. "'Ernest!' he cried aloud, and his voice, though little raised, carried resonantly above the dying turmoil. "'Ernest! Come back to us! Your father calls you!' And from threescore faces hurrying in confusion through the smoke, one paused and turned. It stood apart, hovering as though in air, while the mob of disordered figures rushed in a body along the ridge plunging like frightened cattle below the farther edge, then vanishing into thick darkness. They left behind them this one solitary face. A final dying flame licked out at it. A rush of smoke drove past to hide it. There was a high, wild scream, and the figure shot forward with a headlong leap, and fell with a crash at Hendrick's feet. Lord Ernie, blackened by smoke and scorched by fire, lay safe outside the danger zone. And Hendrix knelt beside him. Remorse and shame made him powerless to do more as he pulled the torn clothing over the neck and chest and heard his own heart begging for forgiveness. He realized his own weakness and faithlessness. A great temptation had found him wanting. It was owing to Lezan that the rescue was complete. The pasteur was instantly by his side. Saved as by water, he cried as he folded his cloak about the prostrate body and then raised the head and shoulders. Saved by his ministers of rain, for his miracles are love and work throughout natural laws. He made a sign to Hendrix. Carrying the boy between them, they scrambled down the slope into the shelter of the trees below. The cold, soft touches were then explained. The Joran had dropped as suddenly as it rose, and the torrential rain that invariably follows now poured in rivers from the sky. Water, drenching the fires and patting the savage wind, had stopped the dancers midway in their frenzied ritual. It was the element they dreaded, for it was hostile. Rain soused the mountain ridge, extinguishing the last embers of the numerous fires. It rushed in rivulets between their feet. The heated earth gave out a hissing steam, and the only sound in the spaces where wind and fire had boomed and thundered a little while before was now the splash of water and the drip of quenching drops. In the cover of the sheltering trees, the body stirred, lifted its head, and sat up slowly. The eyes opened. "'I'm cold. I'm frightened,' whispered a shivering voice. "'Where am I?' Only the pelt and thud of the rain sounded behind the quavering words. "'Where are the others? Have I been away? Hendrix, M Mr. Hendrix, is that you?' He stared about him, his face now a mere luminous disk in the thick darkness. No breath of wind was loose. They spoke to him till he answered with assurance, groping to find their hands with his own, his words confused and strange with hidden meaning for a time. "'I'm all right now,' he kept repeating. "'I know exactly. It was one of my big dreams. I suppose I fell asleep, and the rain woke me. Great heavens, what a night to be out!' And then he clambered vigorously to his feet with a sudden movement of great energy again, saying that hunger was in him and he must eat. There was no complaint of heat or cold, of burning or of bruises. The boy recovered marvelously. 
In ten minutes, breaking away from all support, he led as they descended through the dripping forest in the gloom and chill of very early morning. It was the others who called to him for guidance in the tangled woods. Lord Ernie was in the lead. Throughout the difficult woods he was ever in front and singing. Fire that lights but does not burn, and wind that blows the heart to flame. They both are in me now, forever and ever. Oh, praise the Lord of fire and the Lord of wind. And this voice, now near, now distant, sounding through the dripping forest on their homeward journey, was an experience weird and unforgettable for those other two. Les Ans, it seemed, had one sentence only which he kept repeating to himself. Heaven grant he may direct it all for good, for they have filled him to the brim, and he has become an instrument of power. But Hendricks, though he understood the risk, felt only confidence. Lord Ernie's regeneration had begun. Soaked and bedraggled, all three, they reached the village about two o'clock. The boy, utterly unmanageable, said an emphatic no to spirits, soup, or medical appliances. His skin, indeed, showed no signs of burning, nor was there the smallest symptom of cold or fever in him. I'm a perfect furnace, he laughed. I feel health and strength personified. And the brightness of his eyes, his radiant color, the vigor of his voice and manner, both in some way astonishing, made all pretense of assistance unnecessary and absurd. It's like a new birth, he cried to Hendricks, as he almost cantered beside him down the road to their house. And by Jove, I'll wake him up at home and make the world go round. I know a hundred schemes. I tell you, sir, I'm simply bursting. For the first time, I'm alive. And an hour later, when the tutor peeped in upon him, the boy was calmly sleeping. The candlelight, shaded carefully with one hand, fell upon the face. There were new lines and new expression in it. Will and purpose showed in the stern set of the lips and jaw. It was the face of a man, and of a man one would not lightly trifle with. Purpose, will, and power were established on their thrones. To such a man the entire world might one day bow the head. If only it will last, thought Hendricks, as shaken, bewildered, and more than a little awed, he tiptoed out of the room again and went to bed. But through his dreams, sheeted in flame and veiled in angry smoke, the face of the old Marquess glowered upon him from a heavy sky above ancestral towers. Chapter 11 from the obituary notices of the Ninth Marquess of Oakham, the following selections have their interest. He succeeded to his father, then in the cabinet as Minister for Foreign Affairs at the age of twenty-one. His career was brief but singular, the early magnificence of the younger Pitt offering a standard of comparison, though by no means a parallel, to a short record of astonishing achievement. His effect upon the world, first as Chief of the Government Labor Department and subsequently as Home Secretary and Minister of War, is described as shattering, even cataclysmic. His public life lasted five years. He died at the age of twenty-nine. His personality was revolutionary and overwhelming. For, judging by these extracts, he was a Napoleonic figure whose personal influence combined the impetus of Mirabeau and the dominance of Alexander. His authority held an incalculable element, precisely described as uncanny. His spirit was puissant, elemental, his activity irresistible. Yet according to another journal, he was properly speaking, neither intellectual, astute, nor diplomatic, and possessed as little subtlety as might be expected of a minor whose psychology was called upon to explain the Trinity. In no sense was he statesman, and even less strategist. Yet his name swept Europe, changed the map of the nearer East, its mere whisper among the chancelleries, convulsing men's councils with its influence almost menacing. His enthusiasm appears to have been amazing. Some stupendous and untiring energy drove through him, paralyzing attack and rendering the bitterest and most skillful opposition nugatory. His hand was imperious, upsetting with a touch, the chessboard set by the most able statecraft, and his voice was heard with a kind of reverence in every capital. The brevity of his astonishing career called for universal comment, as did the hypnotizing effect of his singular ascendancy. In five short years of power he achieved his sway. He rushed upon the world, he shook it, he retired, as one journal picturesquely phrased it. The manner of his ending, moreover, a stroke of lightning, seemed in keeping with his life. There was neither lingering, delay, nor warning. Of distinguished stock, noble, yet ordinary enough in all but name, his power is unexplained by heredity. His family furnished no approach to greatness, 
as history supplied no parallel to his dynamic intensity. Nor, we are informed, among his near of kin does any inherit his volcanic energy. The world, however, was apparently well relieved of his tumultuous presence, for his influence was generally surveyed as destructive rather than constructive. He was unmarried, and the title went to a nephew. The cheaper journals abounded, of course, in details of his personal and private life that were freely copied into the foreign press, and supply curious material for the student of human nature and the psychologist. The amazing revelations, no doubt, were picturesquely exaggerated, yet the substratum of truth in them all was generally admitted. No contradictions at any rate appeared. They read like the story of some primitive, wild giant let loose upon the world. Primitive, because his specific brain power was admittedly of no high order, wild because he was in favor of fierce, spontaneous action, and his mere presence on occasions could stir a nation, not alone a crowd, to vehement, terrific methods. His energy seemed inexhaustible, his fire inextinguishable. Legends were rife, even before he died among the peasantry of his Scotch estates, that he was in league with the devil. His habit of keeping enormous fires in his private rooms, fires that burned day and night from January to December, and in open hearths widened to thrice their natural size, stimulated the growth of this particular myth among those of his personal environment. All manner of stories raged, but it was his strange custom out of doors that provided the diabolical suggestion, for, behind a specially walled-in space on an open ridge, denuded of pines in a distant part of the estate, a series of gigantic heaps of wood, all ready to ignite, were, it was said, kept in a state of constant preparedness. And on stormy nights, especially when winds were high, and invariably at the period of the equinoctial tempests, his lordship would himself light these tremendous bonfires, and spend the nocturnal hours in their blazing presence, communing, the stories variously relate, with the witches at their sabbath, or with hordes of fire spirits who emerge from the bottomless pit in order to feed his soul with their unquenchable supplies. From these nightly orgies, it seems clear at any rate, he returned at dawn with a splendor of energy that no one could resist, and with a mien whose grandeur invited worship rather than inspired alarm. His biography, it was further stated, would be written by Sir John Hendricks, who began life as private secretary to his father, the eighth Marquess, but whose rapid rise to position was due to his intimate association as trusted friend and adviser to the subject of these obituary notices. The biography, however, had not appeared within five years of Lord Oakham's sudden death, and curiosity is only further stimulated by the suggested whisper that it never will, and never can, appear. End of section three. Section four of Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. The Sacrifice. One. Limison was a religious man, though of what depth and quality were unknown, since no trial of ultimate severity had yet tested him. An adherent of no particular creed, he yet had his gods and his self-discipline was probably more rigorous than his friends conjectured. He was so reserved, few guessed perhaps the desires conquered, the passions regulated, the inner tendencies trained and schooled, not by denying their expression, but by transmuting them alchemically into nobler channels. He had in him the makings of an enthusiastic devotee, and might have become such, but for two limitations that prevented. He loved his wealth— laboring to increase it to the neglect of other interests. And secondly, instead of following up one steady line of search, he scattered himself upon many picturesque theories, like an actor who wants to play all parts rather than concentrate on one. And the more picturesque the part, the more he was attracted. Thus, though he did his duty unshrinkingly and with a touch of love, he accused himself sometimes of merely gratifying a sensuous taste and spiritual sensations. There was this unbalance in him that argued want of depth. As for his gods, in the end he discovered their reality by first doubting, then denying their existence. It was this denial and doubt that restored them to their thrones, converting his dilettante skirmishes into genuine deep belief, 
and the proof came to him one summer in early June when he was making ready to leave town for his annual month among the mountains. With Limassan, mountains, in some inexplicable sense, were a passion almost, and climbing so deep a pleasure that the ordinary scrambler hardly understood it. Grave as a kind of worship it was to him, the preparations for an ascent, the ascent itself in particular, involved a concentration that seemed symbolical as of a ritual. He not only loved the heights, the massive grandeur, the splendor of vast proportions blocked in space, but loved them with a respect that held a touch of awe. The emotion mountains stirred in him, one might say, was of that profound, incalculable kind that held kinship with his religious feelings, half-realized though these were. His gods had their invisible thrones somewhere among the grim, forbidding heights. He prepared himself for this annual mountaineering with the same earnestness that a holy man might approach a solemn festival of his church. And the impetus of his mind was running with big momentum in this direction, when there fell upon him, almost on the eve of starting a swift series of disasters that shook his being to its last foundations, and left him stunned among the ruins. To describe these is unnecessary. People said, one thing after another like that, what appalling luck, poor wretch then wondered, with the curiosity of children, how in the world he would take it. Due to no apparent fault of his own, these disasters were so sudden that life seemed in a moment shattered, and his interest in existence almost ceased. People shook their heads and thought of the emergency exit, but Limason was too vital a man to dream of annihilation. Upon him it had a different effect. He turned and questioned what he called his gods. They did not answer or explain. For the first time in his life he doubted. A hair's breadth beyond lay definite denial. The ruin in which he sat, however, was not material. No man of his age, possessed of courage and a working scheme of life, would permit disaster of a material order to overwhelm him. It was collapse of a mental, spiritual kind, an assault upon the roots of character and temperament. Moral duties lay suddenly upon him, threatened to crush. His personal existence was assailed, and apparently must end. He must spend the remainder of his life caring for others who were nothing to him. No outlet showed, no way of escape. So diabolically complete was the combination of events that rushed his inner trenches. His faith was shaken. A man can but endure so much and remain human. For him the saturation point seemed reached. He experienced the spiritual equivalent of that physical numbness which supervenes when pain has touched the limit of endurance. He laughed, grew callous, then mocked his silent gods. It is said that upon this state of blank negation there follows sometimes a condition of lucidity which mirrors with crystal clearness the forces driving behind life at a given moment. A kind of clairvoyance that brings explanation and therefore peace. Limason looked for this in vain. There was the doubt that questioned. There was the sneer that mocked the silence into which his questions fell. But there was neither answer nor explanation, and certainly not peace. There was no relief. In this tumult of revolt he did none of the things his friends suggested or expected. He merely followed the line of least resistance. He yielded to the impetus that was upon him when the catastrophe came. To their indignant amazement he went out to his mountains. All marveled that at such a time he could adopt so trivial a line of action. Neglecting duties that seemed paramount, they disapproved. Yet in reality he was taking no definite action at all, but merely drifting with the momentum that had been acquired just before. He was bewildered with so much pain, confused with suffering, stunned with the crash that flung him helpless amid undeserved calamity. He turned to the mountains as a child to its mother, instinctively. Mountains had never failed to bring him consolation, comfort, peace. The grandeur restored proportion whenever disorder threatened life. No calculation, properly speaking, was in his move at all, but a blind desire for a violent physical reaction such as climbing brings. And the instinct was more wholesome than he knew. In the high upland valley among lonely peaks whither Limason then went, he found in some measure the proportion he had lost, he studiously avoided thinking. He lived in his muscles recklessly. The region with its little inn was familiar to him. Peak after peak he attacked, sometimes with, but more often without, a guide. 
until his reputation as a sane climber, a laureled member of all the foreign alpine clubs, was seriously in danger. That he overdid it physically is beyond question, but that the mountains breathed into him some portion of their enormous calm and deep endurance is also true. His gods, meanwhile, he neglected utterly for the first time in his life. If he thought of them at all, it was as tinsel figures imagination had created. Figures upon a stage that merely decorated life for those whom pretty pictures pleased. Only, he had left the theater and their make-believe no longer hypnotized his mind. He realized their impotence and disowned them. This attitude, however, was subconscious. He lent to it no substance, either of thought or speech. He ignored rather than challenged their existence. And it was somewhat in this frame of mind, thinking little, feeling even less, that he came out into the hotel vestibule after dinner one evening and took mechanically the bundle of letters the porter handed to him. They had no possible interest for him. In a corner where the big steam heater mitigated the chilliness of the hall, he idly sorted them. The score or so of other guests, chiefly expert climbing men, were trailing out in twos and threes from the dining room, but he felt as little interest in them as in his letters. No conversation could alter facts. No written phrases change his circumstances. At random, then, he opened a business letter with a typewritten address. It would probably be impersonal, less of a mockery, therefore, than the others with their tiresome sham condolences. And, in a sense, it was impersonal. Sympathy from a solicitor's office is mere formula, a few extra ticks upon the universal keyboard of a Remington. But as he read it, Lemison made a discovery that startled him into acute and bitter sensation. He had imagined the limit of bearable suffering and disaster already reached. Now, in a few dozen words, his error was proved convincingly. The fresh blow was dislocating. This culminating news of additional catastrophe disclosed within him entirely new reaches of pain, of biting, resentful fury. Lemison experienced a momentary stopping of the heart as he took it in, a dizziness, a violent sensation of revolt whose impotence induced almost physical nausea. He felt like death. Must I suffer all things? flashed through his arrested intelligence in letters of fire. There was a sullen rage in him, a dazed bewilderment, but no positive suffering as yet. His emotion was too sickening to include the smaller pains of disappointment. It was primitive, blind anger that he knew. He read the letter calmly, even to the neat paragraph of machine-made sympathy at the last, then placed it in his inner pocket. No outward sign of disturbance was upon him. His breath came slowly. He reached over to the table for a match, holding it at arm's length lest the sulfur fumes should sting his nostrils. And in that moment he made his second discovery. The fact that further suffering was still possible included also the fact that some touch of resignation had been left in him, and therefore some vestige of belief as well. Now, as he felt the crackling sheet of stiff paper in his pocket, watched the sulfur die, and saw the wood ignite, this remnant faded utterly away. Like the blackened end of a match, it shriveled and dropped off. It vanished. Savagely, yet with an external calmness that enabled him to light his pipe with untrembling hand, he addressed his futile deities. And once more in fiery letters there flashed across the darkness of his passionate thought, even this you demand of me, this cruel ultimate sacrifice. And he rejected them, bag and baggage, for they were a mockery and a lie. With contempt he repudiated them forever. The stage of doubt had passed. He denied his gods, yet with a smile upon his lips. For what were they, after all, but the puppets his religious fancy had imagined? They never had existed. Was it then merely the picturesque, sensational aspect of his devotional temperament that had created them? That side of his nature, in any case, was dead now, killed by a single devastating blow. The gods went with it. Surveying what remained of his life, it seemed to him like a city that an earthquake had reduced to ruins. The inhabitants think no worse thing could happen. Then comes the fire. Two lines of thought, it seems, then developed parallel in him, and simultaneously. For while underneath he stormed against this culminating blow, his upper mind dealt calmly with the project of a great expedition he would make at dawn. He had engaged no guide. 
As an experienced mountaineer, he knew the district well. His name was tolerably familiar, and in half an hour he could have settled all details, and retired to bed with instructions to be called at two. But instead he sat there waiting, unable to stir, a human volcano that any moment might break forth into violence. He smoked his pipe as quietly as though nothing had happened, while through the blazing depths of him ran ever this one self-repeating statement, "'Even this you demand of me, this cruel ultimate sacrifice.' His self-control, dynamically estimated, just then must have been very great, and thus repressed, the store of potential energy accumulated enormously. With thought concentrated largely upon this final blow, Limason had not noticed the people who streamed out of the Salle à Manger and scattered themselves in groups about the hall. Some individual, now and again, approached his chair with the idea of conversation, then, seeing his absorption, turned away. Even when a climber whom he slightly knew reached across him with a word of apology for the matches, Limason made no response, for he did not see him. He noticed nothing. In particular, he did not notice two men who, from an opposite corner, had for some time been observing him. He now looked up, by chance, and was vaguely aware that they were discussing him. He met their eyes across the hall and started. For at first he thought he knew them. Possibly he had seen them about in the hotel. They seemed familiar. Yet he certainly had never spoken with them. Aware of his mistake, he turned his glance elsewhere, though still vividly conscious of their attention. One was a clergyman or a priest. His face wore an air of gravity touched by sadness, a sternness about the lips counteracted by a kindling beauty in the eyes that betrayed enthusiasm nobly regulated. There was a suggestion of stateliness in the man that made the impression very sharp. His clothing emphasized it. He wore a dark tweed suit that was strict in its simplicity. There was an austerity in him somewhere. His companion, perhaps by contrast, seemed inconsiderable in his conventional evening dress. A good deal younger than his friend, his hair, always a telltale detail, was a trifle long. The thin fingers that flourished a cigarette wore rings. The face, though picturesque, was flippant, and his entire attitude conveyed a certain insignificance. Gesture, that faultless language which challenges counterfeit, betrayed unbalance somewhere. The impression he produced, however, was shadowy compared to the sharpness of the other. Theatrical was the word in Limason's mind, as he turned his glance elsewhere. But as he looked away, he fidgeted. The interior darkness caused by the dreadful letter rose about him. It engulfed him. Dizziness came with it. Far away the blackness was fringed with light and through this light. Stepping with speed and carelessness as from gigantic distance, the two men, suddenly grown large, came at him. Limason, in self-protection, turned to meet them. Conversation he did not desire. Somehow he had expected this attack. Yet the instant they began to speak, it was the priest who opened fire. It was also natural and easy that he almost welcomed the diversion. A phrase by way of introduction, and he was speaking of the summits. Something in Limason's mind turned over. The man was a serious climber, one of his own species. The sufferer felt a certain relief as he heard the invitation and realized, though dully, the compliment involved. If you felt inclined to join us, if you would honor us with your company, the man was saying quietly, adding something then about your great experience and invaluable advice and judgment. Limason looked up, trying hard to concentrate and understand. The Tour de Neant? he repeated, mentioning the peak proposed. Rarely attempted, never conquered, and with an ominous record of disaster, it happened to be the very summit he had meant to attack himself next day. You have engaged guides? He knew the question foolish. No guide will try it, the priest answered, smiling, while his companion added with a flourish, <laughs> But we, we need no guide if you will come. You are unattached, I believe? You are alone? The priest inquired, moving a little in front of his friend as though to keep him in the background. Yes, replied Lemison. I am quite alone. He was listening attentively, but with only part of his mind. He realized the flattery of the invitation. Yet it was like flattery addressed to someone else. He felt himself so indifferent, so dead. These men wanted his skillful body, his experienced mind, and it was his body and mind that talked with them and finally agreed to go. Many a time expeditions had been planned in just this way. 
but tonight he felt there was a difference. Mind and body signed the agreement, but his soul, listening elsewhere and looking on, was silent. With his rejected gods it had left him, though hovering close still. It did not interfere. It did not warn. It even approved. It sang to him from great distance that this expedition cloaked another. He was bewildered by the clashing of his higher and his lower mind. At one in the morning, then, if that will suit you, the elder man concluded. I'll see to the provisions, exclaimed the younger enthusiastically, and I shall take my telephoto for the summit. The porters can come as far as the great tower. We're over six thousand feet here already, you see, so... And his voice died away in the distance as his companion led him off. Lemison saw him go with relief, but for the other man he would have declined the invitation. At heart he was indifferent enough. What decided him really was the coincidence that the Tour de Neon was the very peak he had intended to attack himself alone, and the curious feeling that this expedition cloaked another somehow. Almost that these men had a hidden motive. But he dismissed the idea. It was not worth thinking about. A moment later he followed them to bed. So careless was he of the affairs of the world, so dead to mundane interests, that he tore up his other letters and tossed them into a corner of the room, unread. 2. Once in his chilly bedroom he realized that his upper mind had permitted him to do a foolish thing. He had drifted like a schoolboy into an unwise situation. He had pledged himself to an expedition with two strangers, an expedition for which normally he would have chosen his companions with the utmost caution. Moreover, he was guide. They looked to him for safety, while yet it was they who had arranged and planned it. But who were these men with whom he proposed to run grave bodily risks? He knew them as little as they knew him. Whence came, he wondered, the curious idea that this climb was really planned by another, who was no one of them. The thought slipped idly across his mind. Going out by one door, it came back, however, quickly by another. He did not think about it more than to note its passage through the disorder that passed with him just then for thinking. Indeed, there was nothing in the whole world for which he cared a single brass farthing. As he undressed for bed, he said to himself, I shall be called at one, but why am I going with these two people on this wild plan? And who made the plan? It seemed to have settled itself. It came about so naturally and easily, so quickly. He probed no deeper. He didn't care. And for the first time he omitted the little ritual. Half prayer, half adoration. It had always been his custom to offer his deities upon retiring to rest. He no longer recognized them. How utterly broken his life was. How blank and terrible and lonely. He felt cold and piled his overcoats upon the bed, as though his mental isolation involved a physical effect as well. Switching off the light by the door, he was in the act of crossing the floor in the darkness when a sound beneath the window caught his ear. Outside there were voices talking. The roar of falling water made them indistinct, yet he was sure they were voices and that one of them he knew. He stopped still to listen. He heard his own name uttered. John Lemison. They ceased. He stood a moment shivering on the boards, then crawled into bed beneath the heavy clothing. But in the act of settling down, they began again. He raised himself again hurriedly to listen. What little wind there was passed in that moment down the valley, carrying off the roar of falling water. And into the moment's space of silence dropped fragments of definite sentences. They are close, you say, close down upon the world. It was the voice of the priest, surely. For days they have been passing, was the answer, a rough, deep tone that might have been a peasant's, and a kind of fear in it. For all my flocks are scattered. The signs are sure, you know them. Tumult, was the answer in much lower tones. There has been tumult in the mountains. There was a break then, as though the voices sank too low to be heard. Two broken fragments came next, end of a question, beginning of an answer. The opportunity of a lifetime. If he goes of his own free will, success is sure, for acceptance is. And the wind, returning, bore back the sound of the falling water, so that Lemison heard no more. An indefinable emotion stirred in him as he turned over to sleep. He stuffed his ears lest he should hear more. He was aware of a sinking of the heart that was inexplicable. What in the world were they talking about, these two? 
What was the meaning of these disjointed phrases? There lay behind them a grave significance almost solemn. That tumult in the mountains was somehow ominous, its suggestion terrible and mighty. He felt disturbed, uncomfortable, the first emotion that had stirred in him for days. The numbness melted before its faint awakening. Conscience was in it. He felt vague prickings, but it was deeper far than conscience. Somewhere out of sight, in a region life had as yet not plumbed, the words sank down and vibrated like pedal notes. They rumbled away into the night of undecipherable things, and though explanation failed him, he felt they had reference somehow to the morrow's expedition. How, what, wherefore, he knew not. His name had been spoken, then these curious sentences. That was all. Yet, tomorrow's expedition, what was it but an expedition of impersonal kind, not even planned by himself, merely his own plan taken and altered by others, made over. His personal business, his personal life, were not really in it at all. The thought startled him a moment. He had no personal life. Struggling with sleep, his brain played the endless game of disentanglement without winning a single point, while the undermind in him looked on and smiled, because it knew. Then suddenly a great peace fell over him. Exhaustion brought it, perhaps. He fell asleep, and next moment it seemed he was aware of a thundering at the door, and an unwelcome growling voice. Seest Baldinder, Herr Ofsted. Rising at such an hour, unless the heart be in it, is a sordid and depressing business. Lemison dressed without enthusiasm, conscious that thought and feeling were exactly where he had left them on going to sleep. The same confusion and bewilderment were in him, also the same deep, solemn emotion stirred by the whispering voices. Only long habit enabled him to attend to detail, and ensured that nothing was forgotten. He felt heavy and oppressed, a kind of anxiety about him. The routine of preparation he followed gravely, utterly untouched by the customary joy. It was mechanical, yet through it ran the old familiar sense of ritual. Due to the practice of so many years, that cleansing of mind and body for a big ascent, like initiatory rites that once had been as important to him as those of some priest who approached the worship of his deity in the temples of ancient time. He performed the ceremony with the same care as though no ghost of vanished faith still watched him, beckoning from the air as formerly. His knapsack carefully packed, he took his ice axe from beside the bed, turned out the light, and went down the creaking wooden stairs in stockinged feet, lest his heavy boots should waken the other sleepers. And in his head still rang the phrase he had fallen asleep on, as though just uttered. The signs are sure. For days they have been passing, close down upon the world. The flocks are scattered. There has been tumult. Tumult in the mountains. The other fragments he had forgotten. But who were they? And why did the word bring a chill of awe into his blood? And as the words rolled through him, Lemison felt tumult in his thoughts and feelings, too. There had been tumult in his life, and all his joys were scattered, joys that hitherto had fed his days. The signs were sure. Something was close down upon his little world, passing, sweeping. He felt a touch of terror. Outside in the fresh darkness of very early morning, the strangers stood waiting for him. Rather, they seemed to arrive in the same instant as himself, equally punctual. The clock in the church tower sounded one. They exchanged low greetings, remarked that the weather promised to hold good, and started off in single file over soaking meadows towards the first belt of forest. The porter, mere peasant, unfamiliar of face and not connected with the hotel, led the way with a hurricane lantern. The air was marvelously sweet and fragrant. In the sky overhead the stars shone in their thousands. Only the noise of falling water from the heights and the regular thud of their heavy boots broke the stillness and black against the sky towered the enormous pyramid of the Tour du Néant they meant to conquer. Perhaps the most delightful portion of a big ascent is the beginning in the scented darkness, while the thrill of possible conquest lies still far off. The hours stretched themselves queerly. Last night's sunset might be days ago. Sunrise and the brilliance coming seemed in another week. Part of dim futurity, like children's holidays, 
It is difficult to realize that this biting coal before the dawn and the blazing heat to come both belong to the same today. There were no sounds as they toiled slowly up the zigzag path through the first fifteen hundred of pine woods. No one spoke. The clink of nails and ice axe points against the stones was all they heard, for the roar of water was felt rather than heard. It beat against the ears and the skin of the whole body at once. The deeper notes were below them now in the sleeping valley. The shriller ones sounded far above, where streams just born out of ponderous snowbeds tinkled sharply. The change came delicately. The stars turned a shade less brilliant, a softness in them as of human eyes that say farewell. Between the highest branches the sky grew visible. A sighing air smoothed all their crests one way. Moss, earth, and open spaces brought keen perfumes, and the little human procession, leaving the forest, stepped out into the vastness of the world above the tree line. They paused while the porter stooped to put his lantern out, and the eastern sky was color. The peaks and crags rushed closer. Was it the dawn? Lemison turned his eyes from the height of sky, where the summits pierced a path for the coming day. To the faces of his companions, pale and wan in the early twilight. How small, how insignificant they seemed amid this hungry emptiness of desolation. The stupendous cliffs fled past them, led by headstrong peaks crowned with eternal snows. Thin lines of cloud trailing halfway up precipice and ridge seemed like the swish of movement, as though he caught the earth turning as she raced through space. The four of them, timid riders on the gigantic saddle, clung for their lives against her titan ribs, while currents of some majestic life swept up at them from every side. He drew deep draughts of the rarefied air into his lungs. It was very cold. Avoiding the pallid, insignificant faces of his companions, he pretended interest in the porter's operations. He stared fixedly on the ground. It seemed twenty minutes before the flame was extinguished, and the lantern fastened to the pack behind. This dawn was like any he had seen before. For in reality, all the while, Lemison was trying to bring order out of the extraordinary thoughts and feelings that had possessed him during the slow forest ascent, and the task was not crowned with much success. The plan, made by others, had taken charge of him, he felt, and he had thrown the reins of personal will and interest loosely upon its steady gait. He had abandoned himself carelessly to what might come, knowing that he was leader of the expedition, he yet had suffered the porter to go first taking his own place, as it was appointed to him, behind the younger man, but before the priest. In this order they had plodded, as only experienced climbers plod, for hours without a rest, until halfway up a change had taken place. He had wished it, and instantly it was effected. The priest moved past him, while his companion dropped to the rear. The companion, who forever stumbled in his speed, whereas the older man climbed surely, confidently, and thereafter Lemison walked more easily, as though the relative positions of the three were of importance somehow. The steep ascent of smothering darkness through the woods became less arduous. He was glad to have the younger man behind him, for the impression had strengthened as they climbed in silence that this ascent pertained to some significant ceremony, and the idea had grown insistently, almost stealthily upon him. The movements of himself and his companions, especially the positions each occupied relative to the other, established some kind of intimacy that resembled speech, suggesting even question and answer. And the entire performance, while occupying hours by his watch, it seemed to him more than once had been in reality briefer than the flash of a passing thought, so that he saw it within himself, pictorially. He thought of a picture working in colors upon a strip of elastic. Someone pulled the strip, and the picture stretched. Or someone released it again, and the picture flew back, reduced to a mere stationary speck, all happened in a single speck of time. And the little change of position, apparently so trivial, gave point to this singular notion working in his undermind, that this ascent was a ritual and a ceremony as in older days, its significant approaching revelation, however, for the first time, now. Without language this stole over him. No words could quite describe it, for it came to him that these three formed a unit, himself being in some fashion yet the acknowledged principle the leader. The laboring porter had no place in it, for this first toiling through the darkness was a preparation, and when the actual climb began he would disappear, 
while Lemison himself went first. This idea that they took part together in a ceremony established itself firmly in him, with the added wonder that, though so often done, he performed it now for the first time with full comprehension, knowledge, truth. Empty of personal desire, indifferent to an ascent that formerly would have thrilled his heart with ambition and delight, he understood that climbing had ever been a ritual for his soul and of his soul, and that power must result from its sincere accomplishment. It was a symbolical ascent. In words this did not come to him. He felt it, never criticizing. That is, he neither rejected nor accepted. It stole most sweetly, grandly over him. It floated into him while he climbed, yet so convincingly that he had felt his relative position must be changed. The younger man held too prominent a post, or at least a wrong one, in advance. Then, after the change, affected mysteriously as though all recognized it, this line of certainty increased, and there came upon him the big strange knowledge that all of life is a ceremony on a giant scale, and that by performing the movements accurately, with sincere fidelity, there may come knowledge. There was a gravity in him from that moment. This ran in his mind with certainty. Though his thought assumed no form of little phrases, his brain yet furnished detailed statements that clinched the marvelous thing with simile and incident which daily life might apprehend. That knowledge arises from action, that to do the thing invites the teaching and explains it. Action, moreover, is symbolical. A group of men, a family, an entire nation, engaged in those daily movements which are the working out of their destiny— perform a ceremony which is in direct relation somewhere to the pattern of greater happenings, which are the teachings of the gods. Let the body imitate, reproduce, in a bedroom, in a wood, anywhere, the movements of the stars and the meaning of those stars shall sink down into the heart. The movements constitute a script, a language. To mimic the gestures of a stranger is to understand his mood, his point of view. To establish a grave and solemn intimacy— Temples are everywhere, for the entire earth is a temple, and the body, house of royalty, is the biggest temple of them all. To ascertain the pattern its movements trace in daily life could be to determine the relation of that particular ceremony to the cosmos, and so learn power. The entire system of Pythagoras, he realized, could be taught without a single word, by movements, and in everyday life even the commonest act and vulgarest movement are part of some big ceremony. A message from the gods. Ceremony, in a word, is three-dimensional language, and action, therefore, is the language of the gods. The gods he had denied were speaking to him, passing with tumult close across his broken life. Their passage, it was, indeed, that had caused the breaking. In this cryptic, condensed fashion, the great fact came over him, that he and these other two, here and now, took part in some great ceremony of whose ultimate object as yet he was in ignorance. The impact with which it dropped upon his mind was tremendous. He realized it most fully when he stepped from the darkness of the forest and entered the expanse of glimmering early light. Up till this moment his mind was being prepared only, whereas now he knew. The innate desire to worship which all along had been his, the momentum his religious temperament had acquired during forty years, the yearning to have proof, in a word, that the gods he once acknowledged were really true, swept back upon him with that violent reaction which denial had roused. He wavered where he stood. Looking about him then, while the others rearranged burdens, the returning porter now discarded, he perceived the astonishing beauty of the time and place, feeling it soak into him as by the very pores of his skin. From all sides this beauty rushed upon him, some radiant, winged sense of wonder sped past him through the silent air. A thrill of ecstasy ran down every nerve. The hair of his head stood up. It was far from unfamiliar to him, the sight of the upper mountain world awakening from its sleep of the summer night. But never before had he stood shuddering thus at its exquisite cold glory, nor felt its significance as now, so mysteriously within himself. Some transcendent power that held sublimity was passing across this huge, desolate plateau, far more majestic than mere sunrise among mountains he had so often witnessed. There was movement. He understood why he had seen his companions insignificant. 
Again he shivered and looked about him, touched by a solemnity that held deep awe. Personal life indeed was wrecked, destroyed, but something greater was on the way. His fragile alliance with the spiritual world was strengthened. He realized his own past insolence. He became afraid. 3. The treeless plateau, littered with enormous boulders, stretched for miles to right and left, gray in the dusk of very early morning. Behind him dropped thick guardian pine woods into the sleeping valley that still detained the darkness of the night. Here and there lay patches of deep snow, gleaming faintly through thin rising mist, singing streams of icy water spread everywhere among the stones, soaking the coarse rough grass that was the only sign of vegetation. No life was visible, nothing stirred, nor anywhere was movement. But of the quiet trailing mist and of his own breath that drifted past his face like smoke. Yet through the splendid stillness there was movement, that sense of absolute movement which results in stillness. It was owing to the stillness that he became aware of it, so vast on its surface, or a great machinery turn with such vertiginous velocity that it appears steady to the deceived function of the eye. For it was not through the eye that this solemn movement made itself known, but rather through a massive sensation that owned his entire body as its organ. Within the league-long amphitheater of enormous peaks and precipices that enclosed the plateau, piling themselves upon the horizon, Lemison felt the outline of a ceremony extended. The pulses of its grandeur poured into him where he stood. Its vast design was knowable because they themselves had traced were even then tracing its earthly counterpart in little, and the awe in him increased. This light is false. We have an hour yet before the true dawn, he heard the younger man say lightly. The summits still are ghostly. Let us enjoy the sensation and see what we can make of it. And Lemison, looking up startled from his reverie, saw that the faraway heights and towers indeed were heavy with shadow. Faint still with the light of stars, it seemed to him they bowed their awful heads, and that their stupendous shoulders lowered. They drew together, shutting out the world. True, said his companion, and the upper snows still wear the spectral shine of night. But let us now move faster, for we travel very light. The sensations you propose will but delay and weaken us. He handed a share of the burdens to his companion and to Lemison. Slowly they all moved forward, and the mountains shut them in. And two things Lemison noted then, as he shouldered his heavier pack and led the way. First, that he suddenly knew their destination, though its purpose still lay hidden. And secondly, that the porters leaving before the ascent proper began, signified finally that the ordinary climbing was not their real objective. Also, the dawn was a lifting of inner veils from off his mind, rather than a brightening of the visible earth due to the nearing sun. Thick darkness indeed draped this enormous, lonely amphitheater where they moved. "'You lead us well,' said the priest a few feet behind him, as he picked his way unfalteringly among the boulders and streams. "'Strange that I do so,' replied Lemison in a low tone, "'for the way is new to me, and the darkness grows instead of lessening.' The language seemed hardly of his choosing. He spoke and walked as in a dream." Far in the rear, the voice of the younger man called plaintively after them. "'You go so fast! I can't keep up with you!' And again he stumbled and dropped his ice axe among the rocks. He seemed forever stooping to drink the icy water, or clambering off the trail to test the patches of snow as to quality and depth. "'You're missing all the excitement!' he cried repeatedly. "'There are a hundred pleasures and sensations, by the way!' They paused a moment for him to overtake them. He came up panting and exhausted, making remarks about the fading stars, the wind upon the heights, new routes he longed to try up dangerous colours, about everything, it seemed, except the work in hand. There was eagerness in him, the kind of excitement that saps energy and wastes the nervous force, threatening a probable collapse before the arduous object is attained. "'Keep to the thing in hand,' replied the priest sternly. "'We are not really going fast.' It is you who are scattering yourself to no purpose. It wears us all. We must husband our resources. And he pointed significantly to the pyramid of the Tour de Neon that gleamed above them at an incredible altitude. We are here to amuse ourselves. Life is a pleasure, a sensation, 
or it is nothing, grumbled his companion. But there was a gravity in the tone of the older man that discouraged argument and made resistance difficult. The other arranged his pack for the tenth time, twisting his axe through an ingenious scheme of straps and string, and fell silently into line behind his leaders. Lemison moved on again, and the darkness at last began to lift. Far overhead at first, the snowy summits shone with a hue less spectral. A delicate pink spread softly from the east. There was a freshening of the chilly wind. Then suddenly the highest peak that topped the others by a thousand feet of soaring rock stepped sharply into sight, half golden and half rose. At the same instant, the vast movement of the entire scene slowed down. There came one or two terrific gusts of wind in quick succession. A roar like an avalanche of falling stones boomed distantly, and Lemison stopped dead and held his breath. For something blocked the way before him, something he knew he could not pass. Gigantic and unformed, it seemed part of the architecture of the desolate waste about him, while yet it bulked there, enormous in the trembling dawn, as belonging neither to plain nor mountain. Suddenly it was there, where a moment before had been mere emptiness of air. Its massive outline shifted into visibility as though it had risen from the ground. He stood stock still. A cold that was not of this world turned him rigid in his tracks. A few yards behind him the priest had halted too. Farther in the rear they heard the stumbling tread of the younger man, and the faint calling of his voice, a feeble broken sound as of a man whom sudden fear distressed to helplessness. "'We're off the track, and I've lost my way,' the words came on still air. "'My axe is gone. Let us put on the rope. Hark, do you hear that roar?' and then a sound as though he came slowly groping on his hands and knees. "'You have exhausted yourself too soon,' the priest answered sternly. "'Stay where you are and rest, for we go no farther. This is the place we sought.' There was in his tone a kind of ultimate solemnity that for a moment turned Lemison's attention from the great obstacle that blocked his farther way. The darkness lifted veil by veil, not gradually, but by a series of leaps, as when someone inexpertly turns a wick. He perceived then that not a single grandeur loomed in front, but that others of similar kind, some huger than the first, stood all about him, forming an enclosing circle that hemmed him in. Then with a start he recovered himself. Equilibrium and common sense returned. The trick that sight had played upon him, assisted by the rarefied atmosphere of the heights and the witchery of dawn, was no uncommon one after all. The long straining of the eyes to pick the way in an uncertain light so easily deceives perspective. Delusion ever follows abrupt change of focus. These shadowy encircling forms were but the rampart of still, distant precipices, whose giant walls framed the tremendous amphitheater to the sky. Their closeness was a mere gesture of the dusk and distance. The shock of the discovery produced an instant's unsteadiness in him that brought bewilderment. He straightened up, raised his head, and looked about him. The cliffs, it seemed to him, shifted back instantly to their accustomed places. As though, after all, they had been close. There was a reeling among the topmost crags. They balanced fearfully, then stood still against a sky already faintly crimson. The roar he heard that might well have seemed the tumult of their hurrying speed was in reality but the wind of dawn that rushed against their ribs, beating the echoes out with angry wings, and the lines of trailing mist, streaking the air like proofs of rapid motion, merely coiled and floated in the empty spaces. He turned to the priest who had moved up beside him. "'How strange,' he said, "'is this beginning of new light. My sight went all astray for a passing moment. I thought the mountains stood right across my path, and when I looked up just now, it seemed they all ran back. His voice was small and lost in the great listening air. The man looked fixedly at him. He had removed his slouch hat, hot with the long ascent, and as he answered, a long thin shadow flitted across his features. A breath of darkness dropped about them. It was as though a mask were forming. The face that now was covered had been naked. He was so long in answering that Lemison heard his mind sharpening the sentence like a pencil. He spoke very slowly. They move, perhaps, even as their powers move. 
and their minutes are our years. Their passage ever is in tumult. There is disorder, then, among the affairs of men. There is confusion in their minds. There may be ruin and disaster, but out of the wreckage shall issue strong, fresh growth. For like a sea they pass. There was in his mien a grandeur that seemed borrowed marvelously from the mountains. His voice was grave and deep. He made no sign or gesture, and in his manner was a curious steadiness that breathed through the language a kind of sacred prophecy. Long thundering gusts of wind passed distantly across the precipices as he spoke. The same moment, expecting apparently no rejoinder to his strange utterance, he stooped and began to unpack his knapsack. The change from this sacerdotal language to this commonplace and practical detail was singularly bewildering. It's the time to rest, he added, and the time to eat. Let us prepare. And he drew out several small packets and laid them in a row upon the ground. Awe deepened over Lemison as he watched, and with it a great wonder, too, for the words seemed ominous, as though this man upon the floor of some vast temple said, Let us prepare a sacrifice. There flashed into him, out of depths that had hitherto concealed it, a lightning clue that hinted at explanation of the entire strange proceeding. Of the abrupt meeting with the strangers, the impulsive acceptance of their project for the great ascent, their grave behavior as though it were a ceremonial of immense design, his change of position, the bewildering tricks of sight, and the solemn language, finally, of the older man that corroborated what he himself had deemed at first illusion. In a flying second of time this all swept through him, and with it the sharp desire to turn aside, retreat, to run away. Noting the movement, or perhaps divining the emotion prompting it, the priest looked up quickly, in his tone was a coldness that seemed as though this scene of wintry desolation uttered words. You have come too far to think of turning back. It is not possible. You stand now at the gates of birth and death. All that might hinder, you have so bravely cast aside. Be brave now to the end. And, as Lemison heard the words, there dropped suddenly into him a new and awful insight into humanity a power that unerringly discovered the spiritual necessities of others, and therefore of himself. With a shock he realized that the younger man who had accompanied them with increasing difficulty as they climbed higher and higher was but a shadow of reality. Like the porter, he was but an encumbrance who impeded progress, and he turned his eyes to search the desolate landscape. "'You will not find him,' said his companion, "'for he is gone.' Never, unless you weakly call, shall you see him again, nor desire to hear his voice. And Lemison realized that in his heart he had all the while disapproved of the man, disliked him for his theatrical fondness of sensation and effect, more that he had even hated and despised him. Starvation might crawl upon him where he had fallen, and eat his life away before he would stir a finger to save him. It was with the older man he now had dreadful business in hand. I am glad, he answered, for in the end he must have proved my death, our death. And they drew closer round the little circle of food the priest had laid upon the rocky ground, an intimate understanding linking them together in a sympathy that completed Lemison's bewilderment. There was bread, he saw, and there was salt. There was also a little flask of deep red wine. In the center of the circle was a miniature fire of sticks the priest had collected from the bushes of wild rhododendron. The smoke rose upwards in a thin blue line. It did not even quiver, so profound was the surrounding stillness of the mountain air. But far away among the precipices ran the boom of falling water, and behind it again the muffled roar, as of peaks and snowfields that swept with a rolling thunder through the heavens. "'They are passing,' the priest said in a low voice. And they know that you are here. You have now the opportunity of a lifetime, for if you yield acceptance of your own free will, success is sure. You stand before the gates of birth and death. They offer you life. Yet I denied them, he murmured it below his breath. Denial is evocation. You called to them, and they have come. The sacrifice of your little personal life is all they ask. Be brave, 
and yield it. He took the bread as he spoke, and breaking it in three pieces, he placed one before Lemison, one before himself, and the third he laid upon the flame which first blackened and then consumed it. Eat it and understand, he said, for it is the nourishment that shall revive your fading life. Next, with the salt, he did the same. Then, raising the flask of wine, he put it to his lips, offering it afterwards to his companion. When both had drunk, there still remained the greater part of the contents. He lifted the vessel with both hands reverently towards the sky. He stood upright. The blood of your personal life I offer to them in your name. By the renunciation which seems to you as death, shall you pass through the gates of birth to the life of freedom beyond. For the ultimate sacrifice that they ask of you is this. And bending low before the distant heights, he poured the wine upon the rocky ground. For a period of time, Lemison found no means of measuring, so terrible were the emotions in his heart. The priest remained in this attitude of worship and obeisance. The tumult in the mountains ceased. An absolute hush dropped down upon the world. There seemed a pause in the inner history of the universe itself. All waited till he rose again. And when he did so, the mask that had for hours now been spreading across his features was accomplished. The eyes gazed sternly down into his own. Lemison looked and recognized. He stood face to face with the man whom he knew best of all others in the world. Himself. There had been death. There had also been that recovery of splendor which is birth and resurrection. And the sun that moment, with the sudden surprise that mountains only know, rushed clear above the heights, bathing the landscape and the standing figure with a stainless glory, into the vast temple where he knelt, as into the greater inner temple which is mankind's true house of royalty, there poured the completing presence which is light. For in this way and in this way only shall you pass from death to life, sang a chanting voice he recognized also now for the first time as indubitably his own. It was marvelous, but the birth of light is ever marvelous. It was anguish, but the pangs of resurrection since time began have been accomplished by the sweetness of fierce pain. For the majority still lie in the prenatal stage, unborn, unconscious of a definite spiritual existence. In the womb they grope and stifle, depending ever upon another. Denial is ever the call to life a protest against continued darkness for deliverance. Yet birth is the ruin of all that has hitherto been depended on. There comes then that standing alone which at first seems desolate isolation. The tumult of destruction precedes release. Lemison rose to his feet, stood with difficulty upright, looked about him from the figure so close now at his side to the snowy summit of that Tour du Néant he would never climb. The roar and thunder of their passage was resumed. It seemed the mountains reeled. They are passing, sang the voice that was beside him and within him too. But they have known you, and your offering is accepted. When they come close upon the world, there is ever wreckage and disaster in the affairs of men. They bring disorder and confusion into the mind, a confusion that seems final, a disorder that seems to threaten death. For there is tumult in their presence, and apparent chaos that seems the abandonment of order. Out of this vast ruin, then, there issues life in new design. The dislocation is its entrance, the dishevelment its strength. There has been birth. The sunlight dazzled his eyes. That distant roar, like a wind, came close and swept his face. An icy air, as from a passing star, breathed over him. "'Are you prepared?' he heard. He knelt again. Without a sign of hesitation or reluctance, he bared his chest to the sun and wind. The flash came swiftly, instantly, descending into his heart with unerring aim. He saw the gleam in the air. He felt the fiery impact of the blow. He even saw the stream gush forth and sink into the rocky ground. 
far redder than the wine. He gasped for breath a moment, staggered, reeled, collapsed. And within the moment so quickly did all happen, he was aware of hands that supported him and helped him to his feet. But he was too weak to stand. They carried him up to bed. The porter and the man who had reached across him for the matches five minutes before intended conversation stood one at his feet and the other at his head. As he passed through the vestibule of the hotel, he saw the people staring, and in his hand he crumpled up the unopened letters he had received so short a time ago. I really think I can manage alone, he thanked them. If you will set me down, I can walk. I felt dizzy for a moment. The heat in the hall, the gentleman began in a quiet, sympathetic voice. They left him standing on the stairs, watching a moment to see that he had quite recovered. Lemison walked up the two flights to his room without faltering. The momentary dizziness had passed. He felt quite himself again, strong, confident, able to stand alone, able to move forward, able to climb. End of section four. Section 5 of Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. The Slibrivox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. The Damned, Chapter 1. I'm over 40, Francis, and rather set in my ways, I said good naturedly, ready to yield if she insisted that our going together on the visit involved her happiness. My work is rather heavy just now, too, as you know. The question is, could I work there with a lot of unassorted people in the house? Mabel doesn't mention any other people, Bill, was my sister's rejoinder. I gather she's alone as well as lonely. By the way she looked sideways out of the window at nothing, it was obvious she was disappointed. But to my surprise she did not urge the point, and as I gathered at Mrs. Franklin's invitation lying upon her sloping lap, the neat childish handwriting conjured up a mental picture of the banker's widow with her timid, insignificant personality, her pale gray eyes, and her expression as of a backwards child. I thought, too, of the roomy country mansion her late husband had altered to suit his particular needs, and of my visit to it a few years ago when its barren spaciousness suggested a wing of Kensington Museum fitted up temporarily as a place to eat and sleep in. Comparing it mentally with the pokey Chelsea flat where I and my sister kept impecunious house, I realized other points as well. Unworthy details flashed across me to entice. The fine library, the organ, the quiet workroom I should have, perfect service, the delicious cup of early tea, and hot baths at any moment of the day, without a geyser. It's a longish visit a month, isn't it? I hedged, smiling at the details that seduced me, and ashamed of my man's selfishness, yet knowing that Francis expected it of me. There are points about it, I admit. If you're set on my going with you, I could manage it all right. I spoke at length in this way because my sister made no answer. I saw her tired eyes gazing into the dreariness of Oakley Street and felt a pang strike through me. After a pause, in which again she said no word, I added, So when you write the letter, you might hint, perhaps, that I usually work all the morning and uh, am not a very lively visitor. This she'll understand, you see and I half rose to return to my diminutive study where I was slaving just then at an absorbing article on comparative aesthetic values in the blind and deaf. But Frances did not move. She kept her gray eyes upon Oakley Street, where the evening mist from the river drew mournful perspectives into view. It was late October. We heard the omnibuses thundering across the bridge. The monotony of that broad, characterless street seemed more than usually depressing. Even in June sunshine it was dead, but with autumn its melancholy soaked into every house between King's Road and the embankment. It washed through into the past instead of inviting it hopefully towards the future. For me, its easy width was an avenue through which nameless slums across the river sent creeping messages of depression, and I always regarded it as winter's main entrance into London. Fog, slush, gloom trooped down it every November, waving their forbidding banners till March came to rout them. Its one claim upon my love was that the south wind swept sometimes unobstructed up it, soft with suggestions of the sea. These lugubrious thoughts I naturally kept to myself, 
though I never ceased to regret the little flat whose cheapness had seduced us. Now, as I watched my sister's impassive face, I realized that perhaps she too felt as I felt, yet brave woman, without betraying it. "'And look here, Fanny,' I said, putting a hand upon her shoulder as I crossed the room. "'It would be the very thing for you. You're worn out with catering and housekeeping. Mabel is your oldest friend, besides, and you've hardly seen her since he died.' "'She's been abroad for a year, Bill, and only just came back,' my sister interposed. "'She came back rather unexpectedly, though I never thought she would go there to live.' She stopped abruptly. Clearly she was only speaking half her mind. "'Probably,' she went on. "'Mabel wants to pick up old links again.' "'Naturally,' I put in, "'yourself chief among them.' The veiled reference to the house I let pass. It involved discussing the dead man, for one thing. "'I feel I ought to go anyhow,' she resumed. "'And, of course, it would be jollier if you came, too. "'You'd get in such a muddle here by yourself, "'and eat wrong things, and forget to air the rooms, and... "'Oh, everything,' she looked up laughing. "'Only,' she added, "'there's the British Museum.' "'But there's a big library there,' I answered, "'and all the books of reference I could possibly want. "'It was of you I was thinking. "'You could take up your painting again. "'You always sell half of what you paint,' It would be a splendid rest, too, and Sussex is a jolly country to walk in. By all means, Fanny, I advise. Our eyes met as I stammered in my attempts to avoid expressing the thought that hid in both our minds. My sister had a weakness for dabbling in the various new theories of the day, and Mabel, who before her marriage had belonged to foolish societies for investigating the future life to the neglect of the present one, had fostered this undesirable tendency. Her amiable, impressionable temperament was open to every psychic wind that blew. I deplored, detested the whole business. But even more than this, I abhorred the later influence that Mr. Franklin had steeped his wife in, capturing her body and soul in his somber doctrines. I had dreaded lest my sister also might be caught. Now that she is alone again, I stopped short. Our eyes now made pretense impossible for the truth had slipped out, inevitably, stupidly, although unexpressed in definite language. We laughed, turning our faces a moment to look at other things in the room. Frances picked up a book and examined its cover as though she had made an important discovery. While I took my case out and lit a cigarette I did not want to smoke, we left the matter there. I went out of the room before further explanation could cause tension. Disagreements grow into discord from such tiny things. Wrong adjectives or a chance inflection of the voice. Frances had a right to her views of life as much as I had. At least, I reflected comfortably. We had separated upon an agreement this time. Recognized mutually, though not actually stated. And this point of meeting was, oddly enough, our way of regarding someone who was dead. For we had both disliked the husband with a great dislike. And during his three years' married life had only been to the house once, for a weekend visit. Arriving late on Saturday, we had left after an early breakfast on Monday morning. Ascribing my sister's dislike to a natural jealousy at losing her old friend, I merely said that he displeased me. Yet we both knew that the real emotion lay much deeper. Francis, loyal, honorable creature, had kept silence, and beyond saying that house and grounds, he altered one and laid out the other, distressed her as an expression of his personality somehow. Distressed was the word she used. No further explanation had passed her lips. Our dislike of his personality was easily accounted for, up to a point, since both of us shared the artist's point of view that a creed, cut to measure and carefully dried, was an ugly thing, and that a dogma to which believers must subscribe or perish everlastingly was a barbarism resting upon cruelty. But while my own dislike was purely due to an abstract worship of beauty, my sister's had another twist in it, for with her new tendencies, she believed that all religions were an aspect of truth and that no one, even the lowest wretch, could escape heaven in the long run. Samuel Franklin, the rich banker, was a man universally respected and admired, and the marriage, though Mabel was fifteen years his junior, won general applause. His bride was an heiress in her own right, breweries and the story of her conversion at a revivalist meeting where Samuel Franklin had spoken fervidly of heaven and terrifyingly of sin, hell, and damnation, even contained a touch of genuine romance. She was a brand snatched from the burning, 
His detailed eloquence had frightened her into heaven. Salvation came in the nick of time. His words had plucked her from the edge of that lake of fire and brimstone where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. She regarded him as a hero, sighed her relief upon his saintly shoulder, and accepted the peace he offered her with a grateful resignation. For her husband was a religious man, who successfully combined great riches with the glamour of winning souls. He was a portly figure, though tall with masterful big hands, the fingers rather thick and red, and his dignity, that just escaped being pompous, held in it something that was implacable. A convinced assurance, almost remorseless, gleamed in his eyes when he preached, especially, and his threats of hell-fire must have scared souls stronger than the timid, receptive Mabel whom he married. He clad himself in long frock coats that buttoned unevenly, big square boots and trousers that invariably bagged at the knee and were a little short. He wore low collars, spats occasionally, and a tall black hat that was not of silk. His voice was alternately hard and unctuous, and he regarded theaters, ballrooms, and racecourses as the vestibule of that brimstone lake, of whose geography he was as positive as of his great banking offices in the city. A philanthropist up to the hilt, however, no one ever doubted his complete sincerity. His convictions were ingrained, his faith borne out by his life. As witness his name upon so many admirable societies, as treasurer, patron, or heading the donation list. He bulked large in the world of doing good, a broad and stately stone in the rampart against evil, and his heart was genuinely kind and soft for others, who believed as he did. Yet in spite of this true sympathy with suffering in his desire to help, he was narrow as a telegraph wire, and unbending as a church pillar. He was intensely selfish, intolerant as an officer of the Inquisition, his bourgeois soul constructed a revolting scheme of heaven that was reproduced in miniature in all he did and planned. Faith was the sine qua non of salvation, and by faith he meant belief in his own particular view of things, which faith except everyone do keep whole and undefiled, without doubt he shall perish everlastingly. All the world but his own small exclusive sect must be damned eternally. A pity, but alas, inevitable. He was right. Yet he prayed without ceasing, and gave heavily to the poor, the only thing he could not give being big ideas to his provincial and suburban deity. Pettier than an insect and more obstinate than a mule, he had also the superior sleek humility of a chosen one. He was churchwarden, too. He read the lessons in a place of worship, either chilly or overheated, where neither organ, vestments, nor lighted candles were permitted, but where the odor of hair wash on the boys' heads in the back rows pervaded the entire building. This portrait of the banker who accumulated riches both on earth and in heaven may possibly be overdrawn, however, because Francis and I were artistic temperaments that viewed the type with a dislike and distrust amounting to contempt. The majority considered Samuel Franklin a worthy man and a good citizen. The majority, doubtless, held the saner view. A few years more, and he certainly would have been made a baronet. He relieved much suffering in the world, as assuredly as he caused many souls the agonies of torturing fear by his emphasis upon damnation. Had there been one point of beauty in him, we might have been more lenient. Only we found it not, and, I admit, took little pains to research. I shall never forget the look of dour forgiveness with which he heard our excuses for missing morning prayers that Sunday morning of our single visit to the Towers. My sister learned that a change was made soon afterwards, prayers being conducted after breakfast instead of before. The towers stood solemnly upon a Sussex hill amid park-like modern grounds, but the house cannot better be described. It would be so wearisome, for one thing, than by saying that it was a cross between an overgrown, pretentious Norwood villa and one of those Saturnine institutes for cripples the train passes as it slinks ashamed through South London into Surrey. It was wealthily furnished, and at first sight imposing, but on closer acquaintance revealed a meager personality, barren and austere. One look for rules and regulations on the walls, all signed by order. The place was a prison that shut out the world. There was, of course, no billiard room, no smoking room, no room for play of any kind, and the great hall at the back, once a chapel which might have been used for dancing, theatricals, or other innocent amusements, 
was consecrated in his day to meetings of various kinds, chiefly brigades, temperance, or missionary societies. There was a harmonium at one end, on the level floor, a raised dais or platform at the other, and a gallery above for the servants, gardeners, and coachmen. It was heated with hot water pipes and hung with Doré's pictures, though these latter were soon removed and stored out of sight in the attics as being too unspiritual. In polished, shiny wood, it was a representation in miniature of that pokey, exclusive heaven he took about with him, externalizing it in all he did and planned, even in the grounds about the house. Changes in the towers, Francis told me, had been made during Mabel's year of widowhood abroad. An organ put into the big hall, the library made livable and recatalogued, when it was permissible to suppose she had found her soul again and returned to her normal, healthy views of life, which included enjoyment in play, literature, music, and the arts, without, however, a touch of that trivial thoughtlessness usually termed worldliness. Mrs. Franklin, as I remembered her, was a quiet little woman, shallow, perhaps, and easily influenced, but sincere as a dog and thorough in her faithful friendships. Her tastes at heart were Catholic, and that heart was simple and unimaginative. That she took up with the various movements of the day was sign merely that she was searching in her limited way for a belief that should bring her peace. She was, in fact, a very ordinary woman, her caliber a little less than that of Francis. I knew they used to discuss all kinds of theories together, but as these discussions never resulted in action, I had come to regard her as harmless. Still, I was not sorry when she married, and I did not welcome now a renewal of the former intimacy. The philanthropist had given her no children, or she would have made a good and sensible mother. No doubt she would marry again. "'Mabel mentions that she's been alone at the tower since the end of August,' Francis told me at tea-time. "'And I'm sure she feels out of it and lonely. It would be a kindness to go. Besides, I always liked her.' I agreed. I had recovered from my attack of selfishness. I expressed my pleasure. "'You've written to accept,' I said, half-statement and half-question. Francis nodded. "'I thanked for you,' she added quietly, explaining that you were not free at the moment, but that later, if not convenient, you might come down for a bit and join me. I stared. Francis sometimes had this independent way of deciding things. I was convicted and punished into the bargain. Of course, there followed argument and explanation, as between brother and sister who were affectionate, but the recording of our talk could be of little interest. It was arranged thus, Francis and I both satisfied. Two days later she departed for the towers, leaving me alone in the flat with everything planned for my comfort and good behavior. She was rather a tyrant in her quiet way, and her last words as I saw her off from Charing Cross rang in my head for a long time after she was gone. I'll write and let you know, Bill. Eat properly, mind, and let me know if anything goes wrong. She waved her small gloved hand nodded her head till the feather brushed the window, and was gone. Chapter 2 After the note announcing her safe arrival, a week of silence passed, and then a letter came. There were various suggestions for my welfare, and the rest was the usual rambling information and description Francis loved, generously italicized. And we are quite alone, she went on in her enormous handwriting that seemed such a waste of space and labor, though some others are coming presently, I believe. You could work here to your heart's content. Mabel quite understands and says she would love to have you when you feel free to come. She has changed a bit, back to her old natural self. She never mentions him. The place has changed, too, in certain ways. It has more cheerfulness, I think. She has put it in, this cheerfulness, spaded it in, if you know what I mean. But it lies about uneasily and is not natural, quite. The organ is a beauty. She must be very rich now, but she's as gentle and sweet as ever. Do you know, Bill, I think he must have frightened her into marrying him. I get the impression she was afraid of him. This last sentence was inked out, but I read it through the scratching, the letters being too big to hide. He had an inflexible will beneath all that oily kindness which passed for spiritual. He was a real personality, I mean. I'm sure he'd have sent you and me cheerfully to the stake in another century, for our own good. Isn't it odd she never speaks of him, even to me? This again was stroked through, though without the intention to obliterate, merely because it was repetition, probably. The only reminder of him in the house now is a big copy of the presentation portrait that stands on the stairs of the Multitechnic Institute at Peckham. 
You know, that life-size one, with his fat hand sprinkled with rings resting on a thick Bible, and the other slipped between the buttons of a tight frock coat. It hangs in the dining room and rather dominates our meals. I wish Mabel would take it down. I think she'd like to if she dared. There's not a single photograph of him anywhere, even in her own room. Mrs. Marsh is here, you remember her, his housekeeper, the wife of the man who got penal servitude for killing a baby or something. You said she robbed him and justified her stealing because the story of the unjust steward was in the Bible. How we laughed over that. She's just the same, too, gliding about all over the house and turning up when least expected. Other reminiscences filled the next two sides of the letter and ran without a trace of punctuation into instructions about a salamander stove for heating my workroom in the flat. These were followed by things I was to tell the cook, and by requests for several articles she had forgotten and would like sent after her. Two of them blouses with descriptions so lengthy and contradictory that I sighed as I read them. Unless you come down soon, in which case perhaps you wouldn't mind bringing them. Not the mauve one I wear in the evening sometimes, but the pale blue one, with lace round the collar and the crinkly front. They're in the cupboard, or the drawer, I'm not sure which, of my bedroom. Ask Annie if you're in doubt. Thanks most awfully. Send a telegram, remember, and we'll meet you in the motor any time. I don't quite know if I shall stay the whole month alone. It all depends. And she closed the letter, the italicized words increasing recklessly toward the end, with a repetition that Mabel would love to have me for myself, as also to have a man in the house, and that I only had to telegraph the day in the train. This letter coming by the second post interrupted me in a moment of absorbing work, and having read it through to make sure there was nothing requiring instant attention, I threw it aside and went on with my notes and reading. Within five minutes, however, it was back at me again, that restless thing called between the lines fluttering about my mind, my interest in the Balkan states, political article that had been ordered, faded. Somewhere, somehow, I felt disquieted, disturbed. At first I persisted in my work, forcing myself to concentrate, but soon found that a layer of new impressions floated between the article and my attention. It was like a shadow though a shadow that dissolved upon inspection. Once or twice I glanced up, expecting to find someone in the room, that the door had opened unobserved and Annie was waiting for instructions. I heard the buses thundering across the bridge. I was aware of Oakley Street, Montenegro, and the blue Adriatic melted into the October haze along that depressing embankment that aped a riverbank, and sentences from the letter flashed before my eyes and stung me, Picking it up and reading it through more carefully, I rang the bell and told Annie to find the blouses and pack them for the post, showing her finally the written description, and resenting the superior smile with which she at once interrupted. I know them, sir, and disappeared. But it was not the blouses. It was that exasperating thing between the lines that put an end to my work with its elusive teasing nuisance. The first sharp impression is alone of value in such a case, for once analysis begins, the imagination constructs all kinds of false interpretation. The more I thought, the more I grew fuddled. The letter, it seemed to me, wanted to say another thing. Instead, the eight sheets conveyed it merely. It came to the edge of disclosure, then halted. There was something on the writer's mind, and I felt uneasy. Studying the sentences brought, however, no revelation, but increased confusion only. For while the uneasiness remained, the first clear hint had vanished. In the end, I closed my books and went out to look up another matter at the British Museum Library. Perhaps I should discover it that way, by turning the mind in a totally new direction. I lunched at the Express Dairy in Oxford Street close by, and telephoned to Annie that I would be home to tea at five. And at tea, tired physically and mentally after breathing the exhausted air of the rotunda for five hours, my mind suddenly delivered up its original impression, vivid and clear-cut. No proof accompanied the revelation. It was mere presentiment, but convincing. Frances was disturbed in her mind, her orderly, sensible, housekeeping mind. She was uneasy, even perhaps afraid. Something in the house distressed her, and she had need of me. Unless I went down, her time of rest and change, her quite necessary holiday, in fact, would be spoilt. She was too unselfish to say this, but it ran everywhere between the lines. I saw it clearly now. Mrs. Franklin, moreover, and that meant Frances, too, would like a man in the house. 
It was a disagreeable phrase, a suggestive way of hinting something she dared not state definitely. The two women in that great lonely barrack of a house were afraid. My sense of duty, affection, unselfishness, whatever the composite emotion may be termed, was stirred, also my vanity. I acted quickly, lest reflection should warp clear, decent judgment. Annie, I said when she answered the bell, you need not send those blouses by the post. I'll take them down tomorrow when I go. I shall be away a week or two, possibly longer. And having looked up a train, I hastened out to telegraph, before I could change my fickle mind. But no desire came that night to change my mind. I was doing the right, the necessary thing. I was even in something of a hurry to get down to the towers as soon as possible. I chose an early afternoon train. Chapter 3 A telegram had told me to come to a town ten miles from the house, so I was saved the crawling train to the local station and traveled down by an express. As soon as we left London, the fog cleared off and an autumn sun, though without heat in it, painted the landscape with golden browns and yellows. My spirits rose as I lay back in the luxurious motor and sped between the woods and hedges. Oddly enough, my anxiety of overnight had disappeared. It was due, no doubt, to that exaggeration of detail, which reflection and loneliness brings. Frances and I had not been separated for over a year, and her letters from the towers told so little. It had seemed unnatural to be deprived of those intimate particulars of mood and feeling I was accustomed to. We had such confidence in one another and our affection was so deep. Though she was but five years younger than myself, I regarded her as a child. My attitude was fatherly. In return, she certainly mothered me with a solicitude that never cloyed. I felt no desire to marry while she was still alive. She painted in watercolors with a reasonable success and kept house for me. I wrote, reviewed books, and lectured on aesthetics. We were a humdrum couple of quasi-artists, well satisfied with life, and all I feared for her was that she might become a suffragette or be taken captive by one of these wild theories that caught her imagination sometimes, and that Mabel, for one, had fostered. As for myself, no doubt she deemed me a trifle solid or stolid, I forget which word she preferred, but on the whole there was just sufficient difference of opinion to make intercourse suggestive without monotony, and certainly without quarreling. Drawing in deep drafts of the stinging autumn air, I felt happy and exhilarated. It was like going for a holiday, with comfort at the end of the journey instead of bargaining for centimes. But my heart sank noticeably the moment the house came into view. The long drive, lined with hostile monkey trees and formal Wellingtonias that were solemn and sedate, was mere extension of the miniature approach to a thousand semi-detached suburban residences and the appearance of the towers, as we turned the corner with a rush, suggested a commonplace climax to a story that had begun interestingly, almost thrillingly. A villa had escaped from the shadow of the Crystal Palace, thumped its way down by night, grown suddenly monstrous in a shower of rich rain, and settled itself insolently to stay. Ivy climbed about the opulent red brick walls, but climbed neatly and with disfiguring effect. Sham as on a prison, or, the simile made me smile, an orphan asylum. There was no hint of the comely roughness of untidy ivy on a ruin. Clipped, trained, and precise it was, as on a brand new Protestant church. I swear there was not a bird's nest nor a single earwig in it anywhere. About the porch it was particularly thick, smothering a seventeenth-century lamp with a contrast that was quite horrible. Extensive glass houses spread away on the farther side of the house. The numerous towers to which the building owed its name seemed made to hold school bells, and the window sills, thick with potted flowers, made me think of the desolate suburbs of Brighton or Bexhill. In a commanding position upon the crest of a hill, it overlooked miles of undulating wooded country southwards to the downs, but behind it to the north, thick banks of ilex, holly, and privet protected it from the cleaner and more stimulating winds. Hence, though highly placed, it was shut in. Three years had passed since I last set eyes upon it, but the unsightly memory I had retained was justified by the reality. The place was deplorable. It is my habit to express my opinions audibly sometimes when impressions are strong enough to warrant it, but now I only sighed, oh dear, as I extricated my legs from many rugs and went into the house. A tall parlor maid with the bearing of a grenadier received me, 
and standing behind her was Mrs. Marsh, the housekeeper, whom I remembered because her untidy back hair had suggested to me that it had been burnt. I went at once to my room, my hostess already dressing for dinner, but Francis came in to see me just as I was struggling with my black tie that had gotten tangled like a bootlace. She fastened it for me in a neat, effective bow, and while I held my chin up for the operation, staring blankly at the ceiling, the impression came. I wondered, was it her touch that caused it? That something in her trembled? Shrinking, perhaps, is the truer word. Nothing in her face or manner betrayed it, nor in her pleasant, easy talk while she tidied my things and scolded my slovenly packing, as her habit was, questioning me about the servants at the flat. The blouses, though right, were crumpled, and my scolding was deserved. There was no impatience, even. Yet somehow or other the suggestion of a shrinking reserve and holding back reached my mind. She had been lonely, of course, but it was more than that. She was glad that I had come, yet for some reason unstated she could have wished that I had stayed away. We discussed the news that had accumulated during our brief separation, and in doing so the impression, at best exceedingly slight, was forgotten. My chamber was large and beautifully furnished. The hall and dining room of our flat would have gone into it with a good remainder. Yet it was not a place I could settle down in for work. It conveyed the idea of impermanence, making me feel transient as in a hotel bedroom. This, of course, was the fact, but some rooms convey a settled, lasting hospitality, even in a hotel. This one did not, and as I was accustomed to work in the room I slept in, at least when visiting, a slight frown must have crept between my eyes. "'Mabel has fitted a workroom for you just out of the library,' said the clairvoyant Francis. "'No one will disturb you there, and you'll have fifteen thousand books all catalogued within easy reach. There's a private staircase, too. You can breakfast in your room and slip down in your dressing gown if you want to.' She laughed. My spirits took a turn upwards as absurdly as they had gone down. "'And how are you?' I asked, giving her a belated kiss. "'It's jolly to be together again. I did feel rather lost without you, I'll admit.' "'That's natural,' she laughed. "'I'm so glad.' She looked well and had country color in her cheeks. She informed me that she was eating and sleeping well, going out for little walks with Mabel, painting bits of scenery again, and enjoying a complete change in rest. And yet, for all her brave description, the words somehow did not quite ring true. Those last words in particular did not ring true. There lay in her manner, just out of sight, I felt this suggestion of the exact reverse, of unrest, shrinking, almost of anxiety. Certain small strings in her seemed over-tight. Keyed up was the sling expression that crossed my mind. I looked rather searchingly into her face as she was telling me this. Only the evenings, she added, noticing my query, yet rather avoiding my eyes, the evenings are, well, rather heavy sometimes, and I find it difficult to keep awake. The strong air after London makes you drowsy, I suggested, and you like to get early to bed. Francis turned and looked at me for a moment steadily. On the contrary, Bill, I dislike going to bed, here, and Mabel goes so early. She said it lightly enough, fingering the disorder upon my dressing table in such a stupid way that I saw her mind was working in another direction altogether. She looked up suddenly with a kind of nervousness from the brush and scissors. Billy, she said, abruptly lowering her voice, isn't it odd, but I hate sleeping alone here. I can't make it out quite. I've never felt such a thing before in my life. Do you think it's all nonsense? And she laughed with her lips, but not with her eyes. There was a note of defiance in her I failed to understand. "'Nothing in nature like yours feels strongly as nonsense, Francis,' I replied soothingly. But I, too, answered with my lips only, for another part of my mind was working elsewhere and among uncomfortable things. A touch of bewilderment passed over me. I was not certain how best to continue. If I laughed, she would tell me no more. Yet, if I took her too seriously, the strings would tighten further. Instinctively, then, this flashed rapidly across me that something of what she felt I had also felt, though interpreting it differently. Vague it was, the coming of rain or storm that announced themselves hours in advance with their hint of faint, unsettling excitement in the air. I had been but a short hour in the house, big, comfortable, luxurious house, 
but had experienced this sense of being unsettled, unfixed, fluctuating, a kind of impermanence that transient lodgers and hotels must feel, but that a guest in a friend's home ought not to feel, be the visit short or long. To Frances, an impressionable woman, the feeling had come in terms of alarm. She disliked sleeping alone, while yet she longed to sleep. The precise idea in my mind evaded capture, merely brushing through me, three quarters out of sight. I realized only that we both felt the same thing and that neither of us could get at it clearly. Degrees of unrest we felt, but the actual thing did not disclose itself. It did not happen. I felt strangely at sea for a moment. Francis would interpret hesitation as endorsement, and encouragement might be the last thing that could help her. Sleeping in a strange house, I answered at length, is often difficult at first, and one feels lonely. After fifteen months in our tiny flat, one feels lost and uncared for in a big house. It's an uncomfortable feeling. I know it well. And this is a barrack, isn't it? The masses of furniture only make it worse. One feels in storage somewhere underground. The furniture doesn't furnish. One must never yield to fancies, though. Frances looked away towards the windows. She seemed disappointed a little. After our thickly populated Chelsea, I went on quickly, it seems isolated here. But she did not turn back, and clearly I was saying the wrong thing. A wave of pity rushed suddenly over me. Was she really frightened, perhaps? She was imaginative, I knew, but never moody. Common sense was strong in her, though she had her times of hypersensitiveness. I caught the echo of some unreasoning big alarm in her. She stood there, gazing across my balcony towards the sea of wooded country that spread dim and vague in the obscurity of the dusk. The deepening shadows entered the room, I fancied, from the grounds below. Following her abstract gaze a moment, I experienced a curious, sharp desire to leave, to escape. Out yonder was wind and space and freedom. This enormous building was oppressive, silent, still. Great catacombs occurred to me. Things beneath the ground. Imprisonment and capture. I believe I even shuddered a little. I touched her shoulder. She turned round slowly, and we looked with a certain deliberation into each other's eyes. Fanny, I asked more gravely than I intended, you are not frightened, are you? Nothing has happened, has it? She replied with emphasis. Of course not. How could it? I mean, why should I? She stammered, as though the wrong sentence flustered her a second. It's simply that I have this to, this dislike of sleeping alone. Naturally, my first thought was how easy it would be to cut our visit short. But I did not say this. Had it been a true solution, Francis would have said it for me long ago. Wouldn't Mabel double up with you? I said instead. Or give you an adjoining room so that you could leave the door between you open? There's space enough, heaven knows. And then, as the gong sounded in the hall below for dinner, she said, as with an effort, this thing. Mabel did ask me, on the third night, after I had told her, but I declined. You'd rather be alone than with her? I asked, with a certain relief. Her reply was so gravely given a child would have known there was more behind it. Not that, but that she did not really want it. I had a moment's intuition and acted on it impulsively. She feels it too, perhaps, but wishes to face it by herself and get over it. My sister bowed her head, and the gesture made me realize of a sudden how grave and solemn our talk had grown, as though some portentous thing were under discussion. It had come of itself, indefinite as a gradual change of temperature, yet neither of us knew its nature, for apparently neither of us could state it plainly. Nothing happened, even in our words. That was my impression, she said, that if she yields to it, she encourages it, and a habit forms so easily. Just think, she added with a faint smile that was the first sign of lightness she had yet betrayed, what a nuisance it would be everywhere if everybody was afraid of being alone like that. I snatched readily at the chance. We laughed a little, though it was a quiet kind of laughter that seemed wrong, I took her arm and led her towards the door. Disastrous, in fact, I agreed. She raised her voice to its normal pitch again, as I had done. 
No doubt it will pass, she said. Now that you have come, of course it's chiefly my imagination. Her tone was lighter, though nothing could convince me that the matter itself was light just then. And in any case, tightening her grip on my arm as we passed into the bright, enormous corridor and caught sight of Mrs. Franklin waiting in the cheerless hall below, I'm very glad you're here, Bill, and Mabel, I know, is too. If it doesn't pass, I just had time to whisper with a feeble attempt at jollity. I'll come at night and snore outside your door. After that, you'll be so glad to get rid of me that you won't mind being alone. That's a bargain, said Francis. I shook my hostess by the hand, made a banal remark about the long interval since last we met, and walked behind them into the great dining room, dimly lit by candles, wondering in my heart how long my sister and I should stay, and why in the world we had ever left our cozy little flat to enter this desolation of riches and false luxury at all. The unsightly picture of the late Samuel Franklin Esquire stared down upon me from the farther end of the room above the mighty mantelpiece. He looked, I thought, like some pompous heavenly butler who denied to all the world, and to us in particular, the right of entry without presentation cards signed by his hand as proof that we belonged to his own exclusive set. The majority, to his deep grief, and in spite of all his prayers on their behalf, must burn and perish everlastingly. Chapter 4 With the instinct of the healthy bachelor, I always try to make myself a nest in the place I live in, be it for long or short, whether visiting in lodging house or in hotel, the first essential is this nest, one's own things built into the walls as a bird builds in its feathers. It may look desolate and uncomfortable enough to others because the central detail is neither bed nor wardrobe, sofa nor armchair, but a good solid writing table that does not wriggle and that has wide elbow room. And the towers is vividly described for me by the single fact that I could not nest there. I took several days to discover this, but the first impression of impermanence was truer than I knew. The feathers of the mind refused here to lie one way. They ruffled, pointed, and grew wild. Luxurious furniture does not mean comfort. I might as well have tried to settle down in the sofa and armchair department of a big shop. My bedroom was easily managed. It was the private workroom, prepared especially for my reception, that made me feel alien and outcast. Externally, it was all one could desire, an antechamber to the great library, with not one but two generous oak tables, to say nothing of the smaller ones against the walls with capacious drawers. There were reading desks, mechanical devices for holding books, perfect light, quiet as in a church, and no approach but across the huge adjoining room. Yet, it did not invite. I hope you'll be able to work here, said my little hostess the next morning as she took me in her only visit to it while I stayed in the house, and showed me the ten-volume catalogue. It's absolutely quiet, and no one will disturb you. If you can't, Bill, you're not much good, laughed Frances, who was on her arm. Even I could write in a study like this. I glanced with pleasure at the ample tables, the sheets of thick blotting paper, the rulers, sealing wax, paper knives, and all the other immaculate paraphernalia. It's perfect, I answered with a secret thrill, yet feeling a little foolish. This was for Gibbon or Carlyle, rather than for my pot-boiling insignificancies. If I can't write masterpieces here, it's certainly not your fault. And I turned with gratitude to Mrs. Franklin. She was looking straight at me, and there was a question in her small pale eyes I did not understand. Was she noting the effect upon me, I wondered. You'll write here, perhaps a story about the house, she said. Thompson will bring you anything you want. You only have to ring. She pointed to the electric bell on the central table, the wire running neatly down the leg. No one has ever worked here before, and the library has been hardly used since it was put in, so there's no previous atmosphere to affect your imagination, or adversely. We laughed. Bill isn't that sort, said my sister, while I wished they would go out and leave me to arrange my little nest and set to work. I thought, of course, it was the huge listening library that made me feel so inconsiderable. The fifteen thousand silent staring books, the solemn aisles, the deep eloquent shelves. But when the women had gone and I was alone, the beginning of the truth crept over me, and I felt that first hint of disconsolateness, which later became an imperative no. 
The mind shut down. Images ceased to rise and flow. I read, made copious notes, but I wrote no single line at the towers. Nothing completed itself there. Nothing happened. The morning sunshine poured into the library through ten long, narrow windows. Birds were singing. The autumn air, rich with a faint aroma of November melancholy that stung the imagination pleasantly, filled my antechamber. I looked out upon the undulating wooded landscape, hemmed in by the sweep of distant downs, and I tasted a whiff of the sea. Rooks cawed as they floated above the elms, and there were lazy cows in the nearer meadows. A dozen times I tried to make my nest and settle down to work, and a dozen times, like a turning, fastidious dog upon a hearth rug, I rearranged my chair and books and papers. The temptation of the catalogue and shelves, of course, was accountable for much, yet not, I felt, for all. This was a manageable seduction. My work, moreover, was not of the creative kind that requires absolute absorption. It was the mere readable presentation of data I had accumulated. My notebooks were charged with facts ready to tabulate. Facts, too, that interested me keenly. A mere effort of the will was necessary, and concentration of no difficult kind. Yet, somehow it seemed beyond me. Something forever pushed the facts into disorder. And in the end, I sat in the sunshine, dipping into a dozen books. Selected from the shelves outside, vexed with myself and only half enjoying it, I felt restless I wanted to be elsewhere. And even while I read, attention wandered. Francis, Mabel, her late husband, the house and grounds, each in turn and sometimes altogether rose uninvited into the stream of thought, hindered any consecutive flow of work. In disconnected fashion came these pictures that interrupted concentration, yet presenting themselves as broken fragments of a bigger thing my mind already groped for unconsciously. They fluttered round this hidden thing of which they were aspects, fugitive interpretations, no one of them bringing complete revelation. There was no adjective, such as pleasant or unpleasant, that I could attach to what I felt, beyond that the result was unsettling. Vague as the atmosphere of a dream, it yet persisted, and I could not dissipate it. Isolated words or phrases in the lines I read sent questions scouring across my mind, sure sign that the deeper part of me was restless and ill at ease. Rather trivial questions, too. Half-foolish interrogations, as of a puzzled or curious child. Why was my sister afraid to sleep alone? And why did her friend feel a similar repugnance, yet seek to conquer it? Why were the solid luxury of the house without comfort, its shelter without the sense of permanence? Why had Mrs. Franklin asked us to come, artists, unbelieving vagabonds, types at the farthest possible remove from the saved sheep of her husband's household? Had a reaction set in against the hysteria of her conversion? I had seen no signs of religious fervor in her. Her atmosphere was that of an ordinary, high-minded woman, yet a woman of the world. Lifeless, though, a little perhaps now that I came to think about it. She had made no definite impression upon me of any kind, and my thoughts ran vaguely after this fragile clue. Closing my book, I let them run. For with this chance reflection came the discovery that I could not see her clearly. Could not feel her soul her personality. Her face, her small pale eyes, her dress and body and walk, all these stood before me like a photograph. But her self evaded me. She seemed not there, lifeless, empty, a shadow, nothing. The picture was disagreeable, and I put it by. Instantly she melted out as though light thought had conjured up a phantom that had no real existence. And at that very moment, singularly enough, my eye caught sight of her moving past the window, going silently along the gravel path. I watched her, a sudden new sensation gripping me. There goes a prisoner, my thought instantly ran, one who wishes to escape, but cannot. What brought the outlandish notion, heaven only knows. The house was of her own choice, she was twice an heiress, and the world lay open at her feet, yet she stayed unhappy, frightened, caught. All this flashed over me and made a sharp impression, even before I had time to dismiss it as absurd. But a moment later explanation offered itself, though it seemed as far-fetched as the original impression. 
My mind, being logical, was obliged to provide something, apparently. For Mrs. Franklin, while dressed to go out with thick walking boots, a pointed stick, and a motor cap tied on with a veil as for the windy lanes, was obviously content to go no farther than the little garden paths. The costume was a sham and a pretense. It was this, and her lithe quick movements, that suggested a caged creature, a creature tamed by fear and cruelty that cloaked themselves in kindness, pacing up and down, unable to realize why it got no farther, but always met the same bars in exactly the same place. The mind in her was barred. I watched her go along the paths and down the steps from one terrace to another, until the laurels hid her altogether. And into this mere imagining of a moment came a hint of something slightly disagreeable, for which my mind, searched as it would, found no explanation at all. I remembered then certain other little things. They dropped into the picture of their own accord. In a mind not deliberately hunting for clues, pieces of a puzzle sometimes come together in this way, bringing revelation, so that for a second there flashed across me, vanishing instantly again before I could consider it, a large, distressing thought that I can only describe vaguely as a shadow. Dark and ugly, oppressive certainly it might be described, with something torn and dreadful about the edges that suggested pain and strife and terror, the interior of a prison with two rows of occupied condemned cells, seen years ago in New York, sprang to memory after it. The connection between the two impossible to surmise even. But the certain other little things mentioned above were these. That Mrs. Franklin, in last night's dinner talk, had always referred to this house, but never called it home, and had emphasized unnecessarily for a well-bred woman our great kindness in coming down to stay so long with her. Another time, in answer to my futile compliment about the stately rooms, she said quietly, "'It is an enormous house for so small a party, but I stay here very little, and only till I get it straight again.' The three of us were going up the great staircase to bed as this was said, and, not knowing quite her meaning, I dropped the subject. It edged delicate ground, I felt. Frances added no word of her own. It now occurred to me abruptly that stay was the word made use of when live would have been more natural. How insignificant to recall. Yet, why did they suggest themselves just at this moment? And on going to Frances's room to make sure she was not nervous or lonely, I realized abruptly that Mrs. Franklin, of course, had talked with her in a confidential sense that I, as a mere visiting brother, could not share. Frances had told me nothing. I might easily have wormed it out of her had I not felt that for us to discuss further our hostess and her house merely because we were under the roof together was not quite nice or loyal. "'I'll call you, Bill, if I'm scared,' she had laughed as we parted, my room being just across the big corridor from her own. I had fallen asleep thinking what in the world was meant by getting it straight again. And now in my antechamber to the library on the second morning, sitting among piles of full scrap and sheets of spotless blotting paper, all useless to me. These slight hints came back and helped to frame the big vague shadow I have mentioned. Up to the neck in this shadow, almost drowned yet, just treading water, stood the figure of my hostess in her walking costume. Frances and I seemed swimming to her aid. The shadow was large enough to include both house and grounds, but farther than that I could not see. Dismissing it, I fell to reading my purloined book again. Before I turned another page, however, another startling detail leaped out at me. The figure of Mrs. Franklin in the shadow was not living. It floated helplessly, like a doll or puppet that has no life in it. It was both pathetic and dreadful. And one who sits in reverie thus, of course, may see similar ridiculous pictures when the will no longer guides construction. The incongruities of dreams are thus explained. I merely record the picture as it came. That it remained by me for several days, just as vivid dreams do, is neither here nor there. I did not allow myself to dwell upon it. The curious thing, perhaps, is that from this moment I date my inclination, though not yet my desire, to leave. I purposely say, to leave. I cannot quite remember when the word changed to that aggressive, frantic thing which is escape. End of section 5
Section 6 of Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. The Damned, Chapter 5. We were left delightedly to ourselves in this pretentious country mansion with the soul of a villa. Frances took up her painting again, and the weather being propitious, spent hours out of doors, sketching flowers, trees, and nooks of woodland, garden, even the house itself where bits of it peered suggestively across the orchards. Mrs. Franklin seemed always busy about something or other, and never interfered with us except to propose motoring, tea in another part of the lawn, and so forth. She flitted everywhere, preoccupied, yet apparently doing nothing. The house engulfed her, rather. No visitors called. For one thing, she was not supposed to be back from abroad yet, and for another, I think, the neighborhood, her husband's neighborhood, was puzzled by her sudden cessation from good works. Brigades and temperance societies did not ask her to hold their meetings in the big hall, and the vicar arranged the school treats in another's field without explanation. The full-length portrait in the dining room, and the presence of the housekeeper with the burnt back hair, indeed were the only reminders of the man who once had lived here. Mrs. Marsh retained her place in silence, well-paid, sinecure as it doubtless was, yet with no hint of that suppressed disapproval one might have expected from her. Indeed, there was nothing positive to disapprove, since nothing worldly entered grounds or building. In her master's lifetime, she had been another brand snatched from the burning, and it had been her custom to give vociferous testimony at the revival meetings where he adorned the platform and led in streams of prayer. I saw her sometimes on the stairs, hovering, wandering, half-watching and half-listening, and the idea came to me once that this woman somehow formed a link with the departed influence of her bigoted employer. She, alone among us, belonged to the house, and looked at home there. When I saw her talking, oh, with such correct and respectful mien, to Mrs. Franklin, I had the feeling that for all her unaggressive attitude, she yet exerted some influence that sought to make her mistress stay in the building forever, live there. She would prevent her escape, prevent her getting it straight again, thwart somehow her will to freedom, if she could. The idea in me was of the most fleeting kind, but another time when I came down late at night to get a book from the library antechamber and found her sitting in the hall, alone, the impression left upon me was the reverse of fleeting. I can never forget the vivid, disagreeable effect it produced upon me. What was she doing there at half-past eleven at night, all alone in the darkness? She was sitting upright, stiff, in a big chair below the clock. It gave me a turn. It was so incongruous and odd. She rose quietly as I turned the corner of the stairs and asked me respectfully, her eyes cast down as usual, whether I had finished with the library so that she might lock up. There was no more to it than that, but the picture stayed with me. Unpleasantly. These various impressions came to me at odd moments, of course, and not in a single sequence as I now relate them. I was hard at work before three days were passed, not writing, as explained, but reading, making notes, and gathering material from the library for future use. It was in chance moments that these curious flashes came, catching me unawares with a touch of surprise that sometimes made me start, for they proved that my undermind was still conscious of the shadow, and that far away out of sight lay the cause of it that left me with a vague unrest unsettled, seeking to nest in a place that did not want me. Only when this deeper part knows harmony, perhaps, can good brain work result, and my inability to write was thus explained. Certainly I was always seeking for something here I could not find, an explanation that continually evaded me. Nothing but these trivial hints offered themselves. Lumped together, however, they had the effect of defining the shadow a little. I became more and more aware of its very real existence, and if I had made little mention of Francis and my hostess in this connection, it is because they contributed at first little or nothing towards the discovery of what this story tries to tell. Our life was wholly external, normal, quiet, and uneventful, conversation banal, Mrs. Franklin's conversation in particular. They said nothing that suggested revelation. Both were in this shadow, and both knew that they were in it, but neither betrayed by word or act a hint of interpretation. 
They talked privately, no doubt, but of that I can report no details. And so it was that, after ten days of a very commonplace visit, I found myself looking straight into the face of a strangeness that defied capture at close quarters. There's something here that never happens, were the words that rose in my mind, and that's why none of us can speak of it. And as I looked out of the window and watched the vulgar blackbirds with toes turned in, boring out their worms, I realized sharply that even they, as indeed everything large and small in the house and grounds, shared this strangeness and were twisted out of normal appearance because of it. Life, as expressed in the entire place, was crumpled, dwarfed, emasculated. God's meanings here were crippled. His love of joy was stunted. Nothing in the garden danced or sang. There was hate in it. The shadow, my thought hurried on to completion, is a manifestation of hate, and hate is the devil. And then I sat back frightened in my chair, for I knew that I had partly found the truth. Leaving my books, I went out into the open. The sky was overcast, yet the day by no means gloomy, for a soft, diffused light oozed through the clouds and turned all things warm and almost summery. But I saw the grounds now in their nakedness because I understood. Hate means strife, and the two together weave the robe that terror wears. Having no so-called religious beliefs myself, nor belonging to any set of dogmas called a creed, I could stand outside these feelings and observe. Yet they soaked into me sufficiently for me to grasp sympathetically what others with more cabined souls, I flattered myself, might feel. That picture in the dining room stalked everywhere, hid behind every tree, peered down upon me from the peaked ugliness of the bourgeois towers, and left the impress of its powerful hand upon every bed of flowers. You must not do this, you must not do that, went past me through the air. You must not leave these narrow paths, said the rigid iron railings of black. You shall not walk here, was written on the lawns. Keep to the steps, don't pick the flowers, Make no noise of laughter, singing, dancing, was placarded all over the rose garden, and trespassers will be, not prosecuted, but destroyed, hung from the crest of monkey tree and holly. Guarding the ends of each artificial terrace stood gaunt, implacable policemen, warders, jailers. Come with us, they chanted, or be damned eternally. I remember feeling quite pleased with myself that I had discovered this obvious explanation of the prison feeling the place breathed out, that the posthumous influence of heavy old Samuel Franklin might be an inadequate solution did not occur to me. By getting the place straight again, his widow, of course, meant forgetting the glamour of fear and foreboding his depressing creed had temporarily forced upon her. And Francis, delicately-minded being, did not speak of it because it was the influence of the man her friend had loved. I felt lighter. A load was lifted from me. To trace the unfamiliar to the familiar, came back a sentence I had read somewhere, is to understand. It was a relief. I could talk with Francis now, even with my hostess. No danger of treading clumsily, for the key was in my hands. I might even help to dissipate the shadow, to get it straight again. It seemed perhaps our long invitation was explained. I went into the house laughing, at myself a little, Perhaps, after all, the artist's outlook, with no hard and fast dogmas, is as narrow as the others. How small humanity is, and why is there no possible and true combination of all outlooks? The feeling of unsettling was very strong in me just then, in spite of my big discovery, which was to clear everything up. And at that moment, I ran into Francis on the stairs, with a portfolio of sketches under her arm. It came across me then abruptly that... Although she had worked a great deal since we came, she had shown me nothing. It struck me suddenly as odd, unnatural. The way she tried to pass me now confirmed my newborn suspicion that, well, that her results were hardly what they ought to be. Stand and deliver, I laughed, stepping in front of her. I've seen nothing you've done since you've been here, and as a rule you show me all your things. I believe they are atrocious and degrading. Then my laughter froze. She made a sly gesture to slip past me, and I almost decided to let her go, for the expression that flashed across her face shocked me. She looked uncomfortable and ashamed, 
The color came and went a moment in her cheeks, making me think of a child detected in some secret naughtiness. It was almost fear. It's because they're not finished, then? I said, dropping the tone of banter. Or because they're too good for me to understand? For my criticism of painting, she told me, was crude and ignorant sometimes. But you'll let me see them later, won't you? Frances, however, did not take the way of escape I offered. She changed her mind. She drew the portfolio from beneath her arm instead. You can see them if you really want to, Bill. She said quietly, and her tone reminded me of a nurse who says to a boy just grown out of childhood, You are old enough now to look upon horror and ugliness, only I don't advise it. I do want to, I said, and made to go downstairs with her. But instead, she said in the same low voice as before, Come to my room. We shall be undisturbed there. So I guess that she had been on her way to show the paintings to our hostess, but did not care for us all three to see them together. My mind worked furiously. Mabel asked me to do them, she explained in a tone of submissive horror once the door was shut. In fact, she begged it of me. You know how persistent she is in her quiet way. I had to. She flushed and opened the portfolio on the little table by the window, standing behind me as I turned the sketches over. Sketches of the grounds and trees and garden. In the first moment of inspection, however, I did not take in clearly why my sister's sense of modesty had been offended, for my attention flashed a second elsewhere. Another bit of the puzzle had dropped into place, defining still further the nature of what I call the shadow. Mrs. Franklin, I now remembered, had suggested to me in the library that I might, perhaps, write something about the place, and I had taken it for one of her banal sentences and paid no further attention. I realized now that it was said in earnest. She wanted our interpretations, as expressed in our respective talents, painting and writing. Her invitation was explained. She left us to ourselves on purpose. I should like to tear them up. Frances was whispering behind me with a shudder. Only I promised. She hesitated a moment. Promised not to? I asked with a queer feeling of distress, my eyes glued to the papers. Promised always to show them to her first. She finished so low I barely caught it. I have no intuitive, immediate grasp of the value of paintings. Results come to me slowly, and though everyone believes his own judgment to be good... I dare not claim that mine is worth more than that of any other layman. Francis has too often convicted me of gross ignorance and error. I can only say that I examined these sketches with a feeling of amazement that contained revulsion, if not actually horror and disgust. They were outrageous. I felt hot for my sister, and it was a relief to know she had moved across the room on some pretense or other, and did not examine them with me. Her talent, of course, is mediocre, yet she has her moments of inspiration. Moments, that is to say, when a view of beauty not normally her own flames divinely through her. And these interpretations struck me forcibly as being thus inspired, not her own. They were uncommonly well done. They were also atrocious. The meaning in them, however, was never more than hinted. There the unholy skill and power came in. They suggested so abominably, leaving most to the imagination to find such significance in a bourgeois villa garden, and to interpret it with such delicate yet legible certainty, was a kind of symbolism that was sinister, even diabolical. The delicacy was her own, but the point of view was another's, and the word that rose in my mind was not the gross description of impure, but the more fundamental qualification, unpure. In silence I turned the sketches over one by one, as a boy hurries through the pages of an evil book lest he be caught. What does Mabel do with them? I asked presently in a low tone as I neared the end. Does she keep them? She makes notes about them in a book, and then destroys them, was the reply from the end of the room. I heard a sigh of relief. I'm glad you've seen them, Bill. I wanted you to, but was afraid to show them, you understand? I understand, was my reply, though it was not a question intended to be answered. All I understood really was that Mabel's mind was as sweet and pure as my sister's, and that she had some good reason for what she did. She destroyed the sketches, but first made notes? 
It was an interpretation of the place she sought. Brother-like, I felt resentment, though that Frances should waste her time and talent when she might be doing work that she could sell. Naturally, I felt other things as well. Mabel pays me five guineas for each one, I heard. Absolutely insists. I stared at her stupidly a moment, bereft of speech or wit. I must either accept or go away, she went on calmly but a little white. I've tried everything. There was a scene the third day I was here, when I showed her my first result. I wanted to write you, but hesitated. It's unintentional, then, on your part. Forgive my asking it, Francis, dear. I blundered, hardly knowing what to think or say. Between the lines of her letter came back to me. I mean, you make the sketches in your ordinary way, and the result comes out of itself, so to speak. She nodded, throwing her hands out like a Frenchman. We needn't keep the money for ourselves, Bill. We can give it away, but I must either accept or leave. And she repeated the shrugging gesture. She sat down on the chair facing me, staring helplessly at the carpet. You say there was a scene, I went on presently. She insisted. She begged me to continue, my sister replied very quietly. She thinks that is... She has an idea or a theory that there's something about the place. Something she can't get at quite, Frances stammered badly. She knew I did not encourage her wild theories. Something she feels, yes, I helped her, more than curious. Oh, you know what I mean, Bill, she said desperately. That the place is saturated with some influence that she is herself too positive or too stupid to interpret. She's trying to make herself negative and receptive, as she calls it, but can't, of course, succeed. Haven't you noticed how dull and impersonal and insipid she seems, as though she has no personality? She thinks impressions will come to her that way, but they don't. Naturally. So she's trying me, us, what she calls the sensitive and impressionable artistic temperament. She says that until she is sure exactly what this influence is, she can't fight it, turn it out, get the house straight, as she phrases it. Remembering my own singular impressions, I felt more lenient than I might have otherwise done. I tried to keep impatience out of my voice. And this influence, what, whose is it? We used the pronoun that followed in the same breath, for I answered my own question at the same moment as she did. His. Our heads nodded involuntarily towards the door the dining room being directly underneath. And my heart sank. My curiosity died away on the instant. I felt bored. A commonplace haunted house was the last thing in the world to amuse or interest me. The mere thought, exasperated with its suggestions of imagination, overwrought nerves, hysteria, and the rest, mingled with my other feelings was certainly disappointment. To see a figure or feel a presence and report from day to day strange incidents to each other would be a form of weariness I could never tolerate. But really, Francis, I said firmly after a moment's pause, it's too far-fetched, this explanation. A curse, you know, belongs to the ghost stories of early Victorian days. And only my positive conviction that there was something after all worth discovering, and that it most certainly was not this, prevented my suggesting that we terminate our visit forthwith, or as soon as we decently could. This is not a haunted house, whatever it is, I concluded somewhat vehemently, bringing my hand down upon her odious portfolio. My sister's reply revived my curiosity sharply. I was waiting for you to say that. Mabel says exactly the same. He is in it, but it's something more than that alone, something far bigger and more complicated. Her sentence seemed to indicate the sketches, and though I caught the inference, I did not take it up, having no desire to discuss them with her just then. Indeed, if ever. I merely stared at her and listened. Questions I felt sure would be of little use. It was better she should say her thought in her own way. He is one influence, the most recent, she went on slowly and always very calmly. But there are others deeper layers, as it were, underneath. If his were the only one, something would happen. But nothing ever does happen. 
the others hinder and prevent, as though each were struggling to predominate. I had felt it already myself. The idea was rather horrible. I shivered. That's what is so ugly about it, that nothing ever happens, she said. There is this endless anticipation, always on the dry edge of a result that never materializes. It is torture. Mabel is at her wit's end, you see. And when she begged me, what I felt about my sketches, I mean, she stammered badly as before. I stopped her. I had judged too hastily. That queer symbolism in her paintings, pagan and yet not innocent, was, I understood, the result of mixture. I did not pretend to understand. But at least I could be patient. I consequently held my peace. We did talk on a little longer, but it was more general talk that avoided successfully our hostess, the paintings, wild theories, and him. Until at length, the emotion Francis had hitherto so successfully kept under burst vehemently forth again. It had hidden between her calm sentences, as it had hidden between the lines of her letter. It swept now from head to foot, packed tight in the thing she then said. Then, Bill, if it is not an ordinary haunted house, she asked, what is it? The words were commonplace enough. The emotion was in the tone of her voice that trembled, in the gesture she made, leaning forward and clasping both hands upon her knees, and in the slight blanching of her cheeks as her brave eyes asked the question and searched my own with anxiety that bordered upon panic. In that moment she put herself under my protection. I winced. And why, she added, lowering her voice to a still and furtive whisper, does nothing ever happen? If only, this with great emphasis, something would happen. Break this awful tension. Bring relief. It's the waiting I cannot stand. And she shivered all over as she said it, a touch of wildness in her eyes. I would have given much to have made a true and satisfactory answer. My mind searched frantically for a moment, but in vain. There lay no sufficient answer in me. I felt what she felt, though with differences. No conclusive explanation lay within reach. Nothing happened. Eager as I was to shoot the entire business into the rubbish heap where ignorance and superstition discharge their poisonous weeds, I could not honestly accomplish this. To treat Frances as a child, and merely explain away, would be to strain her confidence in my protection, so affectionately claimed. It would further be dishonest to myself, weak besides, to deny that I had also felt the strain and tension even as she did. While my mind continued searching, I returned her stare in silence, and Frances then, with more honesty and insight than my own, gave suddenly the answer herself, an answer whose truth and adequacy, so far as they went, I could not readily gainsay. I think, Bill, because it is too big to happen here, to happen anywhere indeed all at once, and too awful. To have tossed the sentence aside as nonsense, argued it away, proved that it was really meaningless, would have been easy. At any other time or in any other place, and had the past week brought me none of the vivid impressions it had brought me, this is doubtless what I should have done. My narrowness again was proved. We understand in others only what we have in ourselves, but her explanation, in a measure, I knew was true. It hinted at the strife and struggle that my notion of a shadow had seemed to cover thinly. Perhaps, I murmured lamely, waiting in vain for her to say more. But you said just now that you felt the thing was in layers, as it were. Do you mean each one, each influence, fighting for the upper hand? I used her phraseology to conceal my own poverty. Terminology, after all, was nothing, provided we could reach the idea itself. Her eyes said yes. She had her clear conception, arrived at independently, as was her way. And unlike her sex, she kept it clear, unsmothered by too many words. One set of influence gets at me, another gets at you. It's according to our temperaments, I think. She glanced significantly at the vile portfolio. Sometimes they are mixed, and therefore false. 
There has always been in me, more than in you, the pagan thing, perhaps, though never, thank God, like that. The frank confession, of course, invited my own as it was meant to do, yet it was difficult to find the words. What I have felt in this place, Francis, I honestly can hardly tell you because uh, my impressions have not arranged themselves in any definite form I can describe. The strife, the agony of vainly sought escape, and the unrest, a sort of prison atmosphere. This I have felt at different times and with varying degrees of strength, but I find as yet no final label to attach. I couldn't say pagan, Christian, or anything like that. I mean, as you do. As with the blind and deaf, you may have an intensification of certain senses denied to me, or even another sense altogether in embryo. Perhaps, she stopped me, anxious to keep to the point. You feel it as Mabel does. She feels the whole thing complete. That is also possible, I said very slowly. I was thinking behind my words. Her odd remark that it was big and awful came back upon me as true. A vast sensation of distress and discomfort swept me suddenly. Pity was in it, and a fierce contempt, a savage, bitter anger as well. Fury against some sham authority was part of it. Francis, I said, caught unawares and dropping all pretense, what in the world can it be? I looked hard at her. For some minutes, neither of us spoke. "'Have you felt no desire to interpret it?' she asked presently. "'Mabel did suggest my writing something about the house,' was my reply. "'But I felt nothing imperative. "'That sort of writing is not my line, you know. "'My only feeling,' I added, noticing that she waited for more, "'is the impulse to explain, discover, get it out of me somehow. "'And so get rid of it. Not by writing, though, as yet. And again I repeated my former question. What in the world do you think it is? My voice had become involuntarily hushed. There was awe in it. Her answer, given with slow emphasis, brought back all my reserve. The phraseology provoked me, rather. Whatever it is, Bill, it is not of God. I got up to go downstairs. I believe I shrugged my shoulders. Would you like to leave, Francis? Shall we go back to town? I suggested this at the door, and hearing no immediate reply, I turned back to look. Francis was sitting with her head bowed over and buried in her hands. The attitude horribly suggested tears. No woman, I realized, can keep back the pressure of strong emotion as long as Francis had done without ending in a fluid collapse. I waited a moment uneasily longing to comfort, yet afraid to act, and in this way discovered the existence of the appalling emotion in myself, hitherto but half-guessed. At all costs a scene must be prevented. It would involve such exaggeration and overstatement. Brutally, such is the weakness of the ordinary man, I turned the handle to go out, but my sister then raised her head. The sunlight caught her face, framed untidily in its auburn hair, and I saw her wonderful expression with a start. Pity, tenderness, and sympathy shone in it like a flame. It was undeniable. There shone through all her features the imperishable love and yearning to sacrifice self for others, which I have seen in only one type of human being. It was the great mother look. "'We must stay by Mabel and help her get it straight,' she whispered, making the decision for us both. I murmured agreement. Abashed and half ashamed, I stole softly from the room and went out into the grounds. And the first thing clearly realized when alone was this, that the long scene between us was without definite result. The exchange of confidence was really nothing but hints and vague suggestion. We had decided to stay, but it was a negative decision not to leave rather than a positive action. All of our words and questions, our guesses, inferences, explanations, our most subtle allusions and insinuations, even the odious paintings themselves, were without definite result. Nothing had happened. Chapter 6 And instinctively, once alone, I made for the places where she had painted her extraordinary pictures. 
I tried to see what she had seen. Perhaps now that she had opened my mind to another view, I should be sensitive to some similar interpretation, and possibly by way of literary expression. If I were to write about the place, I asked myself, how should I treat it? I deliberately invited an interpretation in the way that came easiest to me, writing. But in this case, there came no such revelation. Looking closely at the trees and flowers, the bits of lawn and terrace, the rose garden and corner of the house where the flaming creeper hung so thickly, I discovered nothing of the odious, unpure thing her color and grouping had unconsciously revealed. At first, that is, I discovered nothing. The reality stood there, commonplace and ugly, side by side with her distorted version of it that lay in my mind. It seemed incredible. I tried to force it, but in vain. My imagination plowed less deeply than hers, or, to another pattern, grew different seed. Where I saw the gross soul of an overgrown suburban garden, inspired by the spirit of a vulgar rich revivalist who loved to preach damnation, she saw this rush of pagan liberty and joy, the strange license of primitive flesh which, tainted by the other, produced the adulterated vile result. Certain things, however, gradually then became apparent, forcing themselves upon me willy-nilly. They came slowly but overwhelmingly. Not that facts had changed or natural details altered in the grounds. This was impossible. But that I noticed for the first time various aspects I had not noticed before. Trivial enough, yet for me just then significant. Some I remembered from previous days. Others I saw now as I wandered to and fro, uneasy, uncomfortable. Almost, it seemed, watched by someone who took note of my impressions. The details were so foolish, the total result so formidable. I was half aware that others tried hard to make me see. It was deliberate, my sister's phrase, one layer got at me, another gets at you, flashed undesired upon me. For I saw, as with the eyes of a child, what I can only call a goblin garden. House, grounds, trees, and flowers belonged to a goblin world that children enter through the pages of their fairy tales. And what made me first aware of it was the whisper of the wind behind me, so that I turned with a sudden start, feeling that something had moved closer. An old ash tree, ugly and ungainly, had been artificially trained to form an arbor at one end of the terrace that was a tennis lawn, and the leaves of it now went rustling together, swishing as they rose and fell. I looked at the ash tree and felt as though I had passed that moment between doors into this goblin garden that crouched behind the real one. Below, at a deeper layer perhaps, lay hidden the one my sister had entered. To deal with my own, however, I call it goblin, because an odd aspect of the quaint in it, yet never quite achieved the picturesque. Grotesque, probably, is the truer word, for everywhere I noticed, and for the first time, the slight alteration of the natural due, either to the exaggeration of some detail, or to its suppression, generally, I think, to the latter. Life everywhere appeared to me as blocked from the full delivery of its sweet and lovely message. Some counter-influence stopped it suppression, or, sent it awry, exaggeration. The house itself, mere expression, of course, of a narrow, limited mind, was sheer ugliness. It required no further explanation. With the grounds and garden, so far as shape and general plan were concerned, this was also true. But that leaves and flowers and other natural details should share the same deficiency perplexed my logical soul, and even dismayed it. I stood and stared, then moved about, and stood and stared again. Everywhere was this mockery of a sinister, unfinished aspect. I sought in vain to recover my normal point of view. My mind had found this goblin garden and wandered to and fro in it, unable to escape. The change was in myself, of course, and so trivial were the details which illustrated it that they sounded absurd, thus mentioned one by one. For me, they proved it, is all I can affirm. The goblin touch lay plainly everywhere. In the forms of the trees, planted at neat intervals along the lawns, in this twisted ash that rustled just behind me, in the shadow of the gloomy Wellingtonias, whose sweeping skirts obscured the grass, but especially, I noticed, in the tops and crests of them. For here the delicate, graceful curves of last year's growth seemed to shrink back into themselves. None of them pointed upwards. 
Their life had failed and turned aside just when it should have become triumphant. The character of a tree reveals itself chiefly at the extremities, and it was precisely here that they all drooped and achieved this hint of goblin distortion, in the growth, that is, of the last few years. What ought to have been fairy, joyful, natural, was instead uncomely to the verge of the grotesque. Spontaneous expression was arrested. My mind perceived a goblin garden and was caught in it. The place grimaced at me. With the flowers it was similar, though far more difficult to detect in detail for description. I saw the smaller vegetable growth as impish, half-malicious. Even the terraces sloped ill, as though their ends had sagged since they had been so lavishly constructed. Their varying angles gave a queerly bewildering aspect to their sequence that was unpleasant to the eye. One might wander among their deceptive lengths and get lost, lost among open terraces, with the house quite close at hand. Unhomely seemed the entire garden, unable to give repose, restlessness in it everywhere, almost strife and discord, certainly. Moreover, the garden grew into the house, the house into the garden, and in both was this idea of resistance to the natural, the spirit that says no to joy. All over it I was aware of the effort to achieve another end, the struggle to burst forth and escape into free, spontaneous expression that should be happy and natural, yet the effort forever frustrated by the weight of this dark shadow that rendered it abortive. Life crawled aside into a channel that was a cul-de-sac, then turned horribly upon itself. Instead of blossom and fruit, there were weeds. This approach of life I was conscious of. Then, dismal failure. There was no fulfillment. Nothing happened. And so, through this singular mood, I came a little nearer to understand the unpure thing that had stammered out into expression through my sister's talent. For the unpure is merely negative. It has no existence. It is but the cramped expression of what is true, stammering its way brokenly over false boundaries that seek to limit and confine. Great, full expression of anything is pure whereas here was only the incomplete, unfinished, and therefore ugly. There was strife and pain, and desire to escape. I found myself shrinking from house and grounds, as one shrinks from the touch of the mentally arrested, those in whom life has turned awry. There was almost mutilation in it. Past items, too, now flocked to confirm this feeling that I walked, liberty captured and half-maimed in a monstrous garden, I remember days of rain that refreshed the countryside, but left these grounds, cracked with the summer heat, unsatisfied and thirsty. And how big the winds that cleaned the woods and fields everywhere, crawled here with difficulty through the dense foliage that protected the towers from the north and west and east. They were ineffective sluggish currents. There was no real wind. Nothing happened. I began to realize, far more clearly than in my sister's fanciful explanation about layers, that here were many contrary influences at work, mutually destructive of one another. House and grounds were not haunted merely. They were the arena of past thinking and feeling, perhaps of terrible impure beliefs, each striving to suppress the others, yet no one of them achieving supremacy because no one of them was strong enough, no one of them was true. Each, moreover, tried to win me over, though only one was able to reach my mind at all, for some obscure reason, possibly because my temperament had a natural bias towards the grotesque, it was the goblin layer. With me, it was the line of least resistance. In my own thoughts, this goblin garden revealed, of course, merely my personal interpretation. I felt now objectively what long ago my mind had felt subjectively. My work, essential sign of spontaneous life with me, had stopped dead. Production had become impossible. I stood now considerably closer to the cause of this sterility. The cause, rather turned bolder, had stepped insolently nearer. Nothing happened anywhere. House, garden, mind alike were barren, abortive, torn by the strife of frustrate impulse, ugly, hateful, sinful. Yet behind it all was still the desire of life, desire to escape, accomplish. Hope, an intolerable hope, I became startlingly aware crowned torture. And realizing this, 
though in some part of me where reason lost her hold, there rose upon me then another and a darker thing that caught me by the throat and made me shrink with a sense of revulsion that touched actual loathing. I knew instantly whence it came, this wave of abhorrence and disgust, for even while I saw red and felt revolt rise in me, it seemed that I grew partially aware of the layer next below the goblin. I perceived the existence of this deeper stratum. One opened the way for the other, as it were. There were so many, yet all interrelated. To admit one was to clear the way for all. If I lingered, I should be caught. Horribly. They struggled with such violence for supremacy among themselves, however, that this latest uprising was instantly smothered and crushed back. Though not before a glimpse had been revealed to me, and the redness in my thoughts transferred itself to color my surroundings thickly and appallingly with blood. This lurid aspect drenched the garden, smeared the terraces, lent to the very soil a tinge as of sacrificial rites that choked the breath in me. While it seemed to fix me to the earth my feet so longed to leave, it was so revolting that at the same time I felt a dreadful curiosity as of fascination. I wished to stay. Between these contrary impulses I think I actually reeled a moment, transfixed by a fascination of the awful. Through the lighter goblin veil I felt myself sinking down, down, down into this turgid layer that was so much more violent and so much more ancient. The upper layer, indeed, seemed fairy by comparison with this terror born of the lust for blood, thick with the anguish of human sacrificial victims. Upper. Then I was already sinking. My feet were caught. I was actually in it. What atavistic strain hidden deep within me had been touched into vile response, giving this flash of intuitive comprehension? I cannot say. The coatings laid on by civilization are probably thin enough in all of us. I made a supreme effort. The sun and wind came back. I could almost swear I opened my eyes. Something very atrocious surged back into the depths, carrying with it a thought of tangled woods, of big stones standing in a circle, motionless white figures, the one form bound with ropes, and the ghastly gleam of the knife. Like smoke upon a battlefield, it rolled away. I was standing on the gravel path below the second terrace when the familiar goblin garden danced back again. Doubly grotesque now, doubly mocking, yet by way of contrast almost welcome. My glimpse into the depths was momentary, it seems, and had passed utterly away. The common world rushed back with a sense of glad relief, yet ominous now forever, I felt, for the knowledge of what its past had built upon. In street, in theater, in the festivities of friends, in music room or playing field, even indeed in church, how could the memory of what I had seen and felt not leave its hideous trace? The very structure of my thought, it seemed to me, was stained. What has been thought by others can never be obliterated until... With a start, my reverie broke and fled, scattered by a violent sound that I recognized for the first time in my life as wholly desirable. The returning motor meant that my hostess was back. Yet so urgent had been my temporary obsession that my presentation of her was, well, not as I knew her now. Floating along with a face of anguished torture, I saw Mabel, a mere effigy captured by others thinking, pass down into those depths of fire and blood that only just had closed beneath my feet. She dipped away. She vanished. Her fading eyes turned to the last towards some savior who had failed her. And that strange, intolerable hope was in her face. The mystery of the place was pretty thick about me just then. It was the fall of dusk, and the ghost of slanting sunshine was as unreal as though badly painted. The garden stood at attention all about me. I cannot explain it, but I can tell it, I think, exactly as it happened, for it remains vivid in me forever. That... For the first time, something almost happened, myself apparently the combining link through which it pressed towards delivery. I had already turned towards the house, in my mind were pictures, not actual thoughts, of the motor, tea on the veranda, my sister, Mabel, when there came behind me this tumultuous, awful rush as I left the garden. The ugliness, the pain, the striving to escape, the whole negative and suppressed agony that was the place, 
focused that second into a concentrated effort to produce a result. It was a blinding tempest of long, frustrate desire that heaved at me, surging appallingly behind me like an anguished mob. I was in the act of crossing the frontier into my normal self again, when it came, catching fearfully at my skirts. I might use an entire dictionary of descriptive adjectives yet come no nearer to it than this. The conception of a huge assemblage determined to escape with me, or to snatch me back among themselves. My legs trembled for an instant, and I caught my breath. Then turned and ran as fast as possible up the ugly terraces. At the same instant as though the clanging of an iron gate cut short the unfinished phrase, I thought the beginning of an awful thing. The damned. Like this it rushed after me from that goblin garden that had sought to keep me. The damned. For there was sound in it. I know full well it was subjective, not actually heard at all. Yet, somehow, sound was in it. A great volume, roaring and booming thunderously far away and below me. The sentence dipped back into the depths that gave it birth, unfinished. Its completion was prevented. As usual, nothing happened, but it drove behind me like a hurricane as I ran towards the house, and the sound of it I can only liken to those terrible undertones you may hear standing beside Niagara. They lie behind the mere crash of the falling flood, within it somehow, not audible to all, felt rather than definitely heard. It seemed to echo back from the surface of those sagging terraces as I flew across their sloping ends, for it was somehow underneath them. It was in the rustle of the wind that stirred the skirts of the drooping Wellingtonias. The bed of formal flowers passed it on to the creepers, red as blood that crept over the unsightly building. Into the structure of the vulgar and forbidding house it sank away. The towers took it home. The uncomely doors and windows seemed almost like mouths that had uttered the words themselves, and on the upper floors at that very moment I saw two maids in the act of closing them again. And on the veranda, as I arrived breathless and shaken in my soul, Francis and Mabel, standing by the tea-table, looked up to greet me. In the faces of both were clearly legible the signs of shock. They watched me coming, yet so full of their own distress that they hardly noticed the state in which I came. In the face of my hostess, however, I read another and a bigger thing than in the face of Francis. Mabel knew. She had experienced what I had experienced. She had heard that awful sentence I had heard, but heard it not for the first time. Heard it, moreover, I verily believe, complete and to its dreadful end. "'Bill, did you hear that curious noise just now?' Francis asked it sharply before I could say a word. Her manner was confused. She looked straight at me and there was a tremor in her voice she could not hide. "'There's wind about,' I said. "'Wind in the trees and sweeping round the walls. It's risen rather suddenly.' My voice faltered rather. "'No, it wasn't the wind,' she insisted with a significance meant for me alone, but badly hidden. "'It was more like distant thunder,' we thought. "'How you ran, too,' she added. "'What a pace you came across the terraces.' I knew instantly from the way she said it that they had both already heard the sound before and were anxious to know if I had heard it, and how. My interpretation was what they sought. It was a curiously deep sound, I admit. It may have been big guns at sea, I suggested. Forts or cruisers practicing. The coast isn't so very far, and with the wind in the right direction. The expression on Mabel's face stopped me dead. Like huge doors closing, she said softly in her colorless voice. Enormous metal doors, shutting against a mass of people clamoring to get out. The gravity, the note of hopelessness in her tones was shocking. Francis had gone into the house the instant Mabel began to speak. I'm cold, she had said. I think I'll get a shawl. Mabel and I were alone. I believe it was the first time we had been really alone since I arrived. She looked up from the teacups, fixing her pallid eyes on mine. She had made a question of the sentence. "'You hear it like that?' I asked innocently. I purposely used the present tense. She changed her stare from one eye to the other. It was absolutely expressionless. My sister's step sounded on the floor of the room behind us. "'If only—' Mabel began, then stopped, and my own feelings leaping out instinctively completed the sentence I felt was in her mind. 
something would happen. She instantly corrected me. I had caught her thought, yet somehow phrased it wrongly. We could escape, she lowered her tone a little, saying it hurriedly. The we amazed and horrified me, but something in her voice and manner struck me utterly dumb. There was ice and terror in it. It was a dying woman speaking, a lost and hopeless soul. In that atrocious moment, I hardly noticed what was said exactly, but I remember that my sister returned with a great shawl about her shoulders, and that Mabel said in her ordinary voice again, It is chilly, yes, let's have tea inside. And that two maids, one of them the grenadier, speedily carried the loaded trays into the morning room and put a match to the logs in the great open fireplace. It was, after all, foolish to risk the sharp evening air, for dusk was falling steadily, and even the sunshine of the day just... Fading could not turn autumn into summer. I was the last one to come in. Just as I left the veranda, a large blackbird swooped down in front of me past the pillars. It dropped from overhead, swerved abruptly to one side as it caught sight of me, and flapped heavily towards the shrubberies on the left of the terraces, where it disappeared into the gloom. It flew very low, very close, and it startled me, I think because in some way it seemed like my shadow materialized as though the dark horror that was rising everywhere from house and garden, then settling back so thickly yet so imperceptibly upon us all, were incarnated in that whirring creature that passed between the daylight and the coming night. I stood a moment, wondering if it would appear again, before I followed the others indoors, and as I was in the act of closing the windows after me, I caught a glimpse of a figure on the lawn. It was some distance away on the other side of the shrubberies, in fact, where the bird had vanished. But in spite of the twilight that half magnified, half obscured it, the identity was unmistakable. I knew the housekeeper's stiff walk too well to be deceived. Mrs. Marsh taking the air, I said to myself. I felt the necessity of saying it, and I wondered why she was doing so at this particular hour. If I had other thoughts, they were so vague and so quickly and utterly suppressed that I cannot recall them sufficiently to relate them here and once indoors it was to be expected that there would come explanation, discussion, conversation, at any rate, regarding the singular noise and its cause, some uttered evidence of the mood that had been strong enough to drive us all inside. Yet there was none. Each of us purposely, and with various skill, ignored it. We talked little, and when we did it was of anything in the world but that. Personally, I experienced a touch of that same bewilderment which had come over me during my first talk with Francis on the evening of my arrival, for I recall now the acute tension and the hope, yet dread, that one or other of us must sooner or later introduce the subject. It did not happen, however. No reference was made to it even remotely. It was the presence of Mabel, I felt positive, that prohibited. As soon might we have discussed death in the bedroom of a dying woman— the only scrap of conversation I remember, where all was ordinary and commonplace, was when Mabel spoke casually to the grenadier, asking why Mrs. Marsh had omitted to do something or other, what it was I forget, and that the maid replied respectfully that Mrs. Marsh was very sorry, but her hand still pained her. I inquired, though so casually that I scarcely know what prompted the words, whether she had injured herself severely, and the reply, she upset a lamp and burnt herself was said in a tone that made me feel my curiosity was indiscreet. But she always has an excuse for not doing things she ought to do. The little bit of conversation remained with me, and I remember particularly the quick way Francis interrupted and turned the talk upon the delinquencies of servants in general, telling incidents of her own at our flat with a volubility that perhaps seemed forced, and that certainly did not encourage general talk as it may have been intended to do. We lapsed into silence immediately she finished. But for all our care and all our calculated silence, each knew that something had, in these last moments, come very close. It had brushed us in passing. It had retired. And I am inclined to think now that the large dark thing I saw riding the dusk, probably bird of prey, was in some sense a symbol of it in my mind. That actually there had been no bird at all, I mean, but that my mood of apprehension and dismay had formed the vivid picture in my thoughts. It had swept past us, it had retreated, but it was now at this moment in hiding very close, and it was watching us. Perhaps, too, it was mere coincidence that I encountered Mrs. Marsh, his housekeeper, 
several times that evening in the short interval between tea and dinner, and that on each occasion the sight of this gaunt, half-saturnine woman fed my prejudice against her. Once on my way to the telephone, I ran into her just where the passage is somewhat jammed by a square table carrying the Chinese gong, a grandfather's clock, and a box of croquet mallets. We both gave way, then both advanced, then again gave way, simultaneously. It seemed impossible to pass. We stepped with decision to the same side, finally colliding in the middle while saying those futile little things, half apology, half excuse, that are inevitable at such times. In the end, she stood upright against the wall for me to pass, taking her place against the very door I wished to open. It was ludicrous. Excuse me, I was just going in to telephone, I explained, and she sidled off, murmuring apologies, but opening the door for me while she did so. Our hands met a moment on the handle. There was a second's awkwardness. It was so stupid. I remember her injury, and by way of something to say, I inquired after it. She thanked me. It was entirely healed now, but it might have been much worse, and there was something about the mercy of the Lord that I didn't quite catch. While telephoning, however, a London call and my attention focused on it, I realized sharply that this was the first time I had spoken with her, also that I had touched her. It happened to be a Sunday, and the lines were clear. I got my connection quickly, and the incident was forgotten while my thoughts went up to London. On my way upstairs, then, the woman came back into my mind so that I recalled other things about her. How she seemed all over the house, in unlikely places often. How I had caught her sitting in the hall alone that night. How she was forever coming and going with her lugubrious visage, and that untidy hair at the back that had made me laugh three years ago with the idea that it looked singed or burnt. And how the impression on my first arrival at the Towers was that this woman somehow kept alive, though its evidence was outwardly suppressed, the influence of her late employer and of his somber teachings. Somewhere with her was associated the idea of punishment, vindictiveness, revenge. I remembered again suddenly my odd notion that she sought to keep her present mistress here, a prisoner in this bleak and comfortless house, and that really, in spite of her obsequious silence, she was intensely opposed to the change of thought that had reclaimed Mabel to a happier view of life. All this in a passing second flashed in review before me and I discovered, or at any rate reconstructed, the real Mrs. Marsh. She was decidedly in the shadow. More, she stood in the forefront of it, stealthily leading an assault, as it were, against the towers and its occupants, as though consciously or unconsciously she labored incessantly to this hateful end. I can only judge that some state of nervousness in me permitted the series of insignificant thoughts to assume this dramatic shape and that what had gone before prepared the way and led her up the head of so formidable a procession. I related exactly as it came to me. My nerves were doubtless somewhat on edge by now. Otherwise, I should hardly have been a prey to the exaggeration at all. I seemed open to so many strange impressions. Nothing else, perhaps, can explain my ridiculous conversation with her when, for the third time that evening, I came suddenly upon the woman, halfway down the stairs, standing by an open window as if in the act of listening. She was dressed in black, a black shawl over her square shoulders and black gloves on her big broad hands. Two black objects, prayer books apparently, she clasped, and on her head she wore a bonnet with shaking beads of jet. At first I did not know her as I came running down upon her from the landing. It was only when she stood aside to let me pass that I saw her profile against the tapestry and recognized Mrs. Marsh, and to catch her on the front stairs, dressed like this, struck me as incongruous, impertinent. I paused in my dangerous descent. Through the opened window came the sound of bells, church bells, a sound more depressing to me than superstition, and as nauseating. Though the action was ill-judged, I obeyed the sudden prompting. Was it a secret desire to attack, perhaps? And spoke to her. Been to church, I suppose, Mrs. Marsh? I replied. Or just going, perhaps? Her face, as she looked up a second to reply, was like an iron doll that moved its lips and turned its eyes, but made no other imitation of life at all. "'Some of us still goes, sir,' she said unctuously. It was respectful enough, yet the implied judgment of the rest of the world made me almost angry. A deferential insolence lay behind the affected meekness. "'For those who believe, no doubt it is helpful,' I smiled. "'True religion brings peace and happiness, I'm sure. Joy, Mrs. Marsh, joy!' I found keen satisfaction in the emphasis. 
She looked at me like a knife. I cannot describe the implacable thing that shone in her fixed, stern eyes, nor the shadow of felt darkness that stole across her face. She glittered. I felt hate in her. I knew. She knew, too, who was in the thoughts of us both at that moment. She replied softly, never forgetting her place for an instant. There is joy, sir, in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, and in church there goes up prayer to God for those who, well, for the others, sir, who... She cut short her sentence thus. The gloom about her, as she said it, was like the gloom about a hearse, a tomb, a darkness of great hopeless dungeons. My tongue ran on of itself with a kind of bitter satisfaction. We must believe there are no others, Mrs. Marsh. Salvation, you know, would be such a failure if there were. No merciful, all-foreseeing God could ever have devised such a fearful plan. Her voice, interrupting me, seemed to rise out of the bowels of the earth. They rejected this salvation when it was offered to them, sir, on earth. But you wouldn't have them tortured forever because of one mistaken ignorance, I said, fixing her with my eye. Come now, would you, Mrs. Marsh? No god worth worshipping could permit such cruelty. Think a moment what it means. She stared at me, a curious expression in her stupid eyes. It seemed to me as though the woman in her revolted, while yet she dared not suffer her grim belief to trip. That is, she would willingly have had it otherwise, but for a terror that prevented. We may pray for them, sir, and we do. We may hope. She dropped her eyes to the carpet. Good, good, I put in cheerfully, sorry now that I had spoken at all. That's more hopeful at any rate, isn't it? She murmured something about Abraham's bosom and the time of salvation not being forever as I tried to pass her. Then a half-gesture that she made stopped me. There was something more she wished to say, to ask. She looked up furtively. In her eyes I saw the woman peering out through fear. Perhaps, sir, she faltered as though lightning must strike her dead. Perhaps, would you think, a drop of cold water given in his name might moisten but I stopped her, for the foolish talk had lasted long enough. "'Of course!' I exclaimed. "'Of course! For God is love, remember, and love means charity, tolerance, sympathy, and sparing others pain.' And I hurried past her, determined to end the outrageous conversation for which yet I knew myself entirely to blame. Behind me she stood stock still for several minutes, half bewildered, half alarmed, as I suspected. I caught the fragment of another sentence, one word of it, rather, punishment but the rest escaped me. Her arrogance and condescending tolerance exasperated me, while I was at the same time secretly pleased that I might have touched some string of remorse or sympathy in her after all. Her belief was iron. She dared not let it go. Yet somewhere underneath there lurked the germ of a wholesome revulsion. She would help them if she dared. Her question proved it. Half ashamed of myself, I turned and crossed the hall quickly, lest I should be tempted to say more, and in me was a disagreeable sensation as though I had just left the incurable ward of some great hospital. A reaction caught me as of nausea. Ugh, I wanted such people cleansed by fire. They seemed to me as centers of contamination whose vicious thoughts flowed out to stain God's glorious world. I saw myself, Francis, Mabel, too, especially, on the rack, while that odious figure of cruelty and darkness stood over us, and ordered the awful handles turned in order that we might be saved, forced, that is, to think and believe exactly as she thought and believed. I found relief for my somewhat childish indignation by letting myself loose upon the organ then. The flood of Bach and Beethoven brought back the sense of proportion. It proved, however, at the same time that there had been this growth of distortion in me, and that it had been provided apparently by my closer contact for the first time with that funereal personality, the woman who, like her master, believed that all holding views of God that differed from her own must be damned eternally. It gave me, moreover, some faint clue, perhaps, though a clue I was unequal to following up, to the nature of the strife and terror and frustrate influence in the house. That housekeeper had to do with it. She kept it alive. Her thought was like a spell she waved above her mistress's head. End of section 6. Section 7 of Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. The Damned, Chapter 7 That night I was wakened by a hurried tapping at my door, and before I could answer, Frances stood beside my bed. She had switched on the light as she came in. Her hair fell straggling over her dressing gown. Her face was deathly pale, its expression so distraught it was almost haggard. The eyes were very wide. She looked almost like another woman. She was whispering at a great pace. Bill, Bill, wake up, quick. I am awake. What is it? I whispered, too. I was startled. Listen, was all she said. Her eyes stared into vacancy. There was not a sound in the great house. The wind had dropped, and all was still. Only the tapping seemed to continue endlessly in my brain. The clock on the mantelpiece pointed to half-past two. I heard nothing, Francis. What is it? I rubbed my eyes. I had been very deeply asleep. Listen, she repeated very softly, holding up one finger and turning her eyes towards the door she had left ajar. Her usual calmness had deserted her. She was in the grip of some distressing terror. For a full minute we held our breath and listened. Then her eyes rolled round again and met my own, and her skin went even whiter than before. It woke me, she said beneath her breath and moving a step nearer to my bed. It was the noise. Even her whisper trembled. The noise. The word repeated itself dully of its own accord. I would rather it had been anything in the world but that. Earthquake, foreign cannon, collapse of the house above our heads. The noise, Francis? Are you sure? I was playing really for a little time. It was like thunder. At first I thought it was thunder, but a minute later it came again, from underground. It's appalling. She muttered the words, her voice not properly under control. There was a pause of perhaps a minute, and then we both spoke at once. We said foolish, obvious things that neither of us believed in for a second. The roof had fallen in. There were burglars downstairs. The safes had been blown open. It was to comfort each other, as children do, that we said these things. Also, it was to gain further time. There's someone in the house, of course. I heard my voice say finally as I sprang out of bed and hurried into a dressing gown and slippers. Don't be alarmed, I'll go down and see. And from the drawer I took a pistol. It was my habit to carry everywhere with me. I loaded it carefully while Francis stood stock still beside the bed and watched. I moved towards the open door. You stay here, Francis. I whispered, the beating of my heart making the words uneven. While I go down and make a search. Lock yourself in, girl. Nothing can happen to you. It was downstairs, you said? Underneath, she answered faintly, pointing through the floor. She moved suddenly between me and the door. Listen, hark, she said, the eyes in her face quite fixed. It's coming again. And she turned her head to catch the slightest sound. I stood there watching her and while I watched her, shook. But nothing stirred. From the halls below rose only the whir and quiet ticking of the numerous clocks. The blind by the open window behind us flapped out a little into the room as the draft caught in. I'll come with you, Bill, to the next floor. She broke the silence. Then I'll stay with Mabel till you come up again. The blind sank down with a long sigh as she said it. The question jumped to my lips before I could repress it. Mabel is awake. She heard it, too? I hardly know why horror caught me at her answer. All was so vague and terrible as we stood there playing the great game of this sinister house where nothing ever happened. We met in the passage. She was on her way to me. What shook in me shook inwardly. Francis, I mean, did not see it. I had the feeling just then that the noise was upon us, that any second it would boom and roar about our ears, but the deep silence held. I only heard my sister's little whisper coming across the room in answer to my question. Then what is Mabel doing now? And her reply proved that she was yielding at last beneath the dreadful tension. For she spoke at once, unable longer to keep up the pretense. With a kind of relief, as it were, she said it out, looking helplessly at me like a child. She is weeping and not... My expression must have stopped her. I believe I clapped both hands upon her mouth, though when I realized things clearly again I found they were covering my own ears instead. It was a moment of unutterable horror. 
The revulsion I felt was actually physical. It would have given me pleasure to fire off all the five chambers of my pistol into the air above my head. The sound, a definite, wholesome sound that explained itself, would have been a positive relief. Other feelings, though, were in me too, all over me, rushing to and fro. It was vain to seek their disentanglement. It was impossible. I confess that I experienced, among them, a touch of paralyzing fear, though for a moment only. It passed as sharply as it came, leaving me with a violent flush of blood to the face, such as bursts of anger bring, followed abruptly by an icy perspiration over the entire body. Yet I may honestly avow that it was not ordinary personal fear I felt, nor any common dread of physical injury. It was rather a vast, impersonal shrinking, a sympathetic shrinking, from the agony and terror that countless others somewhere somehow felt for themselves. The first sensation of a prison overwhelmed me in that instant, of bitter strife and frenzied suffering, and the fiery torture of the yearning to escape that was yet hopelessly uttered. It was of incredible power. It was real. The vain, intolerable hope swept over me. I mastered myself, though hardly knowing how, and took my sister's hand. It was as cold as ice, as I led her firmly to the door and out into the passage. Apparently she noticed nothing of my so near collapse, for I caught her whisper as we went. You are brave, Bill. Splendidly brave. The upper corridors of the great sleeping house were brightly lit. On her way to me she had turned on every electric switch her hand could reach. And as we passed the final flight of stairs to the floor below, I heard a door shut softly, and knew that Mabel had been listening, waiting for us. I led my sister up to it. She knocked, and the door was opened cautiously an inch or so. The room was pitch black. I caught no glimpse of Mabel standing there. Francis turned to me with a hurried whisper. Billy, you will be careful, won't you? And went in. I just had time to answer that I would not be long, and Francis to reply, You'll find us here, when the door closed and cut her sentence short before its end. But it was not alone the closing door that took the final words. Francis, by the way she disappeared, I knew it, had made a swift and violent movement into the darkness that was as though she sprang. She leaped upon that other woman who stood back among the shadows, for simultaneously with the clipping of the sentence, another sound was also stopped, stifled, smothered, choked back lest I should also hear it, yet not in time. I heard it, a hard and horrible sound that explained both the leap and the abrupt cessation of the whispered words. I stood irresolute a moment. It was as though all the bones had been withdrawn from my body so that I must sink and fall. That sound plucked them out, and plucked out my self-possession with them. I am not sure that it was a sound I had ever heard before, though children, I half remembered, made it sometimes in blind rages when they knew not what they did. In a grown-up person, certainly I had never known it. I associated it with animals, rather. Horribly. In the history of the world, no doubt, it has been common enough, alas, but fortunately today there can be but few who know it, or would recognize it even when heard. The bones shot back into my body the same instant, but red-hot and burning. The brief instant of irresolution passed. I was torn between the desire to break down the door and enter, and to run. Run for my life, from a thing I dared not face. Out of the horrid tumult, then, I adopted neither course. Without reflection, certainly, without analysis of what was best to do for my sister, myself, or Mabel, I took up my action where it had been interrupted. I turned from the awful door and moved slowly towards the head of the stairs, but that dreadful little sound came with me. I believe my own teeth chattered. It seemed all over the house, in the empty halls that opened into the long passages towards the music room, and even in the grounds outside the building. From the lawns and barren garden, from the ugly terraces themselves, it rose into the night, and behind it came a curious driving sound, incomplete, unfinished, as of wailing for deliverance. The wailing of desperate souls in anguish, the dull and dry beseeching of hopeless spirits in prison. That I could have taken the little sound from the bedroom where I actually heard it, and spread it thus over the entire house and grounds, is evidence, perhaps, of the state my nerves were in. 
The wailing, assuredly, was in my mind alone. But the longer I hesitated, the more difficult became my task, and, gathering up my dressing gown lest I should trip in the darkness, I passed slowly down the staircase into the hall below. I carried neither candle nor matches. Every switch in room and corridor was known to me. The covering of darkness was indeed rather comforting than otherwise, for it prevented seeing, it also prevented being seen. The heavy pistol, knocking against my thigh as I moved, made me feel I was carrying a child's toy foolishly. I experienced in every nerve that primitive vast dread which is the thrill of darkness. Merely the child in me was comforted by that pistol. The night was not entirely black. The iron bars across the glass front door were visible, and equally I discerned the big stiff wooden chairs in the hall, the gaping fireplace, the upright pillars supporting the staircase, the round table in the center with its books and flower vases, and the basket that held visitors' cards. There, too, was the stick and umbrella stand and the shelf with railway guides, directory, and telegraph forms. Clocks ticked everywhere with sounds like quiet footfalls. Light fell here and there in patches from the floor above. I stood a moment in the hall, letting my eyes grow more accustomed to the gloom, while deciding on a plan of search. I made out the ivy trailing outside over one of the big windows. And then the tall clock by the front door made a grating noise deep down inside its body. It was the presentation clock, large and hideous, given by the congregation of his church, and, dreading the booming strike it seemed to threaten, I made a quick decision. If others beside myself were about in the night, the sound of that striking might cover their approach. So I tiptoed to the right, where the passage led towards the dining room, and the other direction were the morning and drawing room, both little used, and various other rooms beyond that had been his, generally now kept locked. I thought of my sister waiting upstairs with that frightened woman for my return. I went quickly, yet stealthily. And to my surprise, the door of the dining room was open. It had been opened. I paused on the threshold, staring about me. I think I fully expected to see a figure blocked in the shadows against the heavy sideboard, or looming on the other side beneath his portrait. But the room was empty. I felt it empty. Through the wide bow windows that gave on to the veranda came an uncertain glimmer that even shone reflected in the polished surface of the dinner table. And again I perceived the stiff outline of chairs, waiting tenantless all round it, two large ones with high carved backs at either end. The monkey trees on the upper terrace, too, were visible outside against the sky, and the solemn crests of the Wellingtonias on the terraces below. The enormous clock on the mantelpiece ticked very slowly, as though its machinery were running down, and I made out the pale round patch that was its face. Resisting my first inclination to turn the lights up, my hand had gone so far as to finger the friendly knob, I crossed the room so carefully that no single board creaked, nor a single chair as I rested a hand upon its back moved on the parquet flooring. I turned neither to the right nor left, nor did I once look back. I went towards the long corridor, filled with priceless object dot that led through various antechambers into the spacious music room. And only at the mouth of this corridor did I next halt a moment in uncertainty. For this long corridor, lit faintly by high windows on the left from the veranda, was very narrow, owing to the massive shelves and fancy tables it contained. It was not that I feared to knock over precious things as I went, but that, because of its ungenerous width, there would be no room to pass another person, if I met one. And the certainty had suddenly come upon me that somewhere in this corridor, another person at this actual moment stood. Here somehow, amid all this dead atmosphere of furniture and impersonal emptiness, lay the hint of a living human presence, and with such conviction did it come upon me that my hand instinctively gripped the pistol in my pocket before I could even think. Either someone had passed along this corridor just before me, or someone lay waiting at its farther end, withdrawn or flattened into one of the little recesses to let me pass. It was the person who had opened the door, and the blood ran from my heart as I realized it. It was not courage that sent me on, but rather a strong impulsion from behind, that made it impossible to retreat, the feeling that a throng pressed at my back, drawing nearer and nearer, that I was already half-surrounded, 
swept, dragged, coaxed into a vast prison house, where there was wailing and gnashing of teeth, where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. I could neither explain nor justify the storm of irrational emotion that swept me as I stood in that moment, staring down the length of the silent corridor towards the music room at the far end. I can only repeat that no personal bravery sent me down it, but that the negative emotion of fear was swamped in this vast sea of pity and commiseration for others that surged upon me. My senses, at least, were no whit confused. If anything, my brain registered impressions with keener accuracy than usual. I noticed, for instance, that the two swinging doors of bays that cut the corridor into definite lengths, making little rooms of the spaces between them, were both wide open. In the dim light, no mean achievement. Also, the fronds of a palm plant, some ten feet in front of me, still stirred gently from the air of someone who had recently gone past them. The long green leaves waved to and fro like hands. Then I went stealthily forward down the narrow space, proud even that I had this command of myself, and so carefully that my feet made no sound upon the Japanese matting on the floor. It was a journey that seemed timeless. I have no idea how fast or slow I went, but I remember that I deliberately examined articles on each side of me, peering with particular closeness into the recesses of wall and window. I passed the first baize doors, and the passage beyond them widened out to hold shelves of books. There were sofas and small reading tables against the wall. It narrowed again presently as I entered the second stretch. The windows here were higher and smaller, and marble statuettes of classical subjects lined the walls, watching me like figures of the dead. Their white and shining faces saw me, yet made no sign. I passed next between the second bay's doors. They too had been fastened back with hooks against the wall. Thus all doors were open, had been recently opened. And so at length I found myself in the final widening of the corridor which formed an antechamber to the music room itself. It had been used formerly to hold the overflow of meetings. No door separated it from the great hall beyond, but heavy curtains hung usually to close it off, and these curtains were invariably drawn. They now stood wide, and here I can merely state the impression that came upon me. I knew myself at last surrounded. The throng that pressed behind me also surged in front, facing me in the big room and waiting for my entry stood a multitude. On either side of me, in the very air above my head, the vast assemblage paused upon my coming. The pause, however, was momentary. For instantly the deep, tumultuous movement was resumed that yet was silent as a cavern underground. I felt the agony that was in it, the passionate striving, the awful struggle to escape. The semi-darkness held beseeching faces that fought to press themselves upon my vision, yearning yet hopeless eyes, lips scorched and dry, mouths that opened to implore but found no craved delivery in actual words and a fury of misery and hate that made the life in me stop dead, frozen by the horror of vain pity. That intolerable, vain hope was everywhere. And the multitude it came to me was not a single multitude, but many. For as soon as one huge division pressed too close upon the edge of escape, it was dragged back by another and prevented. The wild host was divided against itself. Here dwelt the shadow I had imagined weeks ago, and in it struggled armies of lost souls, as in the depths of some bottomless pit whence there was no escape. The layers mingled, fighting against themselves in endless torture. It was in this great shadow I had clairvoyantly seen Mabel, but about its fearful mouth I now was certain, hovered another figure of darkness, a figure who sought to keep it in existence, since to her thought were due those lampless deaths of woe without escape. Towards me the multitudes now surged. It was a sound and a movement that brought me back into myself. The great clock at the farther end of the room just then struck the hour of three. That was the sound. And the movement? I was aware that a figure was passing across the distant center of the floor. Instantly I dropped back into the arena of my little human terror. My hand again clutched stupidly at the pistol butt. I drew back into the folds of the heavy curtain, and the figure advanced. I remember every detail. At first it seemed to me enormous, this advancing shadow, far beyond human scale. But as it came nearer, I measured it, though not consciously, 
by the organ pipes that gleamed in faint colors just above its gradual soft approach. It passed them, already halfway across the great room. I saw then that its stature was that of ordinary men. The prolonged booming of the clock died away. I heard the footfall, shuffling upon the polished boards. I heard another sound, a voice, low and monotonous, droning as in prayer. The figure was speaking. It was a woman. And she carried in both hands before her a small object that faintly shimmered. A glass of water. And then I recognized her. There was still an instant's time before she reached me, and I made use of it. I shrank back, flattening myself against the wall. Her voice ceased a moment as she turned and carefully drew the curtains together behind her, closing them with one hand. Oblivious of my presence, though she actually touched my dressing gown with the hand that pulled the cords, she resumed her dreadful, solemn march, disappearing at length down the long vista of the corridor like a shadow. But as she passed me, her voice began again, so that I heard each word distinctly as she uttered it, her head aloft, her figure upright, as though she moved at the head of a procession. A drop of cold water, given in his name, shall moisten the burning tongues. It was repeated monotonously over and over again, droning down into the distance as she went, until at length both voice and figure faded into the shadows at the farther end. For a time, I have no means of measuring precisely, I stood in that dark corner, pressing my back against the wall, and would have drawn the curtains down to hide me had I dared to stretch an arm out. The dread that presently the woman would return passed gradually away. I realized that the air had emptied. The crowd her presence had stirred into activity had retreated. I was alone in the gloomy underspaces of the odious building. Then I remembered suddenly again the terrified women waiting for me on that upper landing, and realized that my skin was wet and freezing cold after a profuse perspiration. I prepared to retrace my steps. I remember the effort it cost me to leave the support of the wall and the covering darkness of my corner and step out into the gray light of the corridor. At first I sidled, then, finding this mode of walking impossible, turned my face boldly and walked quickly, regardless that my dressing gown set the precious object shaking as I passed. A wind that sighed mournfully against the high, small windows seemed to have got inside the corridor as well. It felt so cold and every moment I dreaded to see the outline of the woman's figure as she waited in recess or angle against the wall for me to pass. Was there another thing I dreaded even more? I cannot say. I only know that the first bay's doors had swung to behind me, and the second ones were close at hand, when the great dim thunder caught me, pouring up with prodigious volume so that it seemed to roll out from another world. It shook the very bowels of the building. I was closer to it than the other time when it had followed me from the goblin garden. There was strength and hardness in it, as of metal reverberation. Some touch of numbness, almost of paralysis, must surely have been upon me that I felt no actual terror, for I remember even turning and standing still to hear it better. That is the noise, my thought ran stupidly, and I think I whispered it aloud. The doors are closing. The wind outside against the windows was audible, so it cannot have been really loud, yet to me it was the biggest, deepest sound I had ever heard. But so far away, with such awful remoteness in it, that I had to doubt my own ears at the same time. It seemed underground, the rumbling of earth gates that shut remorselessly within the rocky earth. Stupendous, ultimate thunder. They were shut off from help again. The doors had closed. I felt a storm of pity, an agony of bitter, futile hate, sweep through me. My memory of the figure changed then. The woman with the glass of cooling water had stepped down from heaven. But the man, or was it men, who smeared this terrible layer of belief and thought upon the world. I crossed the dining room. It was fancy, of course, that held my eyes from glancing at the portrait for fear I should see its smiling approval and so finally reached the hall, where the light from the floor above seemed now quite bright in comparison. All the doors I closed carefully behind me, but first I had to open them. The woman had closed every one. Up the stairs, then, I actually ran, two steps at a time. My sister was standing outside Mabel's door. By her face I knew that she had also heard. There was no need to ask. 
I quickly made my mind up. There's nothing, I said, and detailed briefly my tour of search. All is quiet and undisturbed downstairs. May God forgive me. She beckoned to me, closing the door softly behind her. My heart beat violently a moment, then stood still. Mabel, she said aloud. It was like the sentence of a judge, that one short word. I tried to push past her and go in, but she stopped me with her arm. She was wholly mistress of herself, I saw. Hush, she said in a lower voice. I've got her round again with Brandy. She's sleeping quietly now. We won't disturb her. She drew me farther out into the landing, and as she did so, the clock in the hall below struck half past three. I had stood then, thirty minutes in the corridor below. You've been such a long time, she said simply. I feared for you. And she took my hand in her own that was cold and clammy. Chapter 8 And then, while that dreadful house stood listening about us in the early hours of this chill morning upon the edge of winter, she told me, with laconic brevity, things about Mabel that I had heard as from a distance. There was nothing so unusual or tremendous in the short recital. Nothing, indeed, I might not have already guessed for myself. It was the time and scene, the inference, too, that made it so afflicting. The idea that Mabel believed herself so utterly and hopelessly lost, beyond recovery, damned. That she had loved him with so passionate a devotion that she had given her soul into his keeping, this certainly I had not divined. Probably because I had never thought about it one way or the other. He had converted her, I knew, but that she had subscribed wholeheartedly to that most cruel and ugly of his dogmas. This was new to me and came with a certain shock as I heard it. In love, of course, the weaker nature is receptive to all manner of suggestion. This man had suggested his pet brimstone lake so vividly that she had listened and believed. He had frightened her into heaven, and his heaven, a definite locality in the skies, had its foretaste here on earth in miniature, the towers, house, and garden. Into his Dolores scheme of a handful of saved and millions damned, his enclosure, as it were, of sheep and goats, he had swept her before she was aware of it. Her mind no longer was her own, and it was Mrs. Marsh who kept the thought stream open, though tempered, as she deemed, with that touch of craven, superstitious mercy. But what I found it difficult to understand, and still more difficult to accept, was that during her year abroad she had been so haunted with a secret dread of that hideous after-death that she had finally revolted and tried to recover that clearer state of mind she had enjoyed before the religious bully had stunned her, yet had tried in vain. She had returned to the towers to find her soul again, only to realize that it was lost eternally. The cleaner state of mind lay then beyond recovery. In the reaction that followed the removal of his terrible suggestion, she felt the crumbling of all that he had taught her, but searched in vain for the peace and beauty his teachings had destroyed. Nothing came to replace these. She was empty, desolate, hopeless, craving her former joy and carelessness. She found only hate and diabolical calculation. This man, whom she had loved to the point of losing her soul for him, had bequeathed to her one black and fiery thing, the terror of the damned. His thinking wrapped her in this iron garment that held her fast. All this Francis told me, far more briefly than I have here repeated it, in her eyes and gestures and laconic sentences lay the conviction of great beating issues and of menacing drama my own description fails to recapture. It was all so incongruous and remote from the world I lived in that, more than once, a smile, though a smile of pity, fluttered to my lips, but a glimpse of my face in the mirror showed rather the leer of a grimace. There was no real laughter anywhere that night. The entire adventure seemed so incredible here in this twentieth century. But yet delusion, that feeble word, did not occur once in the comments my mind suggested, though did not utter. I remembered that forbidding shadow, too. My sister's watercolors. The vanished personality of our hostess. The inexplicable thundering noise. And the figure of Mrs. Marsh and her midnight ritual that was so childish, yet so horrible. I shivered in spite of my own emancipated cast of mind. There is no Mabel, 
were the words with which my sister sent another shower of ice down my spine. He has killed her in his lake of fire and brimstone. I stared at her blankly, as in a nightmare where nothing true or possible ever happened. He killed her in his lake of fire and brimstone, she repeated more faintly. A desperate effort was in me to say the strong, sensible thing, which should destroy the oppressive horror that grew so stiflingly about us both. But again the mirror drew the attempted smile into the merest grin, betraying the distortion that was everywhere in the place. You mean, I stammered beneath my breath, that her faith has gone, but that the terror has remained. I asked it, dully groping. I moved out of the line of the reflection in the glass. She bowed her head as though beneath a weight. Her skin was the pallor of gray ashes. You mean, I said louder, that she has lost her mind. She is terror incarnate, was the whispered answer. Mabel has lost her soul. Her soul is there. She pointed horribly below. She is seeking it? The word soul stung me into something of my normal self again. But her terror, poor thing, is not, cannot be, transferable to us, I exclaimed more vehemently. It certainly is not convertible into feelings, sights, and even sounds. She interrupted me quickly, almost impatiently, speaking with that conviction by which she conquered me so easily that night. It is her terror that has revived the others. It has brought her into touch with them. They are loose and driving after her. Her efforts at resistance have given them also hope that escape, after all, is possible. Day and night they strive. Escape? Others? The anger fast rising in me dropped of its own accord at the moment of birth. It shrank into a shuddering beyond my control. In that moment, I think I would have believed in the possibility of anything and everything she might tell me. To argue or contradict seemed equally futile. His strong belief, as also the beliefs of others who have preceded him, she replied, so sure of herself that I actually turned to look over my shoulder, have left their shadow like a thick deposit over the house and grounds. To them, poor souls imprisoned by thought, it was hopeless as granite walls, until her resistance, her effort to dissipate it, let in light. Now in their thousands they are flocking to this little light, seeking escape. Her own escape, don't you see, may release them all. It took my breath away. Had his predecessors, former occupants of this house, also preached damnation of all the world but their own exclusive sect? Was this the explanation of her obscure talk of layers, each striving against the other for domination? And if men are spirits, and these spirits survive, could strong thought thus determine their condition even afterwards? So many questions flooded into me that I selected no one of them, but stared in uncomfortable silence, bewildered out of my depth, and acutely, painfully distressed. There was so odd a mixture of possible truth and incredible, unacceptable explanation in it all, so much confirmed, yet so much left darker than before. What she said did indeed offer a quasi-interpretation of my own series of abominable sensations, strife, agony, pity, hate, escape, but so far-fetched that only the deep conviction in her voice and attitude made it tolerable for a second even. I found myself in a curious state of mind. I could neither think clearly nor say a word to refute her amazing statements. Whispered there beside me in the shivered hours of early morning, with only a wall between ourselves and... Mabel. Close behind her words, I remember this singular thing, however, that an atmosphere as of the Inquisition seemed to rise and stir about the room, beating awful wings of black above my head. Abruptly, then, a moment's common sense returned to me. I faced her. And the noise, I said aloud more firmly. The roar of the closing doors? We have all heard that. Is that subjective, too? Frances looked sideways about her in a queer fashion that made my flesh creep again. I spoke brusquely, almost angrily. I repeated the question and waited with anxiety for her reply. "'What noise?' she asked, 
with the frank expression of an innocent child. What closing doors? But her face turned from gray to white, and I saw that drops of perspiration glistened on her forehead. She caught at the back of a chair to steady herself, then glanced about her again with that sidelong look that made my blood run cold. I understood suddenly then. She did not take in what I said. I knew now she was listening for something else. And the discovery revived in me a far stronger emotion than any mere desire for immediate explanation. Not only did I not insist upon an answer, but I was actually terrified lest she would answer. More I felt in me a terror lest I should be moved to describe my own experiences below the stairs, thus increasing their reality and so the reality of all. She might even explain them too. Still listening intently, she raised her head and looked me in the eyes. Her lips opened to speak. The words came to me from a great distance, it seemed, and her voice had a sound like a stone that drops into a deep well, its fate, though hidden, known. We are in it with her too, Bill. We are in it with her. Our interpretations vary because we are in parts of it only. Mabel is in it all. The desire for violence came over me. If only she would say a definite thing in plain King's English. If only I could find it in me to give utterance to what shouted so loud within me. If only, the same old cry, something would happen. For all this elliptic talk that dazed my mind left obscurity everywhere. Her atrocious meaning, nonetheless, flashed through me, though vanishing before it wholly divulged itself. It brought a certain reaction with it. I found my tongue. Whether I actually believed what I said is more than I can swear to. That it seemed to me wise at the moment is all I remember. My mind was in a state of obscure perception less than that of normal consciousness. Yes, Francis, I believe that what you say is the truth and that we are in it with her. I meant to say it with loud, hostile emphasis, but instead I whispered it lest she should hear the trembling of my voice. And for that reason, my dear sister, we leave tomorrow, you and I. Today, rather, since it is long past midnight. We leave this house of the damned. We go back to London. Frances looked up, her face distraught almost beyond recognition. But it was not my words that caused the tumult in her heart. It was a sound, the sound she had been listening for. So faint I barely caught it myself. And had she not pointed, I could never have known the direction whence it came. Small and terrible it rose again in the stillness of the night, the sound of gnashing teeth, and behind it came another, the tread of stealthy footsteps. Both were just outside the door. The room swung round me for a second, my first instinct to prevent my sister going out. She had dashed past me frantically to the door, gave place to another when I saw the expression in her eyes. I followed her lead instead. It was surer than my own. The pistol in my pocket swung uselessly against my thigh. I was flustered beyond belief and ashamed that I was so. Keep close to me, Francis, I said huskily, as the door swung wide and a shaft of light fell upon a figure moving rapidly. Mabel was going down the corridor. Beyond her in the shadows on the staircase, a second figure stood beckoning, scarcely visible. Before they get her, quick, was screamed into my ears and her arms were about her in the same moment. It was a horrible scene, not that Mabel struggled in the least, but that she collapsed as we caught her and fell with her dead weight as of a corpse limp against us. And her teeth began again. They continued, even beneath the hand that Frances clapped upon her lips. We carried her back into her own bedroom, where she lay down peacefully enough. It was so soon over. The rapidity of the whole thing robbed it of reality almost. It had the swiftness of something remembered rather than of something witnessed. She slept again so quickly that it was almost as if we had caught her sleepwalking. I cannot say. I asked no questions at the time. I have asked none since, and my help was needed as little as the protection of my pistol. Francis was strangely competent and collected. I lingered for some time, uselessly by the door till at length, looking up with a sigh, she made a sign for me to go. I shall wait in your room next door, I whispered, till you come. But 
though going out, I waited in the corridor instead, so as to hear the faintest call for help. In that dark corridor upstairs I waited, but not long. It may have been fifteen minutes, when Francis reappeared, locking the door softly behind her. Leaning over the banisters, I saw her. "'I'll go in again about six o'clock,' she whispered. "'As soon as it gets light. She is sound asleep now. Please don't wait. If anything happens, I'll call. You might leave your door ajar, perhaps.' And she came up, looking like a ghost. But I saw her first safely into bed, and the rest of the night I spent in an armchair close to my opened door, listening for the slightest sound. Soon after five o'clock I heard Frances fumbling with the key, and peering over the railing again, I waited till she reappeared and went back into her own room. She closed the door. Evidently she was satisfied that all was well. Then, and then only, did I go to bed myself, but not to sleep. I could not get the scene out of my mind especially that odious detail of which I hoped and believed my sister had not seen, the still dark figure of the housekeeper waiting on the stairs below, waiting, of course, for Mabel. Chapter 9 It seems I became a mere spectator after that. My sister's lead was so assured for one thing, and for another the responsibility of leaving Mabel alone, Francis laid it bodily upon my shoulders, was a little more than I cared about. Moreover, when we all three met later in the day, things went on so exactly as before, so absolutely without friction or distress, that to present a sudden obvious excuse for cutting our visit short seemed ill-judged, and on the lowest grounds it would have been desertion. At any rate, it was beyond my powers, and Francis was quite firm that she must stay. We, therefore, did stay. Things that happen in the night always seem exaggerated and distorted when the sun shines brightly next morning. No one can reconstruct the terror of a night afterwards, nor comprehend why it seemed so overwhelming at the time. I slept till ten o'clock, and when I rang for breakfast, a note from my sister lay upon the tray, its message of counsel couched in a calm and comforting strain. Mabel, she assured me, was herself again, and remembered nothing of what had happened, there was no need of any violent measures. I was to treat her exactly as if I knew nothing. And if you don't mind, Bill, let us leave the matter unmentioned between ourselves as well. Discussion exaggerates. Such things are best not talked about. I'm sorry I disturbed you so unnecessarily. I was stupidly excited. Please forget all the things I said at the moment. She had written nonsense first instead of things, then scratched it out. She wished to convey that hysteria had been abroad in the night, and I readily gulped the explanation down, though it could not satisfy me in the smallest degree. There was another week of our visit still, and we stayed it out to the end without disaster. My desire to leave at times became that frantic thing, desire to escape. But I controlled it, kept silent, watched and wondered. Nothing happened. As before, and everywhere, there was no sequence of development, no connection between cause and effect, and climax, none whatever. The thing swayed up and down, backwards and forwards, like a great loose curtain in the wind, and I could only vaguely surmise what caused the draft or why there was a curtain at all. A novelist might mold the queer material into a coherent sequence that would be interesting but could not be true. It remains, therefore, not a story but a history. Nothing happened. Perhaps my intense dislike of the fall of darkness was due wholly to my stirred imagination, and perhaps my anger when I learned that Francis now occupied a bed in our hostess's room was unreasonable. Nerves were unquestionably on edge. I was forever on the lookout for some event that should make escape imperative, but yet that never presented itself. I slept lightly, left my door ajar to catch the slightest sound, even made stealthy tours of the house below stairs while everybody dreamed in their beds. But I discovered nothing. The doors were always locked. I neither saw the housekeeper again in unreasonable times and places, nor heard a footstep in the passages and halls. The noise was never once repeated. That horrible ultimate thunder, my intensest dread of all, lay withdrawn into the abyss whence it had twice arisen. And though in my thoughts it was sternly denied existence, the great black reason for the fact afflicted me unbelievably. Since Mabel's fruitless effort to escape, the doors kept closed remorselessly. She had failed. They gave up hope. 
for this was the explanation that haunted the region of my mind where feelings stir and hint before they clothe themselves in actual language. Only I firmly kept it there. It never knew expression. But if my ears were open, my eyes were opened too. And it were idle to pretend that I did not notice a hundred details that were capable of sinister interpretation, had I been weak enough to yield. Some protective barrier had fallen into ruins round me, so that terror stalked behind the general collapse, feeling for me through all the gaping fissures. Much of this, I admit, must have been merely the elaboration of those sensations I had first vaguely felt, before subsequent events and my talks with Francis had dramatized them into living thoughts. I therefore leave them unmentioned in this history, just as my mind left them unmentioned in that interminable final week. Our life went on precisely as before, Mabel, unreal and outwardly so still. Francis, secretive, anxious, tactful to the point of slyness, and keen to save to the point of self-forgetfulness. There were the same stupid meals, the same wearisome long evenings, the stifling ugliness of house and grounds, the shadow settling in so thickly that it seemed almost a visible, tangible thing. I came to feel the only friendly things in all this hostile, cruel place were the robins that hopped boldly over the monstrous terraces and even up to the windows of the unsightly house itself. The robins alone knew joy. They danced, believing no evil thing was possible in all God's radiant world. They believed in everybody. Their God's plan of life had no room in it for hell, damnation, and lakes of brimstone. I came to love the little birds. Had Samuel Franklin known them, he might have preached a different sermon, bequeathing love in place of terror. Most of my time I spent writing, but it was a pretense at best, and rather a dangerous one besides, for it stirred the mind to production with the result that other things came pouring in as well. With reading it was the same. In the end, I found an aggressive, deliberate resistance to be the only way of feasible defense. To walk far afield was out of the question, for it meant leaving my sister too long alone, so that my exercise was confined to nearer home. My saunters in the grounds, however, never surprised the goblin garden again. It was close at hand, but I seemed unable to get wholly into it. Too many things assailed my mind for anyone to hold exclusive possession, perhaps. Indeed, all the interpretations... All the layers, to use my sister's phrase, slipped in by turns and lodged there for a time. They came day and night, and though my reason denied them entrance, they held their own as by a kind of squatter's right. They stirred moods already in me, that is, and did not introduce entirely new ones, for every mind conceals ancestral deposits that have been cultivated in turn along the whole line of its descent. Any day a chance shower may cause this one or that to blossom, Thus it came to me at any rate. After darkness, the Inquisition paced the empty corridors and set up ghastly apparatus in the dismal halls. And once in the library there swept over me that easy and delicious conviction that by confessing my wickedness I could resume it later, since confession is expression, and expression brings relief and leaves one ready to accumulate again. And in such mood I felt bitter and unforgiving towards all others who thought differently. Another time it was a pagan thing that assaulted me, so trivial yet, oh, so significant at the time, when I dreamed that a herd of centaurs rolled up with a great stamping of hoofs round the house to destroy it, and then woke to hear the horses tramping across the field below the lawns. They neighed ominously, and their noisy panting was audible as if it were just outside my windows. But the tree episode, I think, was the most curious of all except perhaps the incident with the children, which I shall mention in a moment. For its closeness to reality was so unforgettable. Outside the east window of my room stood a giant Wellingtonia on the lawn, its head rising level with the upper sash. It grew some twenty feet away, planted on the highest terrace, and I often saw it when closing my curtains for the night, noticing how it drew its heavy skirts about it, and how the light from other windows threw glimmering streaks and patches that turned it into the semblance of a towering solemn image. It stood there then, so strikingly, somehow like a great old-world idol, that it claimed attention. Its appearance was curiously formidable, its branches rustled without visibly moving, and it had a certain portentous forbidding air, so grand and dark and monstrous in the night that I was always glad when my curtains shut it out. Yet once in bed I 
had never thought about it one way or the other, and by day had certainly never sought it out. One night, then, as I went to bed and closed this window against a cutting easterly wind, I saw that there were two of these trees. A brother Wellingtonia rose mysteriously beside it, equally huge, equally towering, equally monstrous. The menacing pair of them faced me there upon the lawn. But in this new arrival lay a strange suggestion that frightened me before I could argue it away. Exact counterpart of its giant companion, it revealed also that gross, odious quality that all my sister's paintings held. I got the impression that the rest of these trees, stretching away dimly in a troop over the farther lawns, were similar, and that, led by this enormous pair, they had all moved boldly closer to my windows. At the same moment, a blind was drawn down over an upper room. The second tree disappeared into the surrounding darkness. It was, of course, this chance light that had brought it into the field of vision. But when the black shutter dropped over it, hiding it from view, the manner of its vanishing produced the queer effect that it had slipped into its companion, almost that it had been an emanation of the one I so disliked, and not really a tree at all. In this way, the garden-turned-vehicle for expressing what lay behind it all. The behavior of the doors, the little ordinary doors, seemed scarcely worth mention at all, their queer way of opening and shutting of their own accord, for this was accountable in a hundred natural ways, and to tell the truth, I never caught one in the act of moving. Indeed, only after frequent repetitions did the detail force itself upon me, when, having noticed one, I noticed all. It produced, however, the unpleasant impression of a continual coming and going in the house, as though screened cleverly and purposely from actual sight. Someone in the building held constant and visible intercourse with others. Upon detailed descriptions of these uncertain incidents I do not venture, individually so trivial, but taken altogether so impressive and so insolent. But the episode of the children, mentioned above, was different, and I give it because it showed how vividly the intuitive child mind received the impression, one impression at any rate, of what was in the air. It may be told in a few words. I believe there were the coachman's children, and that the man had been in Mr. Franklin's service, but of neither point am I quite positive. I heard screaming in the rose garden that runs along the stable walls. It was one afternoon not far from the tea hour, and on hurrying up I found a little girl of nine or ten fastened with ropes to a rustic seat, and two other children, boys, one about twelve and one much younger, gathering sticks beneath the climbing rose trees. The girl was white and frightened, but the others were laughing and talking among themselves so busily while they picked that they did not notice my abrupt arrival. Some game, I understood, was in progress, but a game that had become too serious for the happiness of the prisoner, for there was a fear in the girl's eyes that was a very genuine fear indeed. I unfastened her at once. The ropes were so loosely and clumsily knotted that they had not hurt her skin. It was not that which made her pale. She collapsed a moment upon the bench, then picked up her tiny skirts and dived away at full speed into the safety of the stable yard. There was no response to my brief comforting, but she ran as though for her life, and I divined that some horrid boy's cruelty had been afoot. It was probably mere thoughtlessness, as cruelty with children usually is, but something in me decided to discover exactly what it was. And the boys, not one whit alarmed at my intervention, merely laughed shyly when I explained that their prisoner had escaped and told me frankly what their gaim had been. There was no vestige of shame in them nor any idea, of course, that they aped a monstrous reality. That it was mere pretense was neither here nor there. To them, though make-believe, it was a make-believe of something that was right and natural, and in no sense cruel. Grown-ups did it, too. It was necessary for her good. "'I was going to burn her up, sir,' the older one informed me, answering my why with the explanation, "'because she wouldn't believe what we wanted her to believe.' And game though it was, the feeling of reality about the little episode was so arresting, so terrific in some way, that only with difficulty did I confine my admonitions on this occasion to mere words. The boys slunk off, frightened in their turn, yet not. I felt convinced that they had erred in principle. It was their inheritance. They had breathed it in with the atmosphere of their bringing up. They would renew the salutary torture when they could, till she believed as they did. I went back into the house, afflicted with a passion of mingled pity and distress impossible to describe. Yet, 
On my short way across the garden was attacked by other moods in turn, each more real and bitter than its predecessor. I received the whole series as it were at once. I felt like a diver rising to the surface through layers of water at different temperatures, though here the natural order was reversed, and the cooler strato was uppermost, the heated ones below. Thus I was caught by the goblin touch of the willows that fringed the field, by the sensuous curving of the twisted ash that formed a gateway to the little grove of sapling oaks, where fawns and satyrs lurked to play in the moonlight before pagan altars, and by the cloaking darkness next of the copse of stunted pines, close gathered each to each, where hooded figures stalked behind an awful cross. The episode with the children seemed to have opened me like a knife. The whole place rushed at me. I suspect this synthesis of many moods produced in me that climax of loathing and disgust which made me feel the limit of bearable emotion had been reached, so that I made straight to find Frances in order to convince her that, at any rate, I must leave. For, although this was our last day in the house and we had arranged to go next day, the dread was in me that she would still find some persuasive reason for staying on. And an unexpected incident then made my dread unnecessary. The front door was opened and a cab stood in the drive. A tall, elderly man was gravely talking in the hall with the parlor maid we called the Grenadier. He held a piece of paper in his hand. I have called to see the house, I heard him say as I ran up the stairs to Francis, who was peering like an inquisitive child over the banisters. Yes, she told me with a sigh. I know not whether of resignation or relief. The house is to be let or sold. Mabel has decided. Some society, rather, I believe. I was overjoyed. This made our leaving right and possible. You never told me, Francis. Mabel only heard of it a few days ago. She told me herself this morning. It is a chance, she says. Alone she cannot get it straight. Defeat? I asked, watching her closely. She thinks she has found a way out. It's not a family, you see. It's a society, a sort of community. They go in for thought... Community? I gasped. You mean religious? She shook her head. Not exactly, she said, smiling, but some kind of association of men and women who want a headquarters in the country, a place where they can write and meditate, think, mature their plans and all the rest. I don't know exactly what. Utopian dreamers? I asked, yet feeling an immense relief come over me as I heard. But I asked in ignorance, not cynically. Frances would know. She knew all this kind of thing. No, not that exactly, she smiled. Their teachings are grand and simple. Old is the world, too, really. The basis of every religion before men's mind perverted them with their manufactured creeds. Footsteps on the stairs and the sound of voices interrupted our odd, impromptu conversation as the grenadier came up, followed by the tall, grave gentleman who was being shown over the house. My sister drew me along the corridor towards her room, where she went in and closed the door behind me, yet not before I had stolen a good look at the caller, long enough at least for his face and general appearance to have made a definite impression on me, for something strong and peaceful emanated from his presence. He moved with such quiet dignity. The glance of his eyes was so steady and reassuring that my mind labeled him instantly as a type of man one would turn to in an emergency and not be disappointed. I had seen him but for a passing moment, but I had seen him twice, and the way he walked down the passage looking competently about him conveyed the same impression as when I saw him standing at the door, fearless, tolerant, wise. A sincere and kindly character, I judged instantly, a man whom some big kind of love has trained in sweetness towards the world, no hate in him anywhere. A great deal, no doubt, to read in so brief a glance, yet his voice confirmed my intuition. A deep and very gentle voice. Great firmness in it, too. Have I become suddenly sensitive to people's atmospheres in this extraordinary fashion? I asked myself, smiling, as I stood in the room and heard the door close behind me. Have I developed some clairvoyant faculty here? At any other time, I should have mocked. And I sat down and faced my sister, feeling strangely comforted, and at peace for the first time since I had stepped beneath the tower's roof a month ago. Frances, I then saw, was smiling a little as she watched me. You know him? I asked. You felt it too? 
was her question and reply. No, she added, I don't know him, beyond the fact that he is a leader in the movement and has devoted years and money to its objects. Mabel felt the same thing in him that you have felt, and jumped at it. But you've seen him before, I urged, for the certainty was in me that he was no stranger to her. She shook her head. He called one day early this week when you were out. Mabel saw him, I believe. She hesitated a moment, as though expecting me to stop her with my usual impatience of such subjects. I believe he has explained everything to her. The beliefs he embodies, she declares, are her salvation. Might be, rather, if she could adopt them. Conversion again, for I remembered her riches, and how gladly a society would gobble them. The layers I told you about, she continued calmly, shrugging her shoulders slightly, the deposits that are left behind by strong thinking and real belief, but especially by ugly, hateful belief, because, you see, there's more vital passion in that sort. Francis, I don't understand a bit, I said out loud, but said it a little humbly, for the impression the man had left was still strong upon me, and I was grateful for the steady sense of peace and comfort he had somehow introduced. The horrors had been so dreadful. My nerves, doubtless, were more than a little overstrained. Absurd as it must sound, I classed him in my mind with the Robins, the happy, confiding Robins, who believed in everybody and thought no evil. I laughed a moment at my ridiculous idea, and my sister, encouraged by this sign of patience in me, continued more fluently. "'Of course you don't understand, Bill. Why should you? You've never thought about such things. Needing no creed yourself, you think all creeds are rubbish.' "'I'm open to conviction. I'm tolerant,' I interrupted. "'You're as narrow as Sam Franklin, and as crammed with prejudice,' she answered, knowing that she had me at her mercy. "'Then pray what may be his or his society's beliefs,' I asked, feeling no desire to argue. "'And how are they going to prove your Mabel's salvation? Can they bring beauty into all this aggressive hate and ugliness?' "'Certainly hope and peace,' she said. "'That peace which is understanding, and that understanding which explains all creeds, and therefore tolerates them. Toleration! The one word a religious man loathes above all others. His pet word is damnation. Tolerates them, she repeated patiently, unperturbed by my explosion, because it includes them all. Fine if true, I admitted. Very fine, but how, pray, does it include them all? Because the key word... The motto of their society is, There is no religion higher than truth, and it has no single dogma of any kind. Above all, she went on, because it claims that no individual can be lost. It teaches universal salvation. To damn outsiders is uncivilized, childish, impure. Some take longer than others. It's according to the way they think and live. But all find peace through development in the end. What the creeds call a hopeless soul it regards as a soul having further to go. There is no damnation. Well, well, I exclaimed, feeling that she rode her hobby horse too wildly, too roughly over me. But what is the bearing of all this upon this dreadful place and upon Mabel? I'll admit that there is this atmosphere, this inexplicable horror in the house and grounds, and that if not of damnation exactly, it is certainly damnable. I'm not too prejudiced to deny that. For I felt it myself. To my relief, she was brief. She made her statement, leaving me to take it or reject it as I would. The thought and belief its former occupants have left behind, for there have been coincidence here, a coincidence that must be rare. The site on which this modern house now stands was Roman, before that early Britain, with burial mounds, before that again Druid. The Druid stones still lie in that copse below the field. The Tumuli, among the ilexes behind the drive, the older building Sam Franklin altered and practically pulled down was a monastery. He changed the chapel into a meeting hall, which is now the music room, but before he came here the house was occupied by a Manetti, a violent Catholic without tolerance or vision. And in the interval between those two, Julius Weinbaum had it, Hebrew of most rigid orthodox type imaginable. So they have all left their even so, I repeated, yet interested to hear the rest, what of it? Simply this, said Francis with conviction, that each in turn has left his layer of concentrated thinking and belief 
behind him, because each believed intensely, absolutely, beyond the least weakening of any doubt, the kind of strong belief in thinking that is rare anywhere today, the kind that wills, impregnates objects, saturates the atmosphere, haunts, in a word, and each believing he was utterly and finally right, damned with equally positive conviction the rest of the world. One and all preached that implicitly, if not explicitly, it's the root of every creed. Last of the bigoted grim series came Samuel Franklin. I listened in amazement that increased as she went on. Up to this point her explanation was so admirable. It was indeed a pretty study in psychology, if it were true. Then why does nothing ever happen? I inquired mildly. A place so thickly haunted ought to produce a crop of no ordinary results. There lies the proof, she went on in a lowered voice, the proof of the horror and the ugly reality. The thought and belief of each occupant in turn kept all the others under. They gave no sign of life at the time, but the results of thinking never die. They crop out again the moment there's an opening. And with the return of Mabel in her negative state, believing nothing positive herself, the place for the first time found itself free to reproduce its buried stores, damnation, hellfire, and the rest, the most permanent and vital thought of all those creeds since it was applied to the majority of the world, broke loose again, for there was no restraint to hold it back. Each sought to obtain its former supremacy, none conquered. There results a pandemonium of hate and fear, striving to escape, of agonized bitter warring to find safety, peace, salvation. The place is saturated by that appalling stream of thinking, the terror of the damned. It concentrated upon Mabel, whose negative attitude furnished the channel of deliverance. You and I, according to our sympathy with her, were similarly involved. Nothing happened because no one layer could ever gain the supremacy. I was so interested, I dare not say amused, that I stared in silence while she paused a moment, afraid that she would draw rein and end the fairy tale too soon. The beliefs of this man, of his society, rather, vigorously thought and therefore vigorously given out here, will put the whole place straight. It will act as a solvent. These vitriolic layers, actively denied, will fuse and disappear in the stream of gentle, tolerant sympathy, which is love. For each member, worthy of the name, loves the world, and all creeds go into the melting pot. Mabel, too, if she joins them out of real conviction, will find salvation. Thinking, I know, is of the first importance, I objected, but don't you perhaps exaggerate the power of feeling and emotion, which in religion are au fond, always hysterical? What is the world, she told me, but thinking and feeling? An individual's world is entirely what that individual thinks and believes. Interpretation. There is no other, and unless he really thinks and really believes, he has no permanent world at all. I grant that few people think and still fewer believe, and that most take ready-made suits and make them do. Only the strong make their own things. The lesser fry, Mabel among them, are merely swept up into what has been manufactured for them. They get along somehow. You and I have made for ourselves. Mabel has not. She is a non-entity, and when her belief is taken from her, she goes with it. It was not in me just then to criticize the evasion or pick out the sophistry from the truth. I merely waited for her to continue. None of us have truth, my dear Francis, I ventured presently, seeing that she kept silent. Precisely, she answered, but most of us have beliefs, and what one believes and thinks affects the world at large. Consider the legacy of hatred and cruelty involved in the doctrines men have built into their creeds, where the sin qua non of salvation is absolute acceptance of one particular set of views, or else perishing everlastingly. For only by repudiating history can they disavow it. You're not quite accurate, I put in. Not all the creeds teach damnation, do they? Franklin did, of course, but the others are a bit modernized now, surely. Trying to get out of it, she admitted. Perhaps they are, but damnation of unbelievers, of most of the world, that is, is their rather favorite idea if you talk with them. I never have, she smiled. But I have, she said significantly. So if you consider what the various occupants of this house have 
so strongly held in thought and believed, you need not be surprised that the influence they have left behind them should be a dark and dreadful legacy. For thought, you know, does leave. The opening of the door, to my great relief, interrupted her, as the grenadier led in the visitor to see the room. He bowed to both of us with a brief word of apology, looked round him, and withdrew. And with his departure, the conversation between us came naturally to an end. I followed him out. Neither of us, in any case, I think, cared to argue further. And so, as far as I'm aware, the curious history of the towers ends here, too. There was no climax in the story since. Nothing ever really happened. We left next morning for London. I only know that the society in question took the house and have since occupied it to their entire satisfaction, and that Mabel, who became a member shortly afterwards, now stays there frequently when in need of repose from the arduous and unselfish labors she took upon herself under its aegis. She dined with us only the other night, here in our tiny Chelsea flat, and a jollier, saner, more interesting and happy guest I could hardly wish for. She was vital in the best sense. The lay figure had come to life. I found it difficult to believe she was the same woman whose fearful effigy had floated down those dreary corridors and almost disappeared in the depths of that atrocious shadow. What her beliefs were now I was wise enough to leave unquestioned, and Francis, to my great relief, kept the conversation well away from such inappropriate topics. It was clear, however, that the woman had in herself some secret source of joy that she was now an aggressive, positive force, sure of herself and apparently afraid of nothing in heaven or hell. She radiated something very like hope and courage about her, and talked as though the world were a glorious place and everybody in it kind and beautiful. Her optimism was certainly infectious. The towers were mentioned only in passing. The name of Marsh came up. Not the Marsh, it so happened, but a name in some book that was being discussed, and I was unable to restrain myself. Curiosity was too strong. I threw out a casual inquiry Mabel could leave unanswered if she wished, but there was no desire to avoid it. Her reply was frank and smiling. Would you believe it? She married, Mabel told me, though obviously surprised that I remembered the housekeeper at all, and as happy as the day is long. She's found her right niche in life. A sergeant. The army, I ejaculated. "'Salvation Army,' she explained merrily. Francis exchanged a glance with me. I laughed, too, for the information took me by surprise. I cannot say why exactly, but I expected at least to hear that the woman had met some dreadful end, not impossible by burning. "'And the towers, now called the Rest House,' Mabel chattered on, "'seems to me the most peaceful and delightful spot in England.' "'Really?' I said politely. "'When I lived there in the old days, while well, you were there, perhaps, though I won't be sure,' Mabel went on. The story got abroad that it was haunted. Wasn't it odd? A less likely place for a ghost I've never seen. Why, it had no atmosphere at all. She said this to Francis, glancing up at me with a smile that apparently had no hidden meaning. Did you notice anything queer about it when you were there? This was plainly addressed to me. I found it uh, difficult to settle down to anything, I said after an instant's hesitation. I couldn't work there. "'But I thought you wrote that wonderful book on the deaf and blind while you stayed with me?' she asked innocently. I stammered a little. "'Oh, no, not then. I only made a few notes. At the towers. My mind, oddly enough, refused to produce at all down there. But why do you ask? Did anything—was anything supposed to happen there?' She looked searchingly into my eyes a moment before she answered. "'Not that I know of.' She said simply. End of section seven. Section eight of Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Ben Tucker. A Descent into Egypt, Chapter One. He was an accomplished, versatile man whom some called brilliant. Behind his talents lay a wealth of material that right selection could have lifted into genuine distinction. He did too many things, however, to excel in one, for a restless curiosity kept him ever on the move. George Isley was an able man, his short career in diplomacy proved it, yet when he abandoned this for travel and exploration, no one thought it a pity. He would do big things in any line. He was merely finding himself. 
Among the rolling stones of humanity, a few acquire moss of considerable value. They are not necessarily shiftless. They travel light. The comfortable pockets in the game of life that attract the majority are too small to retain them. They are in and out again in a moment. The world says, what a pity they stick to nothing. But the fact is that, like questing wild birds, they seek the nest they need. It is a question of values. They judge swiftly, change their line of flight, are gone, not even hearing the comment that they might have retired with a pension. And to this homeless questing type, George Isley certainly belonged. He was by no means shiftless. He merely sought with insatiable yearning that soft particular nest where he could settle down in permanently. And to an accompaniment of sighs and regrets from his friends, he found it. He found it, however, not in the present, but by retiring from the world without a pension, unclothed with honors and distinctions. He withdrew from the present and slipped softly back into a mighty past where he belonged. Why? How? Obeying what strange instincts? This remains unknown. Deep secret of an inner life that found no resting place in modern things. Such instincts are not disclosable in twentieth-century language, nor are the details of such a journey properly describable at all, except by the few, poets, prophets, psychiatrists, and the like. Such experiences are dismissed with the neat museum label, Queer. So equally must the recorder of this experience share the honor of that little label, he who by chance witnessed certain external and visible signs of this inner and spiritual journey. There remains, nevertheless, the amazing reality of the experience, and to the recorder alone was some clue of interpretation possible, perhaps because in himself also lay the lure, though less imperative, of a similar journey. At any rate, the interpretation may be offered to the handful who realize that trains and motors are not the only means of travel left to our progressive race. In his younger days I knew George Isley intimately. I know him now. But the George Isley I knew of old, the arresting personality with whom I traveled, climbed, explored, is no longer with us. He is not here. He disappeared, gradually, into the past. There is no George Isley. And that such an individuality could vanish while still his outer semblance walks the familiar streets, normal apparently, and not yet fifty in the number of his years, seems a tale, though difficult, well worth the telling for I witnessed the slow submergence. It was very gradual. I cannot pretend to understand the entire significance of it. There was something questionable and sinister in the business that offered hints of astonishing possibilities. Were there a corps of spiritual police, the matter might be partially cleared up, but since none of the churches have yet organized anything effective of this sort, one can only fall back upon variants of the blessed Mesopotamia and whisper of derangement and the like. Such labels, of course, explain as little as most other clichés in life. That well-groomed soldierly figure strolling down Piccadilly, watching the races, dining out. There is no derangement there. The face is not melancholy, the eye not wild. The gestures are quiet and the speech controlled. Yet the eye is empty, the face expressionless. Vacancy reigns there, provocative and significant, if not unduly noticeable. It is because the majority in life neither expect nor offer more. At closer quarters you may think questioning things, or you may think nothing, probably the latter. You may wonder why something continually expected does not make its appearance, and you may watch for the evidence of personality the general presentment of the man has led you to expect. Disappointed, therefore, you may certainly be. But I defy you to discover the smallest hint of mental disorder, and of derangement or nervous affliction, absolutely nothing. Before long, perhaps, you may feel you are talking with a dummy, some well-trained automaton, a non-entity devoid of spontaneous life. And afterwards, you may find that memory fades rapidly away, as though no impression of any kind has really been made at all. All this, yes, but nothing pathological. A few may be stimulated by the startling discrepancy between promise and performance, but most, accustomed to accept face values, would say, a pleasant fellow, but nothing in him much, and an hour later forget him altogether. For the truth is, as you perhaps divined, you have been sitting beside no one, you have been talking to, looking at, listening to, 
No one. The intercourse has conveyed nothing that can waken human response in you, good, bad, or indifferent. There is no George Isley. And the discovery, if you make it, will not even cause you to creep with the uncanniness of the experience, because the exterior is so wholly pleasing. George Isley today is a picture with no meaning in it, that charms merely by the harmonious coloring of an inoffensive subject. He moves undiscovered in the little world of society to which he was born. Secure in the groove, first habit has made comfortably automatic for him. No one guesses, none that is, but the few who knew him intimately in early life. And his wandering existence has scattered these. They have forgotten what he was. So perfect indeed is he in the manners of the commonplace fashionable man, that no woman in his set is aware that he differs from the type she is accustomed to. He turns a compliment with the accepted language of her textbook, motors, golfs, and gambles in the regulation manner of his particular world. He is an admirable, perfect automaton. He is nothing. He is a human shell. Chapter 2 The name of George Isley has been before the public for some years when, after a considerable interval, we met again in a hotel in Egypt. I for my health, he for I knew not what, at first. But I soon discovered. Archaeology and excavation had taken hold of him, though he had gone so quietly about it that no one seemed to have heard. I was not sure that he was glad to see me, for he had first withdrawn, annoyed, it seemed, at being discovered, but later, as though after consideration, had made tentative advances. He welcomed me with a curious gesture of the entire body that seemed to shake himself free from something that had made him forget my identity. There was pathos somewhere in his attitude, almost as though he asked for sympathy. "'I've been out here, off and on, for the last three years,' he told me, after describing something of what he had been doing. "'I find it the most repaying hobby in the world. It leads to a reconstruction, an imaginative reconstruction, of course, I mean, of an enormous thing the world had entirely lost. A very gorgeous, stimulating hobby, believe me, and a very enticing... He quickly changed the word. Exacting one, indeed. I remember looking him up and down with astonishment. There was a change in him, a lack. A note was missing in his enthusiasm, a color in the voice, a quality in his manner. The ingredients were not mixed quite as of old. I did not bother him with questions, but I noted thus at the very first a subtle alteration. Another facet of the man presented itself, something that had been independent and aggressive was replaced by a certain emptiness that invited sympathy. Even in his physical appearance the change was manifested. This odd suggestion of lessening. I looked again more closely. Lessening was the word. He had somehow dwindled. It was startling. Vaguely unpleasant, too. The entire subject, as usual, was at his fingertips. He knew all the important men, and had spent money freely on his hobby. I laughed, reminded him of his remark that Egypt had no attractions for him, owing to the organized advertisement of its somewhat theatrical charms. Admitting his error was a gesture. He brushed the objection easily aside. His manner and a certain glow that rose about his atmosphere as he answered increased my first astonishment. His voice was significant and suggestive. "'Come out with me,' he said in a low tone, "'and see how little the tourists matter, how inappreciable the excavation is, compared to what remains to be done, how gigantic.' He emphasized the word impressively. "'The scope for discovery remains.' He made a movement with his head and shoulders that conveyed a sense of the prodigious, for he was of massive build, his cast of features stern, and his eyes, set deep into the face, shone past me with a somber gleam in them I did not quite account for. It was the voice, however, that brought the mystery in. It vibrated somewhere below the actual sound of it. Egypt, he continued, and so gravely that at first I made the mistake of thinking he chose the curious words on purpose to produce a theatrical effect that has enriched her blood with the pageant of so many civilizations, that has devoured Persians, Greeks, and Romans, Saracens, and Mamelukes, a dozen conquests and invasions besides. What can mere tourists or explorers matter to her? The excavators scratch their skin and dig up mummies. And as for tourists, he laughed contemptuously, 
flies that settle for a moment on her covered face, to vanish at the first signs of heat. Egypt is not even aware of them. The real Egypt lies underground in darkness. Tourists must have light to be seen as well as to see. And the diggers... He paused, smiling with something between pity and contempt I did not quite appreciate, for personally I felt a great respect for the tireless excavators. And then he added, with a touch of feeling in his tone as though he had a grievance against them, and had not also dug himself, "'Men who uncover the dead, restore the temples, and reconstruct a skeleton, thinking they have read its beating heart.' He shrugged his great shoulders, and the rest of the sentence may have been but the protest of a man in defense of his own hobby, but that there seemed an undue earnestness and gravity about it that made me wonder more than ever. He went on to speak of the strangeness of the land as a mere ribbon of vegetation along the ancient river. The rest all ruins, desert, sun-drenched wilderness of death, yet so breakingly alive with wonder, power, and a certain disquieting sense of deathlessness. There seemed for him a revelation of unusual spiritual kind in this land where the past survived so potently. He spoke almost as though it obliterated the present. Indeed, the hint of something solemn behind his words made it difficult for me to keep up the conversation, and the pause that presently came I filled in with some word of questioning surprise, which yet I think was chiefly in concurrence. I was aware of some big belief in him, some enveloping emotion that escaped my grasp. Yet, though I did not understand, his great mood swept me. His voice lowered, then, as he went on to mention temples, tombs, and deities, details of his own discoveries and of their effect upon him. But to this I listened with half an ear, because in the unusual language he had first made use of I detected this other thing that stirred my curiosity more, stirred it uncomfortably. Then the spell, I asked, remembering the effect of Egypt upon myself two years before, has worked upon you, as upon most others, only with greater power. He looked hard at me a moment, signs of trouble showing themselves faintly in his rugged, interesting face. I think he wanted to say more than he could bring himself to confess. He hesitated. I'm only glad, he replied after a pause. It didn't get hold of me earlier in life. It would have absorbed me. I should have lost all other interests. Now, that curious look of helplessness, of asking sympathy, flitted like a shadow through his eyes. Now that I'm on the decline, it matters less. On the decline, I cannot imagine by what blundering I missed this chance he never offered again. Somehow or other, the singular phrase passed unnoticed at the moment, and only came upon me with its full significance later, when it was too awkward to refer to it. He tested my readiness to help, to sympathize, to share his inner life. I missed the clue, for at the moment a more practical consideration interested me in his language, being of those who regretted that he had not excelled by devoting his powers to a single object. I shrugged my shoulders. He caught my meaning instantly. Oh, he was glad to talk. He felt the possibility of my sympathy underneath, I think. No, no, you take me wrongly there, he said with gravity. What I mean and I ought to know if anyone does, is that while most countries give, others take away. Egypt changes you. No one can live here and remain exactly what he was before. This puzzled me. It startled, too, again. His manner was so earnest. And Egypt, you mean, is one of the countries that take away? I asked. The strange idea unsettled my thoughts a little. First takes away from you, he replied. But in the end takes you away. Some lands enrich you, he went on, seeing that I listened, while others impoverish. From India, Greece, Italy, all ancient lands, you return with memories you can use. From Egypt you return with nothing. Its splendor stupefies. It's useless. There is a change in your inmost being, an emptiness, an unaccountable yearning, but you find nothing that can fill the lack you are conscious of. Nothing comes to replace what has gone. You have been drained. I stared, but I nodded a general acquiescence. Of a sensitive, artistic temperament, this was certainly true, though by no means a superficial and generally accepted verdict. The majority imagine that Egypt has filled them to the brim. I took his deeper reading of the facts, 
I was aware of an odd fascination in his idea. Modern Egypt, he continued, is after all but a trick of civilization. And there was a kind of breathlessness in his measured tone. But ancient Egypt lies waiting, hiding underneath. Though dead, she is amazingly alive, and you feel her touching you. She takes from you. She enriches herself. You return from Egypt less than you were before. What came over my mind is hard to say. Some touch of visionary imagination burned its flaming path across my mind. I thought of some old Grecian hero speaking of his delicious battle with the gods, battle in which he knew he must be worsted, but yet in which he delighted because at death his spirit would join their glorious company beyond this world. I was aware, that is to say, of resignation as well as resistance in him. He already felt the effortless peace which follows upon long, unequal battling, as of a man who has fought the rapids with a strain beyond his strength, then sinks back and goes with the awful mass of water smoothly and indifferently over the quiet fall. Yet it was not so much his words which clothed picturesquely an undeniable truth as the force of conviction that drove behind them, shrouding my mind with mystery and darkness. His eyes, so steadily holding mine, were lit, I admit, yet they were calm and sane as those of a doctor discussing the symptoms of that daily battle to which we all finally succumb. This analogy occurred to me. There is, I stammered a little, faltering in my speech, an incalculable element in the country, somewhere, I confess. You put it rather strongly, though, don't you? He answered quietly, moving his eyes from my face towards the window that framed the serene and exquisite sky towards the Nile. The real, invisible Egypt, he murmured. I do find rather strong. I find it difficult to deal with. You see, and he turned towards me, smiling like a tired child, I think the truth is that Egypt deals with me. It draws, I began, then started as he interrupted me at once, into the past. He uttered the little word in a way beyond me to describe. There came a flood of glory with it, a sense of peace and beauty of battles over and of rest attained. No saint could have brimmed heaven with as much passionately enticing meaning. He went willingly, prolonging the struggle merely to enjoy the greater relief and joy of the consummation. For again he spoke as though a struggle were in progress in his being. I got the impression that he somewhere wanted to help. I understood the pathetic quality I had vaguely discerned already. His character naturally was so strong and independent, it now seemed weaker as though certain fibers had been drawn out. And I understood then that the spell of Egypt, so lightly chattered about in its sensational aspect, so rarely known in its naked power, the nameless, creeping influence that begins deep below the surface, and thence sends delicate tendrils outwards, was in his blood. I, in my untaught ignorance, had felt it too. It is undeniable, one is aware of unaccountable queer things in Egypt, even the utterly prosaic feel them. Dead Egypt is marvelously alive. I glanced past him out of the big windows where the desert glimmered in its featureless expanse of yellow leagues, two monstrous pyramids signaling from across the Nile. And for a moment, inexplicably, it seemed to me afterwards, I lost sight of my companion's stalwart figure that was yet so close before my eyes. He had risen from his chair. He was standing near me. Yet my sight missed him altogether. Something dim as a shadow, faint as breath of air, rose up and bore my thoughts away, obliterating my vision, too. I forgot for a moment who I was. Identity slipped from me. Thought, sight, feeling all sank away into the emptiness of those sun-baked sands, sank, as it were, into nothingness, caught away from the present, enticed, absorbed, and when I looked back again to answer him, or rather to ask what his curious words could mean, he was no longer there. More than surprise, for there was something of shock in the disappearance, I turned to search. I had not seen him go. He had stolen from my side so softly, slipped away silently, mysteriously, and so easily. I remember that a faint shiver ran down my back as I realized that I was alone. Was it that 
Momentarily, I had caught a reflex of his state of mind. Had my sympathy induced in myself an echo of what he experienced in full, a going backwards, a loss of present vigor, the enticing, subtle draw of those immeasurable sands that hide the living dead from the interruptions of the careless living. I sat down to reflect and, incidentally, to watch the magnificence of the sunset, and the thing he had said returned upon me with insistent power, ringing like distant bells within my mind. His talk of the tombs and temples passed, but this remained. It stimulated oddly. His talk, I remembered, had always excited curiosity in this way. Some countries give while others take away. What did he mean precisely? What had Egypt taken away from him? And I realized more definitely that something in him was missing, something he possessed in former years that was now no longer there. He had grown shadowy already in my thoughts. The mind searched keenly but in vain, and after some time I left my chair and moved over to another window, aware that a vague discomfort stirred within me that involved uneasiness for him. I felt pity, but behind the pity was an eager, absorbing curiosity as well. He seemed receding curiously into misty distance, and the strong desire leaped in me to overtake to travel with him into some vanished splendor that he had rediscovered. The feeling was a most remarkable one, for it included yearning, the yearning for some nameless forgotten loveliness the world has lost. It was in me, too. At the approach of twilight the mind loves to harbor shadows. The room, empty of guests, was dark behind me. Darkness, too, was creeping across the desert like a veil deepening the serenity of its grim, unfeatured face. It turned pale with distance. The whole great sheet of it went rustling into night. The first stars peeped and twinkled, hanging loosely in the air as though they could be plucked like golden berries. And the sun was already below the Libyan horizon, where gold and crimson faded through violet and blue. I stood watching this mysterious Egyptian dusk while an eerie glamour seemed to bring the incredible within uneasy reach of the half-faltering senses. And suddenly the truth dropped into me. Over George Isley, over his mind and energies, over his thoughts and over his emotions too, a kind of darkness was also slowly creeping. Something in him had dimmed, yet not with age. It had gone out, some inner night, stealing over the present, obliterated it. And yet he looked towards the dawn, like the Egyptian monuments, his eyes turned eastwards. And so it came to me that what he had lost was personal ambition. He was glad, he said, that these Egyptian studies had not caught him earlier in life. The language he made use of was peculiar. Now I am on the decline, it matters less. A slight foundation, no doubt, to build conviction on. And yet I felt sure that I was partly right. He was fascinated but fascinated against his will. The present in him battled against the past. Still fighting, he had yet lost hope. The desire not to change was now no longer in him. I turned away from the window so as not to see that gray encroaching desert, for the discovery produced a certain agitation in me. Egypt seemed suddenly a living entity of enormous power. She stirred about me. She was stirring now. This flat and motionless land, pretending it had no movement, was actually busy with a million gestures that came creeping round the heart. She was reducing him. Already from the complex texture of his personality she had drawn one vital thread that in its relation to the general wolf was of central importance. Ambition. The mind chose the simile. But in my heart, where thought fluttered in singular distress, another suggested itself as truer thread changed to artery. I turned quickly and went up to my room where I could be alone. The idea was somewhere ghastly. Chapter 3 Yet while dressing for dinner, the idea exfoliated as only a living thing exfoliates. I saw in George Isley this great question mark that had not been there formerly. All have, of course, some question mark and carry it about, though with most it rarely becomes visible until the end. With him it was plainly visible in his atmosphere at the heyday of his life. He wore it like a fine curved scimitar above his head. 
so full of life he yet seemed willingly dead. For though imagination sought every possible explanation, I got no further than the somewhat negative result, that a certain energy, wholly unconnected with mere physical health, had been withdrawn. It was more than ambition, I think, for it included intention, desire, self-confidence as well. It was life itself. He was no longer in the present. He was no longer here. Some countries give while others take away. I find Egypt difficult to deal with. I find it... And then that simple, uncomplex adjective. Strong. In memory and experience, the entire globe was mapped for him. It remained for Egypt then to teach him this marvelous new thing. But not Egypt of today. It was vanished Egypt that had robbed him of his strength. He had described it as underground, hidden, waiting. I was again aware of a faint shuddering, as though something crept secretly from my inmost heart to share the experience with him. And though my sympathy involved a willing consent that this should be so, with a sympathy there must always be a shedding of the personal self. Each time I felt this sympathy it seemed that something left me. I thought in circles, arriving at no definite point where I could rest and say, that's it, I understand. The giving attitude of a country was easily comprehensible, but this idea of robbery, of deprivation, baffled me. An obscure alarm took hold of me, for myself as well as for him. At dinner, where he invited me to his table, the impression passed off a good deal, however, and I convicted myself of a woman's exaggeration. Yet as we talked of many a day's adventure together in other lands, it struck me that we oddly left the present out. We ignored today. His thoughts, as it were, went most easily backwards. And each adventure led, as by its own natural weight and impetus, towards one thing. The enormous glory of a vanished age. Ancient Egypt was home in this mysterious game life played with death. The specific gravity of his being, to say nothing for the moment of my own, had shifted lower, farther off, backwards and below, or as he put it, underground. The sinking sensation I experienced was of a literal kind. And so I found myself wondering what had led him to this particular hotel. I had come out with an affected organ the specialist promised me would heal in the marvelous air of Helawan. But it was queer that my companion also should have chosen it. Its clientele was mostly invalid, German and Russian invalid at that. The management set its face against the lighter, gayer side of life that hotels in Egypt usually encourage eagerly. It was a true rest house, a place of repose and leisure, a place where one could remain undiscovered and unknown. No English patronized it. One might easily, the idea came unbidden suddenly, hide in it. Then you're doing nothing just now, I asked, in the way of digging? No big expeditions or excavating at the moment? I'm recuperating, he answered carelessly. I've had two years up at the Valley of the Kings, and overdid it, rather, but I'm by way of working at a little thing near here across the Nile, and he pointed in the direction of Saqqara, where the huge Memphian cemetery stretches underground from the Dakur pyramids to the Giza monsters four miles lower down. There's a matter of a hundred years in that alone. You must have accumulated a mass of interesting material. I suppose later you'll make use of it, a book, or... His expression stopped me. That strange look in the eyes that had stirred my first uneasiness. It was as if something struggled up a moment, looked bleakly out upon the present, then sank away again. More, he answered listlessly, than I can ever use. It's much more likely to use me. He said it hurriedly, looking over his shoulder as though someone might be listening, then smiled significantly, bringing his eyes back upon my own again. I told him that he was far too modest. If all the excavators thought like that, I added, we ignorant ones should suffer. I laughed, but the laughter was only on my lips. He shook his head indifferently. They do their best. They do wonders, he replied, making an indescribable gesture as though he withdrew willingly from the topic altogether, yet could not quite achieve it. I know their books. I know the writers, too, of various nationalities. He paused a moment, and his eyes turned grave. I cannot understand quite how they do it, he added, half below his breath. 
The labor, you mean? The strain of the climate and so forth? I said this purposely, for I knew quite well he meant another thing. The way he looked into my face, however, disturbed me so that I believed I visibly started. Something very deep in me sat up, alertly listening, almost on guard. I mean, he replied, that they must have uncommon powers of resistance. There. He had used the very word that had been hiding in me. It puzzles me, he went on, for with one exception they are not unusual men. In the way of gifts, oh yes, it's in the way of resistance and protection that I mean. Self-protection, he added with emphasis. It was the way he said resistance and self-protection that sent a touch of cold through me. I learned later that he himself had made surprising discoveries in these two years, penetrating closer to the secret life of ancient, sacerdotal Egypt than any of his predecessors or co-laborers, then inexplicably had ceased. But this was told to me afterwards and by others. At the moment, I was only conscious of this odd embarrassment. I did not understand, yet felt that he touched upon something intimately personal to himself. He paused, expecting me to speak. Egypt perhaps merely pours through them, I ventured. They give out mechanically, hardly realizing how much they give. They report facts devoid of interpretation. Whereas with you, it's the actual spirit of the past that is discovered and laid bare. You live it. You feel old Egypt and disclose her. That divining faculty was always yours. Uncannily, I used to think. The flash of his somber eyes betrayed that my aim was singularly good. It seemed a third had silently joined our little table in the corner. Something intruded, evoked by the power of what our conversation skirted, but ever left unmentioned. It was huge and shadowy. It was also watchful. Egypt came gliding, floating up beside us. I saw her reflected in his face and gaze. The desert slipped in through walls and ceiling, rising from beneath our feet, settling about us, listening, peering, waiting. The strange obsession was sudden and complete. The gigantic scale of her swam in among the very pillars, arches, and windows of that modern dining room. I felt against my skin the touch of chilly air that sunlight never reaches, stealing from beneath the granite monoliths. Behind it came the stifling breath of the heated tombs, of the serapium, of the chambers and corridors in the pyramids. There was a rustling as of myriad footsteps far away, and as of sand the busy winds go shifting through the ages. And in startling contrast to this impression of prodigious size, Isley himself wore suddenly an air of strangely dwindling. For a second he shrank visibly before my very eyes. He was receding. His outline seemed to retreat and lessen as though he stood to the waist in what appeared like flowing mist, only his head and shoulders still above the ground. Far, far away I saw him. It was a vivid inner picture that I somehow transferred objectively. It was a dramatized sensation, of course. His former phrase, Now that I am declining, flashed back upon me with sharp discomfort. Again, perhaps, his state of mind was reflected into me by some emotional telepathy. I waited, conscious of an almost sensible oppression that would not lift. It seemed an age before he spoke, and when he did, there was the tremor of feeling in his voice he sought nevertheless to repress. I kept my eyes on the table for some reason, but I listened intently. "'It's you that have the divining faculty, not I,' he said, an odd note of distance even in his tone yet a resonance as though it rose up between reverberating walls. There is, I believe, something here that resents too close inquiry, or rather that resists discovery, almost takes offense. I looked up quickly, then looked down again. It was such a startling thing to hear on the lips of a modern Englishman. He spoke lightly, but the expression of his face belied the careless tone. There was no mockery in those earnest eyes and in the hushed voice was a little creeping sound that gave me once again the touch of goose flesh. The only word I can find is subterranean. All that was mental in him had sunk, so that he seemed speaking underground, head and shoulders alone visible. The effect was almost ghastly. Such extraordinary obstacles are put in one's way, he went on. When the prying gets too close to the reality... 
Physical, external obstacles, I mean. Either that, or the mind loses its assimilative faculties. One or other happens. His voice died down into a whisper, and discovery ceases of its own accord. The same minute, then, he suddenly raised himself like a man emerging from a tomb. He leaned across the table. He made an effort of some violent internal kind, on the verge, I fully believe, of a pregnant personal statement. There was a confession in his attitude. I think he was about to speak of his work at Thebes and the reason for its abrupt cessation. For I had the feeling of one about to hear a weighty secret, the responsibility unwelcome. This uncomfortable emotion rose in me as I raised my eyes to his somewhat unwillingly, only to find that I was wholly at fault. It was not me he was looking at. He was staring past me in the direction of the wide, unshuttered windows. The expression of yearning was visible in his eyes again. Something had stopped his utterance. And instinctively I turned and saw what he saw. So far as external details were concerned, at least, I saw it. Across the glare and glitter of the uncompromising modern dining room, Past crowded tables and over the heads of Germans feeding unpicturesquely, I saw the moon. Her reddish disk, hanging unreal and enormous, lifted the spread sheet of desert till it floated off the surface of the world. The great window faced the east, where the Arabian desert breaks into a ruin of gorges, cliffs, and flat-topped ridges. It looked unfriendly, ominous, with danger in it, unlike the serener sand dunes of the Libyan desert. There lay both menace and seduction behind its flood of shadows, and the moonlight emphasized this aspect. Its ghostly desolation, its cruelty, its bleak hostility, turning it murderous. For no river sweetens this Arabian desert. Instead of sandy softness, it has fangs of limestone rock, sharp and aggressive. Across it, just visible in the moonlight as a thread of paler gray, the old camel trail to Suez beckoned faintly, and it was this that he looked at so intently. It was, I know, a theatrical, stage-like glimpse, yet in it a seductiveness most potent. Come out, it seemed to whisper, and taste my awful beauty. Come out and lose yourself and die. Come out and follow my moonlit trail into the past, where there is peace and immobility and silence. My kingdom is unchanging underground. Come down, come softly. Come through sandy corridors below this tinsel of your modern world. Come back, come down into my golden past. A poignant desire stole through my heart on moonlit feet. I was personally conscious of a keen yearning to slip away in unresisting obedience. For it was uncommonly impressive, this sudden haunting glimpse of the world outside. The hairy foreigners, uncouthly garbed, all busily eating in full electric light, provided a sensational contrast of emphatically distressing kind. A touch of what it called unearthly hovered about that distance through the window. There was weirdness in it. Egypt looked in upon us. Egypt watched and listened, beckoning through the moonlit windows of the heart to come and find her. Mind and imagination might flounder as they pleased, but something of this kind happened undeniably. Whether expression and language fails to hold the truth or not. And George Isley, aware of being seen, looked straight into the awful visage, fascinated. Over the bronze of his skin there stole a shade of gray. My own feeling of enticement grew, the desire to go out into the moonlight, to leave my kind and wander blindly through the desert, to see the gorges in their shining silver and taste the keenness of the cool, sharp air. Further than this with me it did not go, but that my companion felt the bigger, deeper draw behind this surface glamour, I have no reasonable doubt. For a moment, indeed, I thought he meant to leave the table. He had half risen in his chair, it seemed he struggled and resisted. And then his big frame subsided again. He sat back, he looked in the attitude his body took, less impressive, smaller, actually shrunken into the proportions of some minuter scale, it was as though something in that second had been drawn out of him, decreasing even his physical appearance. The voice, when he spoke presently with a touch of resignation, held a lifeless quality as though deprived of virile timber. 
It's always there, he whispered, half collapsing back into his chair. It's always watching, waiting, listening, almost like a monster of the fables, isn't it? It makes no movement of its own, you see. It's far too strong for that. It just hangs there, half in the air and half upon the earth, a gigantic web. Its prey flies into it. That's Egypt all over. Do you feel like that too, or does it seem to you just imaginative rubbish? To me it seems that she just waits her time. She gets you quicker that way. In the end, you're bound to go. There's power, certainly, I said after a moment's pause to collect my wits. My distress increased by the morbidness of his simile. For some minds, there may be a kind of terror, too. For weak temperaments that are all imagination. My thoughts were scattered, and I could not readily find good words. There is startling grandeur in a sight like that, for instance, and I pointed to the window. You feel drawn, as if you simply had to go. My mind still buzzed with his curious words. In the end, you're bound to go. It betrayed his heart and soul. I suppose a fly does feel drawn, I added, or a moth to the destroying flame, or is it just unconscious on their part? He jerked his big head significantly. Well, well, he answered, but the fly isn't necessarily weak or the moth misguided. Over-adventurous, perhaps, yet both obedient to the laws of their respective beings. They get warnings, too, only when the moth wants to know too much, the fire stops it. Both flame and spider enrich themselves by understanding the natures of their prey, and fly and moth return again and again until this is accomplished. Yet George Isley was as sane as the head waiter, who, noticing our interest in the window, came up just then and inquired whether we felt a draft and would prefer it closed. Isley, I realized, was struggling to express a passionate state of soul for which, owing to its rarity, no adequate expression lies at hand. There is a language of the mind, but there is none as yet of the spirit. I felt ill at ease. All this was so foreign to the wholesome, strenuous personality of the man as I remembered it. But, my dear fellow, I stammered, aren't you giving poor old Egypt a bad name she hardly deserves? I feel only the amazing strength and beauty of it. Awe, if you like, but... "'None of this resentment you so mysteriously hint at.' "'You understand for all that,' he answered quietly, "'and again he seemed on the verge of some significant confession "'that might ease his soul. "'My uncomfortable emotion grew. "'Certainly he was at high pressure somewhere. "'And, if necessary, you could help. "'Your sympathy, I mean, is a help already.' "'He said it half to himself, and in a suddenly lowered tone again, a uh, help? I gasped. My sympathy. Of course, if... A witness, he murmured, not looking at me. Someone who understands, yet does not think me mad. There was such appeal in his voice that I felt ready and eager to do anything to help him. Our eyes met, and my own tried to express this willingness in me. But what I said I hardly know, for a cloud of confusion was on my mind, and my speech went fumbling like a schoolboy's. I was more than disconcerted. Through this bewilderment, then, I just caught the tail end of another sentence in which the words, Relief it is to have someone to hold to when the disappearance comes, sounded like voices heard in dream. But I missed the complete phrase and shrank from asking him to repeat it. Some sympathetic answer struggled to my lips, though what it was I know not. The thing I murmured, however, seemed apparently well chosen, he leaned across and laid his big hand a moment on my own with eloquent pressure. It was cold as ice. A look of gratitude passed over his sunburned features. He sighed, and we left the table then and passed into the inner smoking room for coffee, a room whose windows gave out columned terraces that allowed no view of the encircling desert. He led the conversation into channels less personal and, thank heaven, less intensely emotional and mysterious. What we talked about I now forget. It was interesting, but in another key altogether. His old charm and power worked. The respect I had always felt for his character and gifts returned in force. But it was the pity I now experienced that remained chiefly in my mind, for this change in him became more and more noticeable. He was less impressive, less convincing, less suggestive. 
His talk, though so knowledgeable, lacked that spiritual quality that drives home. He was uncannily less real, and I went up to bed, uneasy and disturbed. It is not age, I said to myself, and assuredly it is not death he fears, although he spoke of disappearance. It is mental in the deepest sense. It is what religious people would call soul. Something is happening to his soul. Chapter 4 And this word soul remained with me to the end. Egypt was taking his soul away into the past. What was of value in him went willingly. The rest, some lesser aspect of his mind and character, resisted, holding to the present. A struggle, therefore, was involved, but this was being gradually obliterated, too. How I arrived gaily at this monstrous conclusion seemed to me now a mystery. But the truth is that from a conversation one brings away a general idea that is larger than the words actually heard and spoken. I have reported naturally but a fragment of what passed between us in language, and of what was suggested by gesture, expression, silence. Merely perhaps a hint. I can only assert that this troubling verdict remained a conviction in my mind. It came upstairs with me. It watched and listened by my side. That mysterious third evoked in our conversation was bigger than either of us separately. It might be called the spirit of ancient Egypt, or it might be called with equal generalization the past. This third, at any rate, stood by me, whispering this astounding thing. I went out onto my little balcony to smoke a pipe and enjoy the comforting presence of the stars before turning in. It came out with me. It was everywhere. I heard the barking of dogs, the monotonous beating of a distant drum towards Bedrachian, the sing-song voices of the natives in their booths and down the dim-lit streets. I was aware of this invisible third behind all these familiar sounds, the enormous night sky drowned in stars conveyed it too. It was in the breath of chilly wind that whispered round the walls, and it brooded everywhere above the sleepless desert. I was alone as little as though George Isley stood beside me in person, and at that moment a moving figure caught my eye below. My window was on the sixth story, but there was no mistaking the tall and soldierly bearing of the man who was strolling past the hotel. George Isley was going slowly out into the desert, there was actually nothing unusual in the night. It was only ten o'clock, but for doctor's orders I might have been doing the same myself. Yet, as I leaned over the dizzy ledge and watched him, a chill struck through me, and a feeling nothing could justify, nor pages of writing described, rose up and mastered me. His words at dinner came back with curious force. Egypt lay round him, motionless, a vast gray web. His feet were caught in it. It quivered. The silvery meshes in the moonlight announced the fact from Memphis up to Thebes, across the Nile, from underground Saqqara to the Valley of the Kings. A tremor ran over the entire desert, and again, as in the dining room, the leagues of sand went rustling. It seemed to me that I caught him in the act of disappearing. I realized in that moment the haunting power of this mysterious, still atmosphere which is Egypt, and some magical emanation of its mighty past broke over me suddenly like a wave. Perhaps in that moment I felt what he himself felt. The withdrawing suction of the huge, spent wave swept something out of me into the past with it. An indescribable yearning drew something living from my heart, something that longed with a kind of burning, searching sweetness for a glory of spiritual passion that was gone. The pain and happiness of it were more poignant than may be told, and my present personality, some vital portion of it at any rate, wilted before the power of its enticement. I stood there motionless as stone and stared, erect and steady, knowing resistance vain, eager to go yet striving to remain in half with an air of floating off the ground. He went towards the pale gray thread which was the track to Suez and the far Red Sea. There came upon me this strange, deep sense of pity, pathos, sympathy, that was beyond all explanation, and mysterious as a pain in dreams. For a sense of his awful loneliness stole into me, a loneliness nothing on this earth could possibly relieve. Robbed of the present, he sought this chimera of his soul, an unreal past, 
Not even the calm majesty of this exquisite Egyptian night could soothe the dream away. The peace and silence were marvelous, the sweet perfume of the desert air intoxicating. But all these intensified it only, and though at a loss to explain my own emotion, its poignancy was so real that a sigh escaped me, and I felt that tears lay not too far away. I watched him, yet felt I had no right to watch. Softly I drew back from the window with the sensation of eavesdropping upon his privacy. But before I did so, I had seen his outline melt away into the dim world of sand that began at the very walls of the hotel. He wore a cloak of green that reached down almost to his heels, and its color blended with the silvery surface of the desert's dark sea tint. This sheen first draped and then concealed him. It covered him with a fold of its mysterious garment that, without seam or binding, veiled Egypt for a thousand leagues. The desert took him. Egypt caught him in her web. He was gone. Sleep for me just then seemed out of the question. The change in him made me feel less sure of myself. To see him thus invertebrate shocked me. I was aware that I had nerves. For a long time I sat smoking by the window, my body wary, but my imagination irritatingly stimulated. The big sign lights of the hotel went out. Window after window closed below me. The electric standards in the streets were already extinguished, and Halloween looked like a child's white blocks scattered in ruin upon the nursery carpet. It seemed so wee upon the vast expanse. It lay in a twinkling pattern, like a cluster of glowworms dropped into a negligible crease of the tremendous desert. It peeped up at the stars, a little frightened. The night was very still. There hung an enormous brooding beauty everywhere, a hint of the sinister in it that only the brilliance of the blazing stars relieved. Nothing really slept. Grouped here and there at intervals about this dun-colored world stood the everlasting watchers and solemn, tireless guardianship, the soaring pyramids, the sphinx, the grim colossi, the empty temples, the long deserted tombs. The mind was aware of them, stationed like sentries through the night. This is Egypt. You are actually in Egypt, whispered the silence. Eight thousand years of history lie fluttering outside your window. She lies there underground, sleepless, mighty, Deathless, not to be trifled with. Beware, or she will change you too. My imagination offered this hint. Egypt is difficult to realize. It remains outside the mind, a fabulous, half-legendary idea. So many enormous elements together refuse to be assimilated. The heart pauses, asking for time and breath. The senses reel a little. And in the end, a mental torpor akin to stupefaction creeps upon the brain. With a sigh, the struggle is abandoned, and the mind surrenders to Egypt on her own terms. Alone, the diggers and archaeologists, confined to definite facts, offer successful resistance. My friend's use of the words resistance and protection became clearer to me. While logic halted, intuition fluttered round this clue to the solution of the influences at work. George Isley realized Egypt more than most, but as she had been. And I recalled its first effect upon myself, and how my mind had been unable to cope with the memory of it afterwards. There had come to its summons a colossal medley, a gigantic colored blur that merely bewildered. Only lesser points lodged comfortably in the heart. I saw a chaotic vision, sands drenched in dazzling light, vast granite aisles, Stupendous figures that stared unblinking at the sun, a shining river in a shadowy desert. Both endless as the sky, mountainous pyramids and gigantic monoliths, armies of heads, of paws, of faces, all set to a scale of size that was prodigious. The items stunned. The composite effect was too unwieldy to be grasped. Something that blazed with splendor rolled before the eyes, too close to be seen distinctly at the same time very distant, unrealized. Then, with the passing of the weeks, it slowly stirred to life. It had attacked unseen, its grip was quite tremendous, yet it could be neither told nor painted nor described. It flamed up unexpectedly in the foggy London streets, at the club, in the theater. A sound recalled the street cries of the Arabs. A breath of scented air brought back the heated sand beyond the palm groves. 
Up rose the huge Egyptian glamour, transforming common things. It had lain buried all this time in deep recesses of the heart that are inaccessible to ordinary daily life. And there hid in it something of uneasiness that was inexplicable. Awe, a hint of cold eternity, a touch of something unchanging and terrific, something sublime made lovely yet unearthly with shadowy time and distance. The melancholy of the Nile, and the grandeur of a hundred battered temples, dropped some unutterable beauty upon the heart. Up swept the desert air, the luminous pale shadows, the naked desolation that yet brims with sharp vitality. An Arab on his donkey tripped in color across the mind, melting off into tiny perspective, strangely vivid. A string of camels stood in silhouette against the crimson sky. Great winds, great blazing spaces, great solemn nights, great days of golden splendor rose from the pavement or the theater stall, and London, dimlit England, the whole of modern life indeed seemed suddenly reduced to a paltry insignificance that produced an aching longing for the pageantry of those millions of vanished souls. Egypt rolled through the heart for a moment and was gone. I remembered that some such fantastic experience had been mine. Put it as one may, the fact remains that for certain temperaments Egypt can rob the present of some thread of interest that was formerly there. The memory became for me an integral part of personality. Something in me yearned for its curious and awful beauty. He who has drunk of the Nile shall return to drink of it again. And if for myself this was possible, what might not happen to a character of George Isley's type? Some glimmer of comprehension came to me. The ancient, buried, hidden Egypt had cast her net about his soul. Grown shadowy in the present, his life was being transferred into some golden, reconstructed past where it was real. Some countries give while others take away, and George Isley was worth robbing. Disturbed by these singular reflections, I moved away from the open window, closing it. But the closing did not exclude the presence of the third. The biting night air followed me in. I drew the mosquito curtains round the bed, but the light I left still burning. And lying there, I jotted down upon a scrap of paper this curious impression as best I could, only to find that it escaped easily between the words. Such visionary and spiritual perceptions are too elusive to be trapped in language. Reading it over after an interval of years, it is difficult to recall with what intense meaning, what uncanny emotion I wrote those faded lines in pencil. Their rhetoric seems cheap, their content much exaggerated, yet at the time truth burned in every syllable. Egypt, which since time began has suffered robbery with violence at the hands of all the world, now takes her vengeance, choosing her individual prey. Her time has come. Behind a modern mask she lies in wait, intensely active, sure of her hidden power, Prostitute of dead empire, she lies now at peace beneath the same old stars, her loveliness unimpaired, bejeweled with the beaten gold of ages, her breasts uncovered and her grand limbs flashing in the sun, her shoulders of alabaster are lifted above the sand drifts, she surveys the little figures of today. She takes her choice. That night I did not dream, but neither did the whole of me lie down and sleep. During the long, dark hours, I was aware of that picture endlessly repeating itself. The picture of George Isley stealing out into the moonlight desert. The night so swiftly dropped her hood about him. So mysteriously he merged into the unchanging thing which cloaks the past. It lifted. Some huge, shadowy hand, gloved softly yet of granite, stretched over the leagues to take him. He disappeared. They say the desert is motionless and has no gestures. That night I saw it moving, hurrying. It went tearing after him. You understand my meaning? No? Well, when excited it produces this strange impression, and the terrible moment is when you surrender helplessly, you desire it shall swallow you. You let it come. George Isley spoke of a web. It is, at any rate, some central power that conceals itself behind the surface glamour folk call the spell of Egypt. Its home is not apparent. It dwells with ancient Egypt, underground, behind the stillness of hot, windless days, behind the peace of calm, gigantic nights. It lurks unrealized, monstrous, and irresistible. My mind grasped it, 
as little as the fact that our solar system, with all its retinue of satellites and planets, rushes annually many million miles towards a star in Hercules, while yet that constellation appears no closer than it did 6,000 years ago. But the clue dropped into me. George Isley, with his entire retinue of thought and life and feeling, was being similarly drawn. And I, a minor satellite, had become aware of the horrifying pull. It was magnificent and I fell asleep on the crest of this enormous wave. End of section 8